Good morning. America may never be the same, and this is why. A beautiful Tuesday turned tragic when American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And that was just the beginning. This morning, less than 24 hours later, the heart of commerce and the signature of the New York skyline is no more. Meanwhile, the nerve center of the U.S. military has been deliberately and viciously attacked, leaving a nation and the rest of the world stunned today, Wednesday, September the 12th, 2001. From NBC News, this is Today with Katie Couric and Matt Lauer. And welcome to Today on this Wednesday morning, a morning people are waking up in disbelief with heavy hearts, especially those who have lost loved ones or who are uncertain where their loved ones are at this hour. I'm Katie Couric. And I'm Matt Lauer. There's a look on people's faces in this city that's been there for about the past 20 hours now that I've never seen before, and I'm sure it's being repeated in Washington and in parts of Pennsylvania as well. This was the scene about 22 hours ago. As horrible as these pictures are of airplanes intentionally plunging into the World Trade Center, we still don't know how high the human toll will climb. The early numbers are staggering. 266 people on the four hijacked planes are dead. Two hit the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. One hit the Pentagon and one crashed 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. At the Pentagon, up to 800 people now fear dead. In New York City, Mayor Rudy Giuliani says the toll could be more than any of us can bear. The New York Fire Commissioner said that he is missing 300 firefighters and EMS personnel. 33 New York police officers are missing. Estimates are that there were up to 50,000 people working in the World Trade Center on Tuesday morning when that attack took place. If, if there is a glimmer of hope, it's this. Word is that some victims have survived in Lower Manhattan. Police are getting cell phone calls coming from the rubble, and people still are being pulled out alive. At this point, there are two makeshift morgues being set up in Lower Manhattan, and there are also some heartbreaking reports of passengers on the doomed planes calling loved ones to report that they'd been hijacked, and in some cases, to say goodbye. We are beginning, Matt, to get a picture of the terror on those planes before they crash. Flight attendants being stabbed, passengers herded to the back of the planes. And now, new developments overnight in Boston where two of the flights originated. Five suspects have been identified and a car seized from the Logan Airport parking lot. But there is still a lot we don't know and may not know for a long time. The president spoke to the nation last night. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. That was President Bush speaking from the Oval Office last night, and we'll have continuing coverage of this all morning long. Let's begin with NBC's David Bloom, who's close to the rescue efforts this morning. David, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. The firefighters, the police officers, the rescue workers who've been laboring all night here in Lower Manhattan tell us, now that they have daybreak, that they confront three basic problems. Number one, there are still fires burning here in Lower Manhattan. If you look behind me, you can see some of the smoke that's still billowing out of what remains of the World Trade Centers as we look south here on West Broadway. But you can also see the fire hoses 22 hours after the first explosion still spraying water on the buildings. Problem number two is that there are buildings that they still fear will collapse. Of course, what you have is three major structures that have already collapsed, but the great fear is that more buildings have been severely damaged. The third problem is that there's just so much debris that they cannot mount a serious rescue effort. They're in some caverns, the firefighters tell us, looking for survivors, but it is a cruelly slow process. Overnight in New York City, a faint glimmer of hope. At least two victims pulled alive from the rubble. And there may be others still trapped inside the World Trade Center's collapsed remains. Reports of cell phone calls from a few survivors pleading for help. 
We do know there are people in the building that are alive. We know that for a fact. We're very hopeful, very hopeful that there are pockets where there are people, not, not only the ones that we know about, but ho hopefully others. But elsewhere, the news is grim. The president last night puts the death toll from the attacks in the thousands after an estimated 12 to 20 terrorists wielding makeshift knives hijack four domestic airliners. Brand new video obtained overnight shows the first attack plane crashing into the World Trade Center's North Tower. Minutes later, television helicopters record the second plane crashing into the South Tower. The two 110-story buildings so badly damaged that they collapse. One after the other. Among the missing, the rescuers themselves. Last night, New York City firefighters and police confirm that more than 300 of their own are believed dead. And at the Pentagon, site of the third plane attack, firefighters last night say the death toll could rise to as high as 800 people. Last night, Air Force One, escorted by two fighter jets, returns President Bush to Washington, where he brands the attacks evil and despicable, vowing that America will win the war against terrorism. With Saudi-born terrorist Osama bin Laden the prime suspect, Mr. Bush makes a thinly veiled threat of reprisal against his backers in Afghanistan. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. The two hijacked planes which toppled the World Trade Center both originated out of Boston, where this morning the Boston Herald reports that authorities have identified at least five Arab men as suspects, one of them a trained pilot and that a car laden with Arabic language flight training manuals was found at Logan Airport's central parking garage. As to bin Laden's suspected role, Senator Orrin Hatch tells the Associated Press that the United States intercepted communications between bin Laden supporters discussing targets that were hit, and that at least one of the suspected hijackers had known ties to the terrorists. One of the biggest mysteries, why did the fourth hijacked plane not hit a target, crashing instead in western Pennsylvania? One possible explanation, a passenger on the doomed flight reportedly called his wife, telling her, we're all going to die, I love you, but indicating that he and two other passengers had decided to try to overpower the hijackers. Attorney General John Ashcroft told Congress last night that that plane is believed to have been headed for Washington, D.C. Matt, it probably goes without saying that the financial markets here in New York will remain closed today. Airports around the country will remain shut down until at least noon Eastern time. The president plans to meet with his national security team later this morning. Matt? All right, David Bloom in Lower Manhattan this morning. David, thank you very much. Eight past the hour. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you. The scene on the ground at the World Trade Center at 9 a.m. Tuesday morning was chaotic, to say the least. Michael George was sitting at his desk on the 33rd floor in two World Trade Center, and David Reck was on the street below when the first plane crashed into the North Building. Michael and David, good morning. Thank good you so morning. much for being here. We appreciate it. David, let me start with you. You were on the street passing out pamphlets, is that right? Or campaign literature? Was, yesterday was supposed to be a primary election here in New York, and I was handing out campaign literature for candidates at a housing development in Tribeca, just a few blocks north. And uh, about a quarter to nine, uh, we heard the roar of jet engines, and it was very loud, and the plane came in very low over Tribeca, and it made a slight turn and dove right into the upper part of the, the first tower. What was your reaction when that happened? Did you think a terrible accident had taken place? The first thing that happened, the, the street was loaded with people. Everything just froze. Everybody just stared at it in disbelief as if it wasn't real. And then lots of people started coming out of the buildings and just looking at the tower. And we were all talking about it all until the second plane hit. And here we have video of this was about 20 minutes later, and all yes. of a sudden you see another jet crashing into the second twin tower. When that happened... And then uh, everybody, there was just total bedlam. Uh, people started coming out and going north on the streets. And there was a school, a grade school, just below us. And some of us went down. To, there were parents dropping off kids there to see if, it could, uh, if we could help. And it, it was just uh, bizarre. Was it bedlam on the streets at that point? Were emergency crews there? Were, 
Were they instructing people to leave the area? No, the emergency crews were more headed uh, a block or two below us. You could hear the sirens everywhere, and you could see the vehicles move. And while we were at the school is when the first building collapsed, and, and then everyone in mass started heading north, walking up the streets. Uh, and as we were headed up through Tribeca, we could see military aircraft flying uh, down the river, and it was very strange, very strange. Michael, you were sitting at your desk. You, you work at, for Oppenheimer Fund. Right. You work in the second Twin Tower. Correct. What did you hear when the first plane went through that building, the um, other Twin Tower? Yeah, you couldn't hear, like, the crashing of the plane. You just felt the rumbling and the shaking of the whole building. I mean, I think instantaneously everybody knew something was wrong. Uh, everybody within seconds went to the window and you could just see uh, debris everywhere. It was like a ticker tape parade. I mean, there was just debris in the air. Um, and at that point, I just ran as did everybody else on my floor. We Took evacuated. Took the steps. Yep. You were on the 33rd Third floor? Third floor, right. And so you started evacuating. I understand when you got to the fourth floor, they made an announcement. Which yeah. you ignored, thankfully. Yeah. There were no, um, you know, there were no fire alarms going. Uh, people proceeded very calmly. Um, uh, where we were, we couldn't see the plane hit, but as other people from other sides of the building came over, we could, you know, you could hear bits and pieces of what happened. You heard a plane crash, and um, people continued to walk down very calmly. And then we got to around the fourth floor, an announcement came over the PA saying, you know, the accident is isolated in building one. There was no fire danger to building two. Um, and Return to your desk. I didn't hear that, but I just, that's what they said, um, stay in the building. Um, and I mean, most people have just continued going. I think most people disregarded that. Do you know anyone who went back to the, to no. the office? No, and I've been able to connect with uh, m most of the people um, at my company to, you know, determine that they got out. When you got down to the street level, um, were you in the area when the second plane hit the Yeah, the I was just crossing the street. I just got out of the building, was walking across Liberty, and I didn't see anything, but I could just hear the, what I now know was a plane, but at the time didn't know. I mean if it was a missile or what, but we heard the, the roaring of the engines and then the crashing into the building and the explosion. And um, I was just, you know, at that point, everybody just kind of went on their own was running. We've heard the most harrowing stories of people witnessing individuals from the building who were on the upper floors, mm -hmm. particularly at the yeah. first tower, mm -hmm. jumping to their death, mm -hmm. holding yeah. hands with other people. Yeah, I saw, I mean, when we came down on the steps, um, you could just look onto the... Uh, the courtyard between the two towers and that's where a lot of the debris was and my coworkers as we saw you know you could see exactly what you, just, what you just said it was awful it was more than just a few people there were a lot of people who were jumping some people have estimated 100 to 150 people jumping to I their would death. say that's about right did you all sleep last night following this i got exhausted and i did sleep some last night This morning when you woke up, I know, for example, David, that you live in the area. Yeah, I live uh, just above Canal. Did you see rescue workers? What was the, the, the atmosphere like this morning? Uh, since last night, uh, anything that's been moving down there has been heavy construction equipment and police vehicles and motorcades, police motorcades. But uh, right now, when I was walking out this morning, it's very quiet. It's a total opposite of what, what happened yesterday. There's virtually no one on the streets. The Holland Tunnel is closed. There's virtually no traffic down there. Very different. You said that you had talked to people in your office and connected with the people who work for Oppenheimer. Yeah. So many people work at the World Trade Center. Absolutely. And so many of us know or are afraid we might learn about someone we know who is unaccounted for at this point. Yeah, I would just encourage anyone to call in and check in at least with uh, their companies because that might, you know, it's a good, good way to keep track of who was out there. Maybe just haven't connected yet. How about you? Do you know of anybody? I don't know. Personally, everyone, uh, we have a website up and running uh, at oppenheimerfunds.com, um, the shareholder section for employees to log in and uh, you can see the list and everyone I saw who I knew was on the list. So that means okay. everyone's okay. I guess you all will never forget this day for the oh, rest of your no lives. I don't think any of us will. David Reckon. Bizarre thing I've ever seen. Michael George, I'm glad both of you are safe this morning. Thank you for coming in. Appreciate, you. appreciate it, because I know you're probably exhausted as well. So thank you. It is 7.14 now. Here's Matt. <coughs> All right, Katie, thank you. New York City's mayor is Rudolph Giuliani. Mayor Giuliani, good morning to you.
Good morning, Matt. I, I know you've spent an awful lot of town, uh, time down at the uh, scene of the destruction. Can you give me an idea of what you've seen so far? Uh, well, I've never seen anything like that in my whole life. I, I, I suspect uh, no one else has. Uh, the destruction is enormous. The debris is beyond uh, any, any description. And what we, have, what we have been doing in the last ten, uh, 10 or 12 hours is trying to get a focus on uh, each day the efforts that are going to need it first with the primary concern today being on saving human life and seeing if we can rescue uh, some more people. We've rescued two uh, in, the or in the early morning hours, late, late evening, early morning hours. We have another person that we're focusing on right now that we're in contact with that we're hopefully going to be able to take out. And uh, so the, the first concern, the first priority is can we rescue people that are actually still alive there? And and Mayor the Giuliani, second part, of it obviously, is to, is to clean up uh, is to clean up the debris. Th there are reports that, that rescuers are receiving cell phone calls from people who may be trapped in the rubble. What can you tell me about that? that? Th the answer to that is yes, that, that has happened, and that, that assisted in being able to rescue the two Port Authority police officers that we've been able to rescue and the one man that we're in contact with. Uh, there have been cell phone calls, there have been cell phone communications. What I can't tell you and what we're not sure of because we're res responding to them is, is that all coming from the same source, the man that we're in contact with, or is it more than one? And we're hopeful that it's more than one. I, I want to talk to you about what, in, in my opinion, is one of the most horrendous parts of this story. Firefighters, police officers, emergency medical technicians rushing to the scene of this disaster getting close to the building, in some cases being inside the building, when one of the towers or both of the towers collapsed. Talk to me about the toll this has taken on New York's firefighters and police. I don't think they realize yet uh, that that's something that we're going to have to deal with today and tomorrow as people absorb the impact of what's actually happened. We have um, right now the count is 202 firefighters that are missing, um, altogether 259 uniformed service members meaning police officers and firefighters, New York City police officers, Port Authority police officers, the number two, number three uh, ranking officers in the fire department di died as a result of the collapse. Uh, so I mean, very, very heavy losses and, and uh, fatalities for our, for our fire department in particular, but also for our police department. Yet yesterday you said the, the death toll here may be beyond what we can bear. I, is there any way you can even begin to estimate how many people may be in that wreckage? Uh, the estimates are that there were thousands of people in the building at the time that it, at the time that it went down. And the, the question is how many were able to get out? There was a a window of about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, depending on the building. There was a, that window for people to get out. I was there early in that process and saw a lot of people that got out. So th that's why the calculation is difficult. We don't, we don't know how many people were left in the building, but if we're, if we're thinking about the recovery effort and the plans that we have to make, we're assuming in the, in the thousands. And then, you know, maybe, Maybe it won't be that high, but right now, in putting the efforts together yesterday for the medical examiner, for the recovery efforts, for the resources that we need, the help that we need from the state and the federal government, uh, we're, we're, we're in the thousands in terms of what we think we're going to have to uh, deal with. I know that plans are in the works now to start to relieve some of the workers, the, the rescue people who've been on the scene for about 20 hours now, and I know that also a lot of them, the firefighters and police, don't want to leave because they, they, their brothers and sisters are still in that building. Yeah, uh, s s some of the people that we lost were, um, were ve very, very well known. Uh, Bill Feehan is the first deputy commissioner of the fire department that I've appointed to that position. Bill has been with the fire department, I think, for 37 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Pete Gansey is the chief of the department. Uh, Father Michael Judge is a beloved in the fire department. He was a fire department chaplain and 15 minutes before he died I talked to him and asked him to pray, pray for us and so the, the, the men that we've lost in the fire department are, are all well known to the other firefighters and that's why they're there and the, the fire commissioner has sent as many of them home, a, a home as possible and we have a, a new crew that uh, came in and we'll have another crew that comes in now and we're getting a lot of help from Governor Pataki and from right. all of the surrounding areas. We had the, we had the National Guard here last night to help, help with the, uh, 
the, with the effort, with the recovery effort. Can, so can we're, you, we're getting a great deal of assistance. Can you tell me where this has left the city in terms of, I mean, what's open, what's closed, are roads in and out of the city open? The, uh, the four boroughs outside of Manhattan are all open, and they're all open for business and uh, operating you know, as normally as you can operate in, in, in the wake of a situation like yesterday where there's an, there's a, an emotional reaction that you just have to acknowledge and realize is going to happen. Uh, Manhattan is closed from 14th Street South. Uh, Manhattan is open 14th Street North uh, for, for business with the, with the caution and recommendation to people that if you don't have to come in today, uh, it's just going to make things a lot easier with the right. relief effort if you don't. So my observation coming, coming down here uh, this morning was that uh, things are pretty quiet in Manhattan today. I, I don't know how you answer this question. Well, I have to ask you. I mean, obviously the city will recover physically, but, but how does it ever recover emotionally? Uh, it becomes stronger as a result of this. It becomes more uh, understanding of uh, the special role that the city, city of New York has. We're, we're a democratic society. We're open to people. We're a city that's built itself on immigration and on, and on tolerance and on caring for people. And it's a city that has a reputation of being able to handle the worst situations probably better than anything else. So we, we now have to be an example to, um, you know, to the rest of America and how, and how we handle this and how, how we show cowardly terrorists that they're not going to make us afraid. They All just right. can't do it. We're, we're you know, uh, someone said that the most visible symbol of New York were the, you know, the World Trade Center towers. And I... Uh, it certainly was a visible symbol, but the most visible symbol in New York is the spirit of a free people. And we're going we're to show them that we can overcome this, and by reflecting on it and understanding what happened to us, we're going to be even stronger. Mayor Giuliani, we certainly appreciate Thank your you. time. We know you have a busy day ahead of you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. 21 past the hour. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you. Joseph Albaugh is the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Director Albaugh, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Katie. On Tuesday, I know that President Bush declared New York a federal disaster area. What specific role is FEMA playing in the recovery efforts and the cleanup? Well, immediately we activated uh, 12 urban search and rescue teams, four to go to Northern Virginia, to the Pentagon, D.C. area, and eight to New York City. Uh, I commend those New Yorkers. They are, have a resilient spirit, as the mayor said. They're working hard, but right now, folks have been working almost 24 hours, and we need to give them relief. We're still in a response and recovery mode right now. Folks are still alive. We want to get them out of the building, and that's what we're focused on. As we well know from what happened in Oklahoma City, this could be a very long, drawn-out process. Do you have enough personnel on deck, if you will, to replace those who become exhausted at the scene? Absolutely. Not only do we have uh, our full-time employees, we have our part-time partners that are disaster assistance employees from all across the country, and then we have our neighbors, folks that we count on in time of any incident such as this. And uh, they're all across the United States, ready, willing, and able to help. When you say neighbors, meaning neighbors right next door i mean this is this is an incident that, that that brings the best out of americans everyone puts aside their their petty differences and rallies to a common cause we'll get beyond this it will take some time it will be painful but it will be done so you're saying you might enlist the help of say firefighters rescue teams police officers from other jurisdictions throughout absolutely. the country absolutely what is your top priority right now my top priority are to make sure that the mayor, Governor Pataki, who I spoke with this morning, have what they need. Those resources, those uh, individuals that need to assess, assist the city in, in this recovery effort. I'll probably be going to the Hill this morning, doing a legislative briefing, and then up to New York City this afternoon to make sure that the president has his eyes and ears on this subject. Director Alba, I know FEMA steps in in, in in disasters and national emergencies, but what unique challenges is this situation, uh, are you faced with in this situation? Well, our biggest challenge right at the minute, starting in about, uh, oh, 35 minutes, our 800 number will be open for those who need immediate assistance. That 800 number is 462-9029. At 8 o'clock Eastern time, it'll be open, making sure that folks have cash money, if they need temporary housing, identifying those folks that need that assistance. And then the second thing we have to do is make sure we have the necessary personnel in New York, in Washington, responding to this disaster. So the FEMA helpline is, should be used primarily because we don't want to overload it. 
by people who may need housing assistance, but they for need... people who don't know of the whereabouts of their loved ones, that, that is, is not, not the number, number that they that should call. That is not a number to call. These are individuals who have been harmed. They need temporary assistance immediately. Let me give that number again. It's 1-800-462-9029. Also, correct. we have a couple of other numbers that I think we'd like to give. One for blood donations. How serious is the need for blood donors? Well, as you know, yesterday uh, flights were grounded, rightly so, so that uh, harmed uh, our ability to get blood where we needed it. Folks, if they can, they should donate. Go to their local chapters. I'm sure they're going to be sprouting up all over the United States. We need blood to assist this. Disaster. In fact, we have a number uh, of the American Red Cross, 1-800-448-3543. Individuals can call that number and find out where they should go to donate blood. And for financial contributions, Director Alba, I know that people can call the Salvation Army. Is that right? Salvation Army, American Red Cross, uh, we have Catholic Charities, uh, Baptist Men. We have numerous volunteer agencies, which is what makes America so strong in its spirit, as the mayor alluded to. All right. Well, FEMA Director Joseph Alba. Director Alba, again, thanks very much for talking with us. Good luck you, in Jamie. the days and weeks to come. We Thank appreciate you. it. Talk to you soon. Thank you. It is 726. Once again, here's Matt. Well, Katie, as we talked about yesterday, the need for blood is severe, and we were happy to report that here in New York, at least, and I'm sure in Washington and other places, people have been going to hospitals and blood donation centers lining up That's right. that to is offer heartening. blood. When the nation comes under attack, the nation, of course, rallies behind the president looking for leadership and comfort. NBC's Campbell Brown is at the White House this morning. Campbell, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. The president is in the Oval Office. He's starting the day here with his national security team. The focus here now on getting federal aid to the thousands of people touched by these attacks and finding those responsible. The lights were on at the White House well after midnight as the president's national security team sifted through the latest intelligence, honing in on who was behind the attacks, preparing the U.S. response. In his address to the nation, the president issued a strong warning to any country that might aid the terrorists. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. White House officials say it was the president's decision to return to Washington. As Bush arrived at the White House, aides described his demeanor as somber but even keeled. His message to the country, American strength will overcome. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. As Tuesday's attacks began, the president was preparing to speak to school children in Sarasota, Florida. He first got word a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center from Chief of Staff Andy Card, then a phone call from National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, then a second crash. Card whispered in the president's ear, Bush's reaction, one of shock. Immediately, the Secret Service activated an emergency plan to protect the president. He took off on Air Force One, but his destination was kept secret. The plane became a flying command center, Bush's first call to Vice President Cheney. Cheney, Rice, and the president's national security team huddled in the White House Situation Room. But the scene outside on the White House grounds chaos as all other staff and press are rushed out in a mass evacuation. Fire trucks blazed down Pennsylvania Avenue. Crowds gathered in the streets as buildings nearby were evacuated. Air Force One brought the president to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, where the president vowed to retaliate. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Minutes later, Air Force One took off again, the destination again a secret. Early afternoon, the plane landed in Nebraska at the U.S. Strategic Command Center near Omaha. Bush went into a bunker to talk to his national security team by live video conference. Fighter jets escorted Air Force One back to Washington. From the plane, he fielded calls from world leaders and spoke twice with First Lady Laura Bush, telling his wife he would soon see her at home. And security around the White House this morning is especially tight. Matt, the president is expected to be here throughout the day. He's invited members of Congress here to the White House later this morning for what the White House is calling a unity meeting. And then later this afternoon, the president and first lady will participate in a blood drive here on the White House grounds. The president asking all White House employees to donate. Matt. All right. Thanks, Campbell. NBC's Campbell Brown at the White House this morning. Now here's Katie. Matt, thank you.
The president is expected to meet with his national security staff this morning. Secretary of State Colin Powell is just across the Potomac River at the State Department this morning. Secretary Powell, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Katie. On a human level, I just want to get your reaction to the events of yesterday. Uh, total shock. I was in a meeting in Lima, Peru with uh, President Toledo and his uh, associates when a note was handed to me and uh, I just shouted out across the, the breakfast table, oh my God. And then the situation got worse over the next 20 minutes as more reports came in and I immediately made plans to return to Washington. Before returning though, I did attend briefly a meeting of the Organization of American States where 34 other total states, the United States is 33, were assembled to bring into effect a new charter on democracy. And we did that by, by just a simple vote of acclamation. And then all of the delegates stood and applauded this statement in support of democracy and to show solidarity with the American people in this time of crisis. Since my return, I've been in touch with uh, leaders around the world, with Lord Robertson in NATO, with Javier Salon in the European Union, and Kofi Annan to make sure everybody understands that we need a worldwide, worldwide response to this assault on America because it's an assault on civilization, it's an assault on democracy, it's an assault on the world, and the world must respond as the United States plans to respond. Secretary Powell, last night the President said those who harbor these criminals will be held responsible if we believe the man behind this is in fact Osama bin Laden and that the Taliban, the ruling government in Afghanistan is harboring him. What can the United States do to actually back up the President's words? Well, there are many options available to us, military options, diplomatic options, further isolation of any country that might be uh, harboring uh, who is responsible. We are not yet prepared to state this morning who is responsible, but the evidence is, uh, is mounting, and uh, I think uh, it'll point us in the right direction in the not-too-distant future, and then we will have to not only take action on our own part, but also mobilize the world against whatever regimes may be supporting the terrorists who conducted this act. So you're saying, General Powell, that as of this morning, you cannot say that U.S. officials believe Osama bin Laden was responsible for this? Let me just say that there is uh, evidence uh, being developed now, and uh, good evidence. We will be able to make a definitive statement in due course, but I think it is best not to speculate until we do have the evidence uh, all assembled and we make an informed judgment and announcement at that time. Secretary Powell, a diplomatic response may be seem meager to many Americans who in a poll this morning said 94 percent say they would support military action in retaliation if the U.S. can identify the groups or nation responsible. 92 percent said they would support it even if it meant entering a war. What is your response to that? I fully understand uh, the, uh, the views of the American people this morning. We're mad. We were assaulted. Uh, but our spirit wasn't assaulted and our fighting spirit was not assaulted. So we want to respond. You don't attack America like, America like this and get away with it. And so uh, I can assure the American people uh, that the president, if he is able to get the information uh, pinpointing who it is and where they are and get targetable information, I am quite confident that he will look at every option he has available to him to respond militarily. Along those lines, uh, is the U.S. government prepared to enter a war against these terrorists? And wouldn't that entail committing ground troops to find them, weed them out? After all, the U.S. has launched airstrikes against terrorist targets in the past, and the terrorists continue to survive, even flourish. Let's not think that one single counterattack will rid the world of uh, terrorism of the kind we saw yesterday. This is going to take a, a multifaceted attack uh, along many dimensions, diplomatic, military, intelligence, law enforcement, all sorts of things will have to be done to bring this scourge under control. And it is not just one organization, it's a network of organizations. We have to make the whole world understand that this is something we all have to be involved in and not just see it as a discrete response to a single incident. We'll do that. But we have to realize that terrorism has been around for a very long time and it's going to take a very long time to root it out. But what the president specifically was focusing on last night is that there are nations, there are states, there are organizations who provide havens. And these uh, states and organizations cannot be given a free ride any longer. And a uh, major part of our diplomatic effort will be to mobilize the international community against the actions of such states and organizations once we have a clear understanding of who is responsible for this and who might have been giving them havens. Do you think this was an individual cell of terrorists, or do you believe this could be state-sponsored 
In other words, could Iraq or a country like that have been involved in this? Uh, I, I just don't know at this point. I'd rather not speculate. I'm sure as the evidence mounts, we will have a better idea of one, who is directly responsible, and two, what kind of support they may have been receiving from outside that cell, outside that network, from either state, spot, state organizations or other types of uh, terrorist organizations. But I'd uh, think it best we not speculate too wildly at this point. The U.S. spends billions of dollars on intelligence. Was this, in your view, a massive intelligence failure, as it has been called? I wouldn't characterize it uh, that way. We spend many, many billions of dollars on intelligence, and that intelligence uh, allows us to thwart many attacks. There are many terrorist attacks that never took place because of the fine work of our intelligence and law enforcement uh, experts. But in this case, we did not get the, uh, the queuing we needed. We did not get the intelligence information needed to predict that this was about to happen or be aware of, uh, of this kind of event coming our way. Um, so I think it's premature to call it an intelligence failure. Uh, let's see what we might have picked up as we go back and do the post-mortem on how this all came about. Would you agree with your former colleague, General Schwarzkopf, that we need to emphasize human intelligence uh, as much as technical intelligence? And we've got all the technological toys that, that can be used for those purposes, but what we need are real thinking, seeing people on the ground to infiltrate <clears> these <throat> groups. Absolutely, but it's easier said than done. Um, and we do have to emphasize human intelligence because uh, you can defeat electronic intelligence just by not emitting. So human intelligence is very, very important. And I know that our intelligence uh, community is uh, very aware of that. But these are also difficult activities to penetrate and to be able to stay within such a network for a long period of time. But certainly this will be looked at as we review everything we're doing in the field of intelligence. If we do engage uh, in, an, in another country or take military action, what are the ramifications? In other words, if an Islamic fundamentalist group was responsible, what kind of uh, retaliation might we, we expect and what kind of access do they have, these groups, to weapons of mass destruction? Well, let me not uh, speculate as to what we might do. I think a uh, full range of options will be available, and I know that the Secretary of Defense and his colleagues are looking at that. Um, it all depends on where we run this to ground as to what counterattack we might receive from uh, those who are responsible. But at this time, it's premature to start speculating or to identify them as Islamic fundamentalists. Let's just identify them as a terrorist group uh, that can have no religious underpinning, no, no legitimate underpinning for this kind of action. This is murder, which is against the tenets of every every religion, every responsible religion that uh, is in the world, and it is receiving condemnation from around the world from people of all faiths and, and religious backgrounds. So let's just view them as what they are, terrorist organizations. Uh, and I cannot speculate whether they might have access to the kinds of weapons you've discussed, because we don't know exactly who it is yet, but we'll be on guard for that. Secretary of State Colin Powell. Secretary Powell, I'm sorry to see you under such terrible circumstances, but we certainly appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. It is 7.38. Now here's Matt. And Katie, I've just been given a report, and I hope it's the first of many reports like this, but we're now being told that six survivors have been found in the rubble of the World Trade Center in lower Manhattan, one police officer and five civilians. Again, hopefully this will be the first of many such reports. And there you see the Statue of Liberty on what has turned out to be another beautiful morning. The irony was that yesterday was a sparkling, crystal clear morning before this terror took place in New York City and Washington and in Pennsylvania. NBC's Pentagon correspondent Jim McLeshetsky was at the Pentagon when that building was struck by a hijacked airliner. He's with us again this morning. Mick, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. It was exactly 22 hours ago now that a terrorist flew a passenger plane into the side of the Pentagon here. Firefighters continue to pour tons of water on the stubborn fires that continue to flare up. Unfortunately, grim news this morning. Rescuers report no signs of life underneath the tons of rubble. Once the fires are completely out and that damaged area deemed somewhat structurally sound, the number one task, recover the dead. Rescue workers using cadaver dogs worked through the night on the grisly task of searching for the dead. Local fire officials estimate as many as 800 were killed, many still buried in the debris. 
The Pentagon, the center of America's military power, devastated by a sneak terrorist attack. American Airlines Flight 77 hijacked shortly after takeoff from Dulles Airport, with terrorists at the controls traveling at 600 miles per hour with 6,000 gallons of fuel. The jet slams into the two lower floors of the Pentagon. It kind of disappeared over this embankment here for a moment, and then huge explosion, flames flying into the air, and, and uh, just chaos on the road. I hate to say it, but I did fall apart when it first happened. I was very frightened. Um, this doesn't happen in America. I guess it does. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was at work at his desk. I felt the, the shock of the uh, airplane hitting the building. Uh, went through the building and then out into the area and they were bringing uh, bodies out that had been injured. The plane slices deep into the Pentagon, cutting through offices primarily occupied by the Navy and Marines. The upper floors later collapse. The question now, how will the U.S. military respond? Worldwide, American military forces are put at the highest state of alert, ThreatCon Delta. And even as part of the Pentagon burn, military planners continue to review the options. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Hugh Shelton, with a pledge to retaliate against those responsible. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next. But make no mistake about it, your armed forces are ready. The Pentagon has long had a number of contingency plans to attack a variety of Osama bin Laden targets. Those plans are now under serious review. The aircraft carrier Enterprise, headed home from the Persian Gulf, ordered to remain in the area in case President Bush orders military strikes. And the U.S. military is in already in action this morning. AWACS radar planes and fighter jets are patrolling the skies over certain areas of the United States uh, just in case uh, there are any additional terrorist attacks against targets here in America. And incredibly, even though the, uh, you can see the devastation behind me on the other side of the Pentagon, uh, employees here, military, civilian, are reporting to work. They're trying their best to make it look like business as usual, uh, sort of an act of defiance in the face of terrorism, Matt. Yeah, Mick, business as usual. However, as you mentioned in your piece, the strange fact is that at one part of the building, there is destruction, and at the same time, probably right now, there is planning going on in another side of the building. That's absolutely right, Matt. Uh, those contingency plans have been in place for a long time. And, uh, and given the, the very firm resolve and, and, and strong rhetoric from President Bush last night, uh, it's pretty clear to the, uh, to the military officials here uh, that they've got a job ahead of them. All right, Jim McCloskey at the Pentagon this morning. Jim, thank you. Okay, Matt. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you. NBC's Andrew Mitchell is at the State Department this morning. Andrew, as you know, I just spoke with Secretary of State Colin Powell. He did not feel comfortable saying outright that U.S. officials believe Osama bin Laden was responsible for this attack. But privately, what are they saying at the State Department? Privately, U.S. officials here at the State Department and in other places around Washington are saying that uh, there is no evidence at all that a state such as Iraq may have sponsored this. In fact, there is only one terror organization that they know of that has the means and the opportunity to mount something this massive, this well organized, and that person who leads that organization is Osama bin Laden. I think it is realistic. I think we have In the rubble of the disaster, clues possibly linking the attack to bin Laden, America's most wanted terrorist. Reports to the Senate that a member of bin Laden's group may be identified as a passenger on one of the four doomed planes, and reports of intercepted communications between his followers after the attack, talking about the target being hit. A lot of things point to it. Was either, I, I would think it would either be uh, uh, Osama bin Laden's cell or some other cell similar to it or kin to it or spin off from it. Why bin Laden? Method, motive, money. A well-financed global network responsible for the simultaneous bombings of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania three years ago. Linked to the mastermind of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993 also accused of plotting millennium bombings targeting Los Angeles International Airport, American tourist sites in Jordan, and a U.S. destroyer. Those plots foiled by counterintelligence teams. But six months later, disaster. The bombing of the USS Cole in Yemen last October. In this chilling Bin Laden training video released in June, a chorus sings, quote, We thank God for granting us victory the day we destroyed the coal. 
Bin Laden himself is seen saying they charged and destroyed a destroyer. If it is Bin Laden, can the U.S. finally track him down? He's a master of deception, harbored by Afghanistan's Taliban rulers for years, moving constantly, eluding the FBI. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, but my expectation is that eventually there'll be a crack uh, somewhere in their armor, and, and we will determine who is responsible. Then, of course, you have the very difficult task of deciding how to respond and where to respond. And questions will be asked about the intelligence failure that permitted the terrorists to strike with no warning. It's true that we cannot have 100% success against suicide bombers who are prepared to take their own lives into their hands. But at the same time, particularly in a sophisticated operation like this, that there are lots of people involved, it needs a lot of coordination. And that creates opportunities for an effective intelligence operation. For weeks, Afghanistan has been warned that if bin Laden acted against America, America would act against Afghanistan. That warning repeated only just this morning by Colin Powell and, of course, last night by President Bush. So if there is evidence that can be built and a case can be made against Osama bin Laden, Katie, there is no question that America will strike Afghanistan and strike hard. Andrea, one reason apparently U.S. intelligence officials believe it was Osama bin Laden is that there was communications between bin Laden supporters intercepted following the attacks. Uh, I guess words of congratulations along those lines. This according to Senator Orrin Hatch. What have they said about that at the State Department? Well, the officials throughout the government are very concerned that Senator Hatch said that publicly. They do not like to talk about electronic intercepts because that is the most secret aspect of what the National Security Agency does. But in fact, we have confirmed uh, Senator Hatch may not have spoken uh, wisely, but he was not misspeaking. There were intercepts as far as we've been told. And this is a pattern because bin Laden's organization also communicated electronically after the embassy bombings. That was a key factor in building the case. Mm -hmm. So they are building a case, Katie, as Secretary Powell told you. Let me ask you about another thing that Secretary Powell said, Andrea. He talked about diplomatic solutions. Realistically, what could be done diplomatically that would have any teeth at all or any impact? Well, they will respond militarily. He made that very clear, if a case can be built. But there is a role for diplomacy. Secretary Powell has already, as he said, been in touch with Kofi Annan and with leaders around the world. They have to explain the United States position, particularly in a, at a time when, let's be frank, the U.S. is not widely loved in many sections of the world, in the Gulf, in the Middle East. So there will be a, a backlash, if you will, if it does turn out to be Middle Eastern terrorism. And he has to lay the groundwork for that and make the case that he was making this morning, which is that this is an attack against civilization. This needs a worldwide response. And at least from the initial response from, from China, from Russia, from Middle Eastern countries, even Libya, even Libya, even Libya and Libya Iran and, and condemn these Fidel attacks. Fidel Castro, exactly. This is such a horror that I don't think it will be difficult, especially for someone like Colin Powell, to make this case. And in fact, he may travel to the region, is that right? Uh, we, it's not clear what travel he may undertake, but there have been suggestions that he may personally visit some other countries in order to build that case. But that would be obviously uh, most likely after a coordinated military response from the United States. NBC's Andrea Mitchell at the State Department. Andrea, as always, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. 748, once again, here's Matt. Katie, back here to New York. Doctors at St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan have been working around the clock to save the wounded. Dr. Richard Westfall is the Associate Director of Emergency Services there. Dr. Westfall, good morning to you. Good morning. I, I, we've just had a report, and I want to ask you to comment on this, that six survivors have been recently pulled from the rubble of the World Trade Center. What can you tell me about that? Now, Mr. Lauer, I, I honestly can't tell you anything uh, uh, absolute about that because we have not gotten any additional victims since the early morning hours. We had two police officers about 3 a.m. who came in a rescue mission. They, uh, they came injured. They were not removed from the debris. So I cannot comment on those six. We've not gotten anybody here at St. Vincent's. They may have gone to other hospitals. All right, you're the closest trauma center to the World Trade Center. Give me your overall numbers so far. How many people have you been treating? Over the past almost 24 hours now, we've had 375 victims that have been brought here. And of that, about uh, 53 have been rescue workers, uh, firefighters, uh, EMTs, paramedics, and police officers who have been injured have come here. We've had over 50 major traumas in the sense of uh, major fractures and, and head trauma and uh, loss of uh, consciousness. We've had four patients that expired at St. Vincent's in Manhattan here. Uh, two patients came in having CPR from a traumatic arrest. 
yesterday. Uh, one of the first victims we got with a major burn expired during the day, and then we had a, a firefighter who was uh, brought out from a building around mid-afternoon who expired in the operating room. Uh, there was one other victim that was brought to one of our other seven hospitals by ferry. Twenty patients were brought to St. Vincent's in Staten Island, and one of those victims we told expired there. I understand that, that burns are one of the major problems, major traumas that you're seeing. Well, initially, uh, Mr. Lau, that's true. Uh, I'd say probably we had up to about 15, 20 major burns, and what we did since uh, the patients were brought immediately to the closest trauma center, we stabilized them, made sure it was just burns that they had, initiated treatment, and I can tell you that uh, I'm told that uh, yesterday evening three of the major burns victims were transferred to from here to New York Hospital's burn center. Uh, they were very receptive and helpful as well. Dr. Westall, I know that people, uh, civilians living in the area, have been coming down trying to drop off supplies and things that they're assuming the hospital may need, including clothing. Can you tell me what it is that you do need and what it is that you don't need? Yeah, uh, that's, that's very helpful. At this point, in the beginning early hours, we needed everything, but I got to tell you, through the media appropriate, uh, trying appropriately, that message went all day and all night. We do not need any physicians or nurses. We do not need any additional volunteers at our site right now. Uh, I think what we all need are, you know, prayers and concerns for family members of loved ones that are, that are down there. But we don't need any exact uh, help that way. We've had local institutions that have been bringing us food, and our local Starbucks is bringing us coffee all night, and uh, we've had tremendous help that way. So I think... Uh, if everybody just, uh, you know, make sure that they're getting their, their proper care. I think anybody, I'll speak medically, anyone that has minor concerns of anxiety or post-stress reduction that's of a minor nature, they probably should contact their own physicians as the first line of defense today. But anybody who can't get to contact or see their physician, certainly they should come to their local hospitals. And we at St. Vincent's and every hospital in Manhattan and the five boroughs, I'm sure, are very open right. to, to helping them. And, Doctor, I was just reading that... that, that some of the doctors and nurses who work at St. Vincent's, Vincent's are actually married to police and firefighters, and there was a lot of difficulty yesterday in them contacting their loved ones, which I can imagine was, was a horrible scene. Yes, it's, it's very hard. I, I, I think uh, I can mention that the nurses and, and, and some of our administrative staff that did have loved ones in fire and police that were at the scene and they could not contact, Yes, there was a tremendous level of anxiety, but fortunately, uh, during the heat of the battle, everybody focused on their, on their mission of, of treating, stabilizing, triaging patients, and then uh, the rest of the hospital had areas that dealt with uh, families and questions that came in. We had blood donations, and I, one thing I can mention, it'll be on TV, it'll be publicized, but they are taking blood donations, but at the major blood banks, I, I know at St. Vincent's and other hospitals, you know, uh, patients shouldn't come to donate blood, but I would watch the notices on on your show and other uh, stations that will well, tell you where to donate blood at the major uh, New York City blood bank. All right, what you're saying is you don't want people to come down there and clog the hospital up when there's other work to be done. That's You'd rather correct. them go to the donation centers. Dr. Richard Westfall, doctor, thank you so much. I hope you see more and more survivors today. Thank you, Ms. Lauer. We do also. Thank we, you. We appreciate your time. Thanks. 53 past the hour. Here's Katie. Matt, the pre precision of Tuesday's attacks boggles the mind. Four simultaneous hijackings of U.S. airliners. Air travel here will never be the same. NBC's Robert Hager is at Washington, D.C.'s Ronald Reagan International Airport this morning. Bob, good morning. Good morning, Katie. Well, there you see the idle planes at the gate. The plan, theoretically, is to resume flying. There's clearance to the airlines to fly as of noon today, but in reality, it's probably going to take a lot longer. For instance, here, they won't even be opening the terminal until 3 o'clock. So expect a very, very slow return to normal later on today and tight, tight security. As for the hijacking, officials now say that each plane was commandeered by three to five terrorists probably killing the pilots and taking over controls of each of the planes using knives as weapons. Here then is what's known. Four planes, 266 on board, lost at the hands of suicidal hijackers who turned them into weapons of vast destruction. Boston's Logan Airport, an American flight with 92 aboard, supposed to fly cross-country to Los Angeles, diverted to New York. A flight attendant calls from the flight on her cell phone. Chilling news. Her fellow flight attendants have been stabbed, she reports. Passenger cabin taken over, and they're going down in New York. 
back in Boston, a United jetliner with 65 aboard is already in the air, also bound for Los Angeles, 18 minutes behind the first flight, when it, too, is diverted. A businessman on the flight calls his father twice. First call, a flight attendant has been stabbed, he says. Calls again to tell his dad the plane is going down. This is the actual video of that second plane crashing into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. In Northern Virginia, an American jet takes off from Dulles Airport. 64 aboard this flight, headed to Los Angeles. On board, Barbara Olson, wife of the U.S. Solicitor General, calls her husband on a cell phone, tells him hijackers have taken over that flight with knife-like instruments, passengers being forced to the back of the plane, she reports. Moments later, the plane hits the Pentagon. And finally, Newark Airport, another United flight, 45 aboard, bound Newark to San Francisco. Hijackers turn it back to Washington, D.C., but it comes down en route in western Pennsylvania. Officials say it wasn't shot down, so hijackers may have crashed it too soon, or there could have been a struggle ongoing in the cockpit. Four deadly flights, says terrorism expert Neil Livingstone. I clearly call this a war. I think this is a wake-up call for America. I don't think we'll ever be the same after these attacks today. How much did the government know as it was happening? Pilots are able to send coded signals to controllers if they're hijacked, but it's uncertain whether any of these crews had time. Even if they did, controllers would have been frustrated, powerless to do much more than notify official Washington and track the plane's moves. Since most previous hijackings have ended without loss of life, it's a hands-off approach that's worked best until now. And finally, security. Former commercial pilot Jim Tillman. Airline travel across the world will never be the same. It particularly will be different in the United States. And what we have known to be open and free airports will change radically. Passenger screening, a special issue. Previously, unannounced testing has shown screeners miss even mocked up guns or explosives one out of every five times. And knives are sometimes even permitted through intentionally if they don't appear menacing. Today, the National Transportation Safety Board is sending investigators to the scenes of these various crashes, and they're helping the FBI search for the plane's cockpit voice recorders. Those are the recorders that record all the voices in the cockpit, and they could, if they're found, provide valuable information on who committed these horrible acts and why. Katie? Bob, so many questions unanswered this morning. So are you saying that the FAA or air traffic controllers might have realized while these planes were in the air that they were in fact being hijacked? In other words, did they get any word from the pilot? Were they able to trace the flight and realize they were off course? I think, yes, they would have seen that the blips were off course. Now, the way we've heard it, the hijackers had disabled the transponders on these planes. So what controllers would have been getting on the radar is a blip. They'd see that the blip was not where it's supposed to be, but the blip wouldn't have any identity on it, wouldn't have the altitude on it. Uh, they may also have gotten, as I say, these secret codes. But again, if a plane is being hijacked, the history of the hijacked, and they've been so rare, but the history of hijacked is they usually end peacefully. Nobody would imagine that one was going to be an act of terrorism where they're making this plane into a suicidal weapon. And so uh, the history being peaceful is that you sort of play hands off and let the plane go wherever the hijackers want to take it, mm -hmm. and then everybody's released and it ends quietly. So there's not a real history for how to deal with something like this. I mean, it just wasn't on their chart. And Bob, were, were knives apparently the weapons of choice on all these planes? I know that some have described uh, one of the weapons as box cutters. And how were they able to get those on the plane given airport security? You mentioned that oftentimes the, these are missed, but do, do uh, airline officials believe they might have even gotten some help inside on the ground with either cleaning crews or maintenance crews along those lines? Well, that's always a possibility. It's pretty early to tell whether that's involved in this or not. But chances are, no, I'd say if I had to guess, that probably they did go through the security. Now, sometimes knives are permitted. There's some rule about if the blade isn't longer than four inches, it's really okay to take it through. So it's kind of the discretion of those screeners whether the, the uh, knife looks menacing. Uh, for instance, people often take these little pen knives onto planes. Uh, so that's, that's one way they could have got it through security. And otherwise, uh, as you say, security quite often misses uh, things that are even more obvious than that. Well, obviously, security at airports is going to be reevaluated, to say the oh, least. Oh, you bet, you bet. Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you also, Bob, we've heard stories of possible heroism on that plane that crashed in Pittsburgh that was en route, the United flight, I believe, from Newark there is to one San report. Francisco. Yeah, there were people on the cell phone from that plane, 
And there's one report, somebody uh, calling a relative and saying, uh, we're going to go down anyway, uh, hijackers had this plane, uh, we're going to take them over and go down with it, something like that, to indicate that they were going to take on the hijackers physically in kind of an all-out life-or-death effort. So there is one story that they may have succeeded in overcoming the hijackers, but then been unable to fly the plane and that's why it crashed. But that's very, very preliminary. It'll really help to find the cockpit voice recorder. And of all the cockpit voice recorders, that one out there in the field in Pennsylvania may be the first that they find. All right. Bob Hager at Reagan uh, National Airport in Washington, D.C. Bob, thanks very much. Thank you, Kitty. Two of the planes that were hijacked and intentionally crashed took off from Logan International Airport in Boston. NBC's Chris Hansen is in Boston this morning. Chris, some major developments there so far. Well, that's right, Katie. Last night, federal authorities confirmed for NBC News that they believe there has been an active terrorist cell with ties to Osama bin Laden operating in the Boston area. Now, this morning comes word that authorities may have identified some of the actual hijackers, and here's how they think they might have done that. Yesterday, they got a phone call from a passenger who had left Logan and arrived at his destination. Of course, he saw on the television monitors what had happened at the World Trade Center. He called investigators to say that he had had an altercation with two men he described as being Arabic in the central parking garage near the American Airlines terminal here at Boston Logan. He described the car that they were near, which was a, turned out to be a rental car, a Mitsubishi sedan. Investigators arrived at the sedan, took a quick look, and they found inside that there were flight training manuals in Arabic. They were able to connect that sedan to two men who are now identified as brothers, both of whom who have passports from the United Arab Emirates, one of whom is a trained pilot. Now, there's been another development in terms of other suspects here, and that is that investigators now believe that two to three other suspects may have come across the border into the U.S. from Canada and flown here yesterday morning from Portland, Maine, to take part in the hijacking. All right, Chris Hansen in Boston. Chris, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your reporting from there this morning. It's 8.01. Now, here's Matt. Katie, thank you. Uh, L. Paul Bremer is former ambassador at large for counterterrorism at the State Department. Ambassador Bremer, good morning to you. Morning. What, when you think of an attack like this, is this something that would have been weeks, months, years in the planning? At a minimum, it's months, conceivably even years. As you just heard, this is a very complicated operation that involved dozens of people and it's clearly a massive security failure at our airports and a significant intelligence failure in addition. Well, I, you know, I've heard count, uh, conflicting reports there, Ambassador Bremer, because I've heard some people say this was a large group, well-funded. I've heard other people say it may have been a much smaller group because a larger group would tend to slip up in communications. Well, we, uh, if, we, uh, if what we are hearing this morning is correct and there were three to five hijackers on each of four planes, you're already in the 20s. And they had support people. They had to get in this country. They had to rent a car, as we've just heard. They had to get across borders. Uh, this is a very complicated professional operation. This is not something that was done by a group of, uh, of guys who just got together one day and decided to conduct an attack uh, two weeks later. Secretary Powell this morning talked to Katie, and he said that, you know, we have to remember that our intelligence does pick up and thwart many attacks aimed at the United States, but, but obviously we missed this one. What are the reasons, the basic reasons, in your opinion, that we may have missed this one? Well, let me make a couple of points. First of all, um, it is true that in this particular area, this is the most difficult intelligence in the world to collect against terrorist groups, because the only way you can get it is to have a spy in the terrorist group itself who's willing to tell you ahead of time about the plan. Human that, intelligence. Yeah, and, and after all, that's the objective of a good counter-terrorist policy, is to prevent attacks. Now, it happens that the National Commission on Terrorism, which I chaired, looked at this question rather closely and found that the CIA is operating under restrictive guidelines in the area of recruiting these kinds of terrorist spies, and we recommended, recommended that those guidelines be rescinded. That was a year ago. We made that recommendation to the President and to Congress, and to my knowledge, uh, 15 months later, nothing has happened. Well, let me stop you there, because I want you to be more specific. What your recommendation was that, that it be allowed for the CIA to recruit more of the, quote, unsavory types, the people with criminal records, and use them for our benefit? That's right. You know, if you're going to get good intelligence on terrorist groups, you're going to have to pay, put on our payroll some people that are not very nice people. They're terrorists. By definition, they're criminals. They may violate people's human rights. They may kill people, indeed.
But that's the only way you're going to get good intelligence so you can prevent this kind of horror from happening. I'm not... If our recommendation had been followed, this would have been prevented, not by any means, because as Secretary Powell pointed out, we do have good intelligence, we do prevent attacks. The problem is, in terrorism, you can very rarely talk about the attacks you prevent, and when you fail, it's dramatic and obvious to everybody. And let me ask you one final question, Ambassador Bremer. I mean, it seems as if indication is, even coming from government officials, for example, Senator Orrin Hatch, that communication has been intercepted within the group that is supportive to Osama bin Laden. But is there a danger that we may jump to the conclusion that he's responsible and his group is responsible and not conduct a thorough investigation in all directions? I, I would be very surprised if the government jumps to any conclusions. I think they will follow the uh, evidence trail where it leads. Bin Laden is certainly the number one suspect, but the fact that they had uh, at least uh, four and maybe six trained pilots uh, means you can't exclude the fact that there might have been some state support here because you can't train airline pilots in the deserts of Afghanistan. You've got to find them somewhere else. All right. Ambassador Bremer, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And now here's Katie. Matt, thank you. Ann Curry is downtown near the scene of the, the terrorism where the rescue efforts are ongoing. Ann, what's going on down there now? Katie, as you know, there was a mass going on now outside and around the areas of the Twin Towers. People have been working all night digging 12-hour uh, shifts in some cases for the fire department, for the police forces. Uh, we've seen them come out exhausted. Well, there have been some reports which have brought, in a, brought a lot of happiness to the people who have been working all so hard all night. Some reports that some people have been rescued alive, and there are reports that five or six firefighters have been pulled alive this morning, as well as two Port Authority police officers. Uh, we were seeking confirmation of this information, and so we found Battalion Chief uh, Kevin Burns to ask him about this information just a few moments ago. Part of what you said, we have heard a report that there have been people found alive in this building. What can you confirm? One person is confirmed so far. Do you know who it was? Was no. it a rescue person? A person we have no the idea at this time. They were not able to identify whether or not it was a uh, rescue worker or a civilian. Have you heard the condition of the person who was found alive? The person alive? is alive. Do we yeah, know anything about injuries? At uh, this time, I have no idea. So we don't know how critically or where he was rushed or she was rushed? No, not at this time. Okay. What are you doing now to get more people out, and are you still getting cell phone calls from under the rubble? Not that I know of at this time. Not that you know of at this time, but we understood from this morning that there were some cell phone calls being received. You, you cannot confirm that. We were receiving cell phone calls. We, we could not determine whether or not they were bogus or not. Bogus or not? So they're yeah. ISIS. You're tracking those down. What are you doing now to dig people out? We have canine units in there. We have units in there. Trying to find out people in the voids that are in there. How many people do you have digging? We have, I, I can't tell you. Hundreds of people digging? Police and fire? Correct. How far are they able to get in there with all the debris? Is there concern of collapse? There's always concern of collapse. But, uh, how far they can get in at this moment, I can't tell you. Hand tools with their hands? Anything we can do. I understand you also have cranes, however, donated from the Port Authority that you're actually lifting things with cranes. Is Correct. that true? Correct. How many cranes do you have operating? There's a, there's a multitude of cranes. What's, what's pushing these guys on? What's pushing all of these people who are working so hard for so many hours on? Is there a strong belief that people will still be alive? Oh, all all right. Right. Oh. Oh. I have to go now. Thank you. Uh, Your name, please? Chief Burns. Chief Burns. Name? That was Battalion Chief Kevin Burns. That was Battalion Chief Kevin Burns saying that there's always hope. That is going to now obviously encourage people even more who have come down here. And by the way, we should say that there are plenty of volunteers. We spoke to one who came down uh, yesterday at 10 o'clock. He has not left. They've been building stretchers out of wood. They've been mobilizing, uh, moving these stretchers around. And also, Katie, uh, they also, this is an interesting fact, they've gone into some of these federal buildings uh, all night last night. They were going into these different buildings searching for medical supplies. That's the level of desperation, searching for any medical supplies that they could bring out to create the triage units that they're still setting up here in hopes, in hopes that more people will be found alive under all of this rubble. Katie, back to you. All right, Ann, thank you very much. David Bloom is also near the scene. David, tell me what uh, is going on from your vantage point. Well, what we're told, Katie, is that they've rescued some firefighters. We don't know how many. We're live right now on the Today Show. Please, sir, if you could just come over here for just a minute. Thank you very much. Just tell me what happened. Uh, I just went up, went up by the World Trade Center to see exactly what happened. And um, in the process, I, I saw some, 
a lot of people digging out, trying to, you know, get somebody, like, they're digging out uh, people out of the um, rubble. And uh, eventually, when we looked up, excuse me, when we looked around, um, there was a guy on a gurney, and they wanted help, you know, wanted us to form a, a line to get him out so that he could get to, um, the ambulance. And um, I just got in the line and helped get him out. And according to one of the firefighters, he was buried for around um, nine hours. Now, where exactly was this? According, according to what I, what I remember of the World Trade Center, it was just the steps leading up um, to where they say it was a courtyard. I, I think that's right where he was. And do you know whether this firefighter is one of several who've been rescued this morning? That's what we're hearing. I have no idea. Okay. I just noticed that one guy, and I was just happy to see that they got one person out. And what sort of shape was he in? He wasn't in, he wasn't in a bad shape. He wasn't really in a bad shape. Was he talking? Uh, no, he didn't talk, but he raised his hand. That was a good sign. Okay, tell me your name. Yeah, I'm Court. Thanks very much. Okay. So, Katie, that's the latest in terms of the rescues that are going right now on right now here in Lower Manhattan. All right, David Bloom. David, thank you very much. Now with more, here's Matt. Katie, it was devastating enough to watch the attacks on our country unfold on Tuesday, but for many Americans, the devastation hit much closer to home. Moments before jetliners were deliberately crashed, there were a series of chilling phone calls made by victims aboard those doomed planes. Alice Hoagland got one such call from her son. Ms. Hoagland, our condolences to you. Appreciate that. Your son, Mark Bingham, was on board United Airlines Flight 93. That's the plane that took off from Newark, bound for San Francisco, and the plane that eventually crashed in Pennsylvania. Can that's, you tell me? That's right. Can you tell me about the call you received? Yes, we got a call at about 6.45 in the morning yesterday. Uh, uh, for, the house is full of people because we just have new babies in, this, in the house. A friend answered it. Carol Phipps went and, and got Mark's aunt, Kathy. Kathy spoke to him first. He told her, I love you. And she said, Mark, we love you very much. And then Kathy ran and got me. And Mark said, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. <laughs> I love you. First of all, I want to tell you guys I love you. And I, I repeated, Mark, we love you very much. And, and he said, I'm on a flight from, he identified it to Kathy as Flight 93, United Flight 93, of, of, from Newark to San Francisco. And the plane has been taken over by three guys, he said, who, who, uh, who say they have a bomb. And I asked him, Mark, who are these people? And he didn't hear me, didn't get the, get the question, didn't answer it, was distracted. And I, I asked the question again. I heard some commotion in the background. Uh, Mark seemed to be talking to someone else or someone was talking to him. Uh, and then the, the, the phone went dead. He told me at some point during the conversation that he was not calling me with his cell phone. He was using the air phone, probably at his seat. Uh, we know from other sources that, that he was sitting in seat 4D, which is the first class on, uh, on this United flight. I, I'm a flight attendant for United Airlines, as is my sister Candace Hoagland, and Mark was flying on her companion pass. Uh, uh, that's how they knew to contact us. Uh, Ms. Uh, Hoagland, terrible. you say you, you heard some commotion in the background. Can you describe that for me? Well, uh, the FBI uh, has asked us similar questions, asked us if, if we heard Mark mention anything besides the bomb. Uh, he made no mention of knives or box cutters or guns or, or any other weapons. He mentioned the three guys. He wasn't able to get out word about their description, who he thought they might be. I couldn't make out anything distinct from the background. I was trying hard to hear his voice, which was coming over clearly when he was speaking. He spoke uh, fairly slowly, calmly, uh, although I could tell he was under a great deal of duress. After the phone went dead, Ms. Hoagland, how, how long was it after that, that that you heard that indeed that plane had crashed? The call came in about 6.45. We understand that the plane crashed about 7 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And so I guess uh, probably by the time we hung up, he hung up with us or the phone went dead, it was about, about three minutes. That he had about 12 more minutes to live, I guess. Uh, we hope that Mark was able to take a proactive 
part in thwarting these hijackers. So we, I have hope that he was able to. He was in a good position. He was, uh, he was forward in the aircraft, could probably be in full view of everything that was going on, probably w w saw what happened in the cockpit. He was a very active, uh, take charge, assertive young man. Uh, uh, we have it from other people, uh, another man on the aircraft who called his wife, who said that they were, uh, he was, he and some other passengers were hoping to, to get at these guys somehow. So uh, this was the only flight of the four uh, that did not reach its target, which they believed to be Camp David, and that gives us reason to think that perhaps Mark was able to help save the lives of people on the ground. Yeah, there was another cell phone call made from someone who'd locked himself in a rear bathroom who said that yeah. we're going to have yeah. to do something because it appears we're going to die either way and we have to try something. I mean, it, it appears that something heroic did take place on that I, flight. I, I certainly, I firmly believe that. Mark has been in a clinch in, a, in times past and has come through with flying colors. He's a Cal grad, uh, uh, rugby player, very assertive guy, aggressive. Uh, uh, and smart, and, and we love him very much. We're going to miss him. I can only, um, uh, you know, I think this might be a weird way to describe this, Miss Hoagland, but the phone call in some ways has to be thought of as a gift. Oh, we, we were very comforted to be able to get the news from Mark himself. Somehow it, it, it made it much easier to, to take. It's awful. It's a national time of mourning for all of us, so I'm just one of many, many people. We're, we're so touched by the words of our president, by the words of the Congress people hearing, hearing, hearing America being sung on the steps of the Capitol building. It's just profoundly moving for me. I'm, I'm delighted to see this rebirth of patriotism among the American people. We need to be strong and, and work together to overcome this hatred that's taken us over. Well, you are uh, amazingly strong given the circumstances, Ms. Hoagland, and uh, <sighs> uh, our, our condolences, our sin severe and sincere condolences Thank to you. you and your family. Our whole family appreciates it very much. We're just, I'm delighted to be able to express to the world how much we loved Mark Bingham, my son. He sounds like an amazing young man. Ms. Hoagland, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wow. What a, what a brave and eloquent woman at a very difficult time. We should mention there has been a, some speculation that we've alluded to throughout the broadcast that somehow a few passengers on that United flight that ultimately crashed outside Pittsburgh were perhaps able to overpower the hijackers, that that plane perhaps was headed toward Camp David, even the U.S. Capitol. Again, mm -hmm. this is just speculation. Knowing what we do about the plans of these hijackers to hit some sort of significant target, it, it would be hard to imagine that a field in Pennsylvania would have been their chosen destination. Anyway, so again, she was extremely courageous to talk with you. The impact of this attack on America is being felt nationwide this morning, of course. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport this morning. Kelly, good morning to you. Good morning, Katie. We're actually on the outside perimeter because security is keeping us out. O'Hare is, of course, at times the nation's busiest airport with 2,500 flights in and out of here on a typical day. But today it is quiet and nearly empty. Security in place of travelers. One indication, the airport snowplow fleet has been brought to different service gates to block their entrances so that people can't get in. The trains that would normally bring travelers here restricted only allow people can't get in. The trains that would normally bring travelers here restricted, only allowing airport employees to enter O'Hare. Of course, the airport is preparing to reopen perhaps sometime today, but here in Chicago and around the country, it's an uneasy start to the day. A nation stunned but responding. Americans giving what they know they can. Blood. I'm here just trying to do something that might help somebody in New York City or Washington, D.C. And prayers. Out of this enormous evil, in God's own way and God's own time, some good can come. But no coming together, none of the usual crowds at airports. An estimated 200,000 air travelers nationwide grounded. From coast to coast, deserted terminals, diverted passengers. We were planning on a trip 
Out through the Rocky Mountain here. Bit in Canada, and I don't know if we're even going to make it. Getting there by ground, slow too. Trains interrupted for hours. Amtrak just beginning to restore service. The impact even hitting drivers at the pump. Soaring gas prices reported in Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Illinois. Peoria, more than $4 a gallon. Terrorism fueling fears of a gas shortage. An abundance of caution at sightseeing spots around the country. Closed signs at Seattle Space Needle. Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell off limits. Minneapolis, the country's largest shopping mall, shut down. No stocks to buy, trading on Wall Street and at Chicago's markets closed again today. Oklahoma City, a place that knows much about catastrophic loss, closed its bombing memorial to visitors. Disney's theme parks, east and west, shut down, but planning to reopen today. Chicago's Wrigley Field and ballparks around the country empty. Major League Baseball calling off all games indefinitely. Six defensive backs for the National Football League says it will decide within a day or two if games will go forward this weekend. Hollywood already pulling the plug. Jay Leno's studio will be dark all week. This Sunday's Emmy Awards canceled. A celebration and a comedy show would just not be something that would be appropriate uh, for this country this weekend. One kind of production running overtime. The nation's newspapers churning out special editions. Terror in bold print. In Georgia, state lawmakers halted their session. Debate giving way to song. A verse echoed at the nation's capital. Chicago this morning they're waking up to these headlines our nation saw evil and outrage the disruption goes on here in Chicago downtown today getting around by car will be difficult parking bans are in effect especially around any kinds of government buildings at post offices here and around the country of course mail and packages have been unable to move so that will be disruption for people all across the country while everyone is encouraged to return to normal to get back to their routines certainly it's slow going Katie? All right, NBC's Kelly O'Donnell in Chicago. Kelly, thank you very much. It is coming up on 822. Now here's Matt. Katie, thank you. William Cohen is the former Secretary of Defense under President Clinton, and prior to that, he was a Republican senator from Maine who served on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Secretary Cohen, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. I, I want to talk with you professionally in a second, but first, emotionally, your reaction to the sight of that plane and the devastation it caused to the Pentagon where you worked for so many years. Well, obviously, one of uh, profound sadness, uh, rage, uh, and ultimately uh, resolution uh, that uh, we are going to respond and will respond in a very forceful manner. Uh, but I uh, worried about uh, such an event uh, during the four years that I was at the Pentagon with the proximity of uh, the Pentagon so close to that of National Airport. I worried that there might be a flight that could uh, have uh, crashed accidentally, run out of fuel, altitude and also a terrorist attack, but it's uh, virtually impossible to protect the Pentagon from such an event, given the fact that we have open skies. And so it's just, um, it was something that I worried about, and unfortunately, uh, my nightmare uh, came true when I um, saw what took place. Millions of Americans, Secretary Cohen, are work waking up this morning in a, in a state of shock, but also concerned as to whether this is over. In your opinion, knowing the way these terrorist groups tend to work, is the immediate threat over? It's not over, uh, and even if the, this particular threat, which is so massive and uh, almost unimaginable in its uh, dimensions, uh, there is more to come, and that's why I hope this will serve as a galvanizing uh, force uh, to consolidate the American spirit, much as we did after the bombing at Pearl Harbor, that the Americans knew that we were all in this together, and now the American people are all in this together with those uh, countries uh, and democratic loving countries who support us. We are all in this together because terrorism knows no geographical or continental boundaries. And um, I believe that spirit is there. We've seen evidence of it in the last uh, few days. Uh, and uh, from the Congress, uh, from the President, uh, from everybody, from world leaders. So now is the time for us to wage this war against terrorism because the terrorists are out there with trying to acquire weapons of mass destruction. And even though it was massive in its destruction yesterday, uh, they are looking to acquire chemical and biological weapons as well as nuclear. So this is not over. 
K Katie and I were talking a second ago, and this may be asking you to comment on something that's either super secret or science fiction or somewhere in the middle, but the Pentagon is supposed to be the most secure building in the nation. It's the heart of our nation's military complex. Is there no system within that building that could warn the personnel that something like this was coming? I mean the actual airplane approaching. It's virtually impossible. Uh, planes fly over uh, almost every 15 or 20 minutes, uh, virtually leaving a uh, uh, national airport. And it'd be very difficult under any circumstances uh, to uh, forewarn people inside that a plane was uh, either uh, losing altitude or being directed uh, into the Pentagon itself. We have very sophisticated, uh, certainly electronic uh, mechanisms in the Pentagon, but uh, it would be impossible to evacuate the building or to, uh, uh, to make a determination as to whether, whether a plane was uh, slightly off course because they fly directly over the Pentagon. You and I have spoken in the past about the, the fact that terrorism usually has two targets, one a physical target, the other an emotional target. What is the emotional impact of this nation's military complex, the Pentagon, being successfully struck? I think the emotional reaction is one of uh, rage, uh, one of determination, uh, one in which uh, the American people uh, now finally realize that uh, there is a war going on. It has been going on at, quote, lower levels. Now it's at a very high level, and I think you'll see the American people respond accordingly. But we have to understand this is a long-term uh, commitment that we have to make. It's not going to be over with one swift military response, but a uh, co co coordinated, comprehensive, international uh, effort to uh, really get at the, the forces that support terrorism, to allow these breeding grounds uh, to continue to, uh, to function, that supply them with, uh, with finance, with uh, moral support of, uh, and, uh, and physical support. That can no longer be allowed to take place. You mentioned military response. Obviously, military plans take time, and, and we don't have a, a, a culprit at the moment, at least a, a definite culprit, and we certainly don't have a target. But would it be safe to say that right now people in the Pentagon, military officials, are, are determining some course of military action? I think it's fair to, uh, to assume, and I would say also that there are a number of uh, contingency plans that uh, have uh, always been uh, um, in operation, so to speak, uh, or available for the national uh, command authorities. So I assume that they're refining those, they're looking at uh, what action uh, may be taken and must be taken, and uh, we'll just have to await the judgment of the president and his team uh, to make that decision. But there are plans and uh, I assume that they are being uh, scrutinized, refined, and, uh, and to make sure that uh, whatever we do, uh, it's, uh, it's appropriate, uh, that it's uh, well uh, thought out, that it's not uh, an irrational response, but a cold, calculating, uh, method methodological uh, support of, uh, of the president, uh, that uh, this needs to be done very methodically and, uh, and with ice-cold calculations so that we understand that what we're doing and that there'll be no second-guessing uh, later on saying, well, you reacted uh, with uh, an irrational response. We have to take uh, care, take pains, but also uh, show determination to, uh, to carry out this, uh, this operation. Two final questions for you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, as a former member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, how surprised are you that, that our intelligence did not pick up any advanced warning of this attack? Well, uh, we have to remember our intelligence uh, uh, services are very good. Uh, we also have been very lucky. Uh, and you cannot uh, guarantee 100 percent that you will always intercept or, or be able to uh, get uh, information uh, pertaining to these operations. But we have been successful on many occasions in the past. But we have to understand that it's very difficult, particularly we live in a, in a world in which there are leaks uh, to the media which compromise our security. There are traitors uh, who compromise our security. It becomes very difficult to develop that kind of on-the-ground uh, human intelligence which would allow us to penetrate these organizations. It's not enough to have good uh, signals intelligence and uh, technical means. You have to have people on the ground. Very difficult in uh, those organizations uh, that uh, sponsor terrorism. So we've got to do better. We will do better. But it takes time, and it also takes a level of support uh, that we not tolerate or sanction or in any way uh, give uh, any support to those who leak information uh, to the mass media, which in turn right. makes it easier for terrorists to carry out their operations. And, and finally, there's been a lot of talk recently, Secretary Cohen, about missile defense and spending billions of dollars to put some sort of missile defense system into place. And, and this morning we're reminded once again that what it really takes is perhaps just an airline ticket to wreak havoc on this nation. Does it make talks of a missile defense seem a bit unnecessary? I don't think it mean, means uh, it'll be unnecessary. Uh, I support a limited uh, system to defend against a limited type of an attack, but I've also always believed that uh, the most 
a uh, probable type of attack we'll face is one uh, of a uh, biological or a chemical or something that can be delivered other than uh, through a missile. But uh, by virtue of, of this particular incident, doesn't mean that a national missile defense system isn't needed, but it may uh, require us to scale that back and uh, focus on those that are most immediate, those kind of attacks that are most immediate. Former Secretary and Senator William Cohen. Mr. Cohen, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. 29 past the hour. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you. Former President Clinton was in Australia when Tuesday's attack on the United States occurred. Today, he said he grieves for the colossal loss of life. He also said this country needs to send a clear message to the world that Americans stand united. I think now is the time for all of us just to join together and say that uh, a lot of innocent people were killed by an evil force. And we're going to stand together against it until justice is done, accountability is had, until we can make the world a safer place for other decent people. So I, for one, am determined to do whatever I can to be supportive, and I think all Americans feel that way. The former president is expected to return soon to the United States. Richard Holbrook served as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations during the Clinton administration. Ambassador Holbrook, good morning. Thanks for joining us. I know that yesterday you expressed the need for uh, a very united worldwide condemnation of this action and so far it seems that that is happening throughout the world. More than condemnation, we need action that's supported by United Front, but in regard to support, I just got word from my business associate Frank Pearl who's in Berlin that something extraordinary is unfolding right now on the Unter der Linden in Berlin which is that a small group of Berliners started demonstrating in favor of the United States and the crowd has now grown to several thousand, according to him. And uh, so you have a large pro-America demonstration spontaneously taking place in Berlin. We mentioned that even Libya and Iran condemn these attacks, but you fear well, this I, is disingenuous. I, I think Libya and Iran condemn the attacks because they don't want to, they're trying to distance themselves from it so they don't get attacked. But uh, I, I think Germany are our real friends, and Libya and Iran are something quite different. The important thing here is what President Bush said last night, that we will make no distinction between those who committed the act and those who harbor the people who committed it. The rules of the game are beginning to change, and we're going to need to put immense diplomatic pressure on countries that have aided and abetted this sort of thing, especially some which try to play both sides of the street. Okay, so how do you do that? How do you pressure diplomatically a country like Afghanistan, if in fact Osama bin Laden is responsible, to kind of tell people where he is or to stop harboring him and his associates? Well, the case of Afghanistan is unique because of the staggering, the odious nature of the Taliban leadership itself. But let's remember that uh, Osama bin Laden has been s distributing worldwide a tape for many months in which he calls the leader of the Taliban the true spiritual leader of Islam in the world today and says that the true Islam should be in Afghanistan. Now, any uh, Islam is a great religion, and the overwhelming number of the people, including seven million Americans who follow this faith, have nothing to do with this. But for, an, in, for, for this madman to support the Taliban this way suggests very se how seriously we have a problem between the Taliban and Osama bin Laden. Okay, you still didn't answer my question, though. How do you pressure them diplomatically? Well, you know, if Colin Powell, in your very important interview a few minutes ago, couldn't answer that, and he's, in a, he's the man in a position, all I can say is that they know that they're going to have to do three or four things simultaneously on the international front while dealing with the crisis uh, in Lower Manhattan, and that is the international coalition changing of the rules so that anyone who harbors these people is complicitous. And I would add a new point, which we haven't discussed yet, and that is that I would like to see us lead an effort to brand in advance of identifying the people that the people who did this should be considered international war criminals. Now, in point of fact, that may seem like cosmetics, but once they are branded under UN resolutions, international war criminals, then any country that harbors them is in violation of international law and you can put more legitimate pressure on them. And I think we should start an immediate effort in the United Nations today to make sure that these people can get the same kind of treatment that people like Milosevic and other murderers have received. Let's talk about, though, the, the, the pragmatic issue. 
and that is actually weeding out these individuals, which I, who I understand are scattered across yeah. the globe. I mean, he has, what, thousands of associates? I don't know how many, but I do think that you're quite right that what you, what you have is on an intelligence side the need for a massive and more effective penetration effort. Now, the last administration made a major effort in this direction. There were some limited successes. There was a raid three years ago, an airstrike against a camp where Osama bin Laden was supposed to be. He had left it a few hours earlier, so he escaped. Some 30 or 40 of his associates were killed in that raid, conducted by the United States Air Force and Navy. And uh, we're going to have to do much more of that. But one, one key point, Katie, for your viewers, they must understand that this is not going to be solved with a single bullet, a single airstrike, a single cruise missile. This is going to be a sustained effort uh, that is going to take weeks, months, and perhaps more before it is under control in terms of its source, which means we're also going to have a massive upgrading of our security efforts in this country uh, while we deal with it. it. We are in for a protracted situation which is going to change our lives domestically without threatening our way of life because, as everyone has said, we are the United States, but still. Oh, and internationally, this is going to take some time. So the American public should not expect this to be solved with a single surgical airstrike that takes out one man, even if he is, as most people seem to feel, the man behind it. Ambassador Richard Holbrook. Thanks very much. We appreciate it. The reaction to, in the Middle East <clears throat> to these attacks was swift, some somber, and some were joyous. NBC's Martin Fletcher is in Tel Aviv this morning. Martin, good morning to you. Katie, good morning. Today, messages of support from most of the Middle East for America, but also fear of what will happen next. Who will America hit at? When and how hard? Urgent questions being asked by governments and media everywhere in the Middle East who hope, though, that American anger will not be turned blindly against Muslims. But first, concrete help. In Israel overnight, hundreds of people answer the call from emergency services to give blood to help the American victims. I can relate to the, to the suffering, and if I can do something to help, then I'll do, I'll do everything. The blood is being flown with Israeli emergency rescue teams. They're among the world's most experienced at digging out survivors and bodies from bombed buildings and they're ready to go to America to help. And in a nation used to mourning, flowers and candles began to form a makeshift shrine outside the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv, along with tough advice on how to deal with terrorists. I hope that America will give them the real answer. In Jerusalem, where the immediate response of some Palestinians Tuesday was to rejoice at America's suffering, today a more sober mood. It is an unfortunate thing happened to the United States. But otherwise, business as usual here. Overnight, Palestinians try to fight off Israeli tanks and armored cars that came to destroy three buildings in the West Bank town of Jenin, which Israel charges is a hotbed of suicide bombers. Ten Palestinians were killed, a dozen wounded. Israel has long called for joint international action against terrorism and felt that nobody was really listening. This morning, Israeli spokesman felt that as a result of this shocking attack on America, Washington will be forced to take the lead in a world war against terrorism. Matt? All right, Martin Fletcher in Tel Aviv this morning. Martin, thank you very much. Leaders around the world are condemning this attack on America and taking steps to ensure they're not next. NBC's Keith Miller is at the U.S. Embassy in London this morning. Keith, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. Well, indeed, we're here at the embassy where there's extraordinary security. There are uniformed police encircling the entire building. And overnight, a first flower was laid under this maple tree across the street, and it has grown and grown throughout the day. Every five minutes, people are showing up to lay a flower. There's pictures of the Twin Towers and a framed photograph. The grief, the anger, the frustration, and the sorrow that is being felt in America is being felt worldwide. In Europe, it seemed as if it was war. Possible American targets in London, Paris, and Berlin sealed off. Airports, military installations, and government offices put on the highest state of alert. A half dozen governments held emergency cabinet meetings. The world was watching and responding. Terrorists bring war. The picture showed American symbols of power, wealth, and influence crumbling. World leaders responded swiftly. This 
mass terrorism is the new evil in our world today. It is perpetrated by fanatics who are utterly indifferent to the sanctity of human life. In Germany, Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder called the attack an act of war against the civilized world. At the UN, Secretary General Kofi Annan. We are all traumatized by this terrible tragedy. This morning in the Vatican, Pope John Paul II opened his weekly audience with an unprecedented condemnation of the attack. Yesterday was indeed a dark day in our history and caused unspeakable sorrow in the hearts of all men and women. A no-fly zone in force over the city of London. Major commercial centers put on increased security. In Russia, all military aircraft are on combat alert. Russian President Vladimir Putin addressing the American people said, we are with you. Americans overseas joined others in feeling the pain inflicted thousands of miles away. Sickening. I'm just so upset. I can't think of what to say. It's awful. Someone has declared war on you, for God's sake. Tributes are being held in honor of the victims. Candlelight vigils held overnight in Germany. Flowers laid at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, Oslo, and a dozen other cities. The world has responded to the nightmare in America. Many people aware that if it can happen in America, it can happen anywhere. It may be too soon for Americans to accept the comfort of strangers, but I can assure you here, many of the people coming here are not Americans, they're British, other nationalities, laying flowers, spending a moment to, of course, sympathize with the victims, and also, I think, to show their solidarity with America during this very difficult and very troubled time. Matt? Keith, before I let you go, there were reports that aviation officials halted civilian flights over Great Britain yesterday. What's the status of that? That still stays in effect, Mac. There is, uh, in fact, a no-fly zone over the entire city of London. We're used to the sounds of airplanes, of course, coming through this city because they follow the River Thames down to Heathrow Airport, their main international airport. No flights today anywhere over the city of London. All right, Keith Miller in London this morning. Keith, thank you very much. And now here's, Aunt, here's Katie. All right, thank you very much, Matt. We're going to go once again to downtown Manhattan where our own Ann Curry is standing by to update us on the situation there, Ann. Katie, I've just run from an area that was about three buildings away from the collapsed World Trade Center buildings. And I can tell you that just a few moments ago, we saw that building, what was left of building number seven, still had, uh, what is, was still smoldering. It, 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 we were told by firefighters that there were still fires that they were putting out. Uh, we looked a short time ago and, and uh, we were told that uh, the fire may almost be out. But of course, this is a, a situation that is ever-changing, depending on, depending on the wind and the circumstances. They've got their hands so full. Uh, we also can report to you that uh, just a short time ago, uh, dogs were taken in by the New York City Police Department. These are human finding dogs. So that is another symbol of hope here, where there, there needs to be more hope, as we have hundreds of rescuers and volunteers on scene trying desperately to get through this rubble to see if there's anyone still left alive, Katie. All right. Ann Curry in downtown Manhattan. Ann, thanks very much. We'll be checking in with you throughout the morning. Appreciate it. 842. Once again, here's Matt. All right, Katie, thank you very much. Sandy Berger served as National Security Advisor in the Clinton administration. Mr. Berger, good morning to you. Good morning, uh, What's being done right now? You've been in the Situation Room when crisis situations have occurred in the past. What's happening at the White House right now? Uh, first of all, uh, everything uh, that can possibly be done to help the emergency uh, effort, the rescue effort, uh, from the federal level. Second of all, trying to uh, sift out FAC from uh, uh, misfact uh, and determine precisely uh, who was responsible. And third, uh, developing uh, a long-term strategy uh, for responding firmly and, and forcefully. You talk about sifting out what is fact and, and not fact. How much proof, what level of proof would you require, would you recommend that the president get before taking some kind of military action? I think we'll know who's responsible for this uh, in, a, in the short term. Uh, there are enough pieces here, literally and figuratively, that we will be able to put this together. After the African embassy bombings, it became quite clear in a matter of days, uh, if not weeks, uh, that bin Laden was responsible. Uh, we responded with an attack uh, 
uh, on his camps, on his facilities, and on uh, his command and control. I think this uh, will, will emerge rather quickly from the physical evidence here as well as uh, the intelligence. So it appears, and if you listen to what President Bush had to say last night, it appears there is a policy shift here away from what the reaction was to the embassy bombings, where, as you just said, we struck at Osama bin Laden's camps and facilities. And if you listen to what the president said last night, we will not distinguish between the terrorists who committed the acts and those who harbored them. What should we take away from that? Well, I think that's perfectly correct. I don't think that's a distinction we've made in the past. Bin Laden is a difficult target. Um, uh, we have to not only know where he is, we have to know where he's going to be. Uh, that requires a level of, of knowledge and penetration, which is not easy. Afghanistan is a difficult and remote place. It's a thousand miles from the nearest body of water. It's surrounded by Iran and Afghanistan, Russia, Tajikistan. These are not exactly easy staging grounds. So this is, this is not an easy set of options. But I think things have been escalated yesterday to a new level, and we're in a new phase, and we may have to consider uh, a different kind of, of risk than we have in the past. Well, what, well, you know, and I don't want you to jump to any conclusions, we certainly don't know if this was Correct. Osama bin Laden, but if indeed it proves that this was the case and the Taliban has been harboring this man for several years, what type of action, military action, would we take against Afghanistan? Well, let me say first of all, there's no economic pressure here that uh, has not already been placed on the Taliban. One has to understand that Afghanistan is a miserable, broken down, desperate place with a million starving people. It's not a target-rich environment. There are no world trade centers in Kabul. Uh, so it's not uh, uh, simply a situation in which you can strike out at uh, Afghanistan uh, and do the kind of uh, horrible damage that we did here yesterday. We may have to look at a range of military options uh, that go beyond uh, simply cruise missiles from uh, a very far distance. They are not rifles uh, in a situation like this. Uh, and the escalation that took place yesterday, both in terms of capability and in terms of malevolent intent, uh, suggests that we're in for a long-term uh, 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 effort and have to be prepared for the consequences of our actions, which uh, will have their own effects. What you mean there is that once we attack, we will be the target of attack out of retaliation. That's a possibility, plus the fact that we're operating uh, in a region of the world where bin Laden is popular, where it is not easy uh, to simply uh, 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 mount an operation of any uh, kind. Uh, but again, I think the risk calculation here has shifted yesterday. What kind of diplomatic effort is it going to take, Mr. Berger? Back during the Gulf War in the early 1990s, an alliance was put together against a, a very definable enemy. What type of alliance or coalition is going to have to be put together for us to be able to take military action in that part of the world? Well, first of all, it's not, uh, it's not simply in Afghanistan. Let's assume here, for, bin, uh, this, for this purposes, it's, uh, th this path leads to bin Laden. We don't know that for sure. Uh, there has been cooperation with intelligence services over the last uh, year. There have been a number of cells taken down in Germany and other places. That's going to have to intensify. There can be no uh, uh, tolerance of the existence of these people in, in any country. Uh, and there will have to be uh, a recognition uh, that uh, this is not just an attack on the United States, it's really an attack on uh, all of the civilized world. Former National Security Advisor Sandy Berger. Mr. Berger, thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. Once again, here's Katie. Matt, thank you. 24 hours ago, this city was attacked. While there was also death and destruction in Washington and Pennsylvania, New York is a place like no other. NBC's Jane Pauley reports. <laughs> Trade Center tumbling down. Oh, no! Oh, my God! Everyday New Yorkers had to run for their lives. How fragile the city seemed today. We deployed a team of Dateline staffers to bring us images of a city under siege on handheld digital cameras. 
what I saw today on the streets of Manhattan really were, were the extremes of New York. It, it's the best and the worst of people. I got uh, 20 blocks away when the smell and the taste really hit me. Way in the distance, the huge cloud on the horizon, but I could taste and smell something that, that was like the worst electrical fire ever imaginable. They brought us a startling glimpse of what it was like to be at ground zero of a major terrorist attack. What's it like down there? First, get away, then get home. Businesses were closed and buildings evacuated. Thousands upon thousands were left to negotiate a maze of closed streets and suspended services. There's a real sense of panic on the streets among the tens of thousands of uh, pedestrians. And it was easy to see why. Look to the horizon on the south and you see an enormous gray-black cloud from the explosion. As they moved toward safety uptown, people tried to keep up with the flurry of events any way they could. Even the wounded walked. This woman was on the 19th floor of the World Trade Center when the first explosion hit. Hurt, but lucky to get out before the building collapsed. We found her 30 blocks north, heading to Bellevue Medical Center. A huge cloud of gray. Sorry. medical students lined up like extras on the set of a disaster movie. Almost immediately after the attack, along with all three major airports, the city's subways, bridges, tunnels, and major highways were all closed. The FDR Drive, normally a winding snarl of congested traffic, empty. Thousands of commuters from New York's outer boroughs were left stranded in Manhattan. By mid-afternoon, a police officer on the scene estimated that more than 20,000 people had crossed the 59th Street Bridge on foot. Meanwhile, Grand Central Station was jammed. But the trains were running until noon. I remember standing in Grand Central and, and watching a, a man and a woman scream and, and embrace each other. And, and feel relief. I felt their relief to see each other again. After people had been managing to get out for about 15 minutes, all of a sudden they announced that they were evacuating the building um, and people were ordered to get out immediately and workers in their orange vests were running for the exit and we didn't know what was going on. We just ran with them. Confused passengers poured out of the building after a bomb threat. It hit me that I was scared. I was, I was afraid that the, the building literally could blow up underneath my feet. All around the city, it was a mass migration of hundreds of thousands of people, but uncannily quiet. Perhaps it was the unspeakable horrors many had seen. It was orderly, but it was chaotic. People were shocked. Everyone was dazed. Uh, people didn't really want to look each other in the eye. I think the fear of breaking down, the question on everybody's lips seemed to be, what is going on? Is there more of it that's going to come? This was supposed to be election day in New York. As if anyone took note, it was officially called off. Everything was. What was open was tightly locked down. What's that? Can't be doing no pictures. Okay, it's NBC News. don't you understand? It's NBC News. I don't care who it is. Security at all buildings that might be targets was extremely tight. Our own building, the famous tourist destination at Rockefeller Plaza, was evacuated, but for NBC's news operations to bring you this story. And all over Manhattan, there was this strange sort of gridlock. The uptown avenues in Manhattan have been turned into virtual parking lots as everyone tries to flee northward. Meanwhile, the downtown avenues have all been sealed off, but for emergency vehicles. 
telephone service came and went. Anxious people called their loved ones the old-fashioned way. Sometimes that didn't work either. People were forced to use pay phones, which is kind of a joke in Manhattan because it's hard to find a pay phone that works. The only thing that was easy today was getting lost in the scramble. She doesn't have a cell phone. They don't work anyway. She, she is not mobile because she's got emphysema and she can't walk very fast. David Douglas's 64-year-old mother lives in an apartment building just four blocks from the World Trade Center. Soon after the attack, she had chest pains. So he flagged a passing car and the driver headed for the nearest hospital. But I said, look, lady, please, my mom can't walk. Please, if you, please just take her north as much as you can because she can't breathe well. He tried to follow on his rollerblades but lost track of the car and spent the rest of the day searching hospitals. So I just want to know, is there any, is there any system of finding people with... Well, they're doing the best, we're doing the best we can. It's, it's pretty chaotic. He searched family reunion centers. Uh, Lucille Lovato. Uh, ABA, TO. And even public schools desperate to find his mother. Are there any people being kept here? Finally, after four hours of futile searching, he called home. There was a message on his answering machine. It's my mom. She was safe, staying with a friend in his very own apartment building. She's in my building. For two New Yorkers, a small moment of comfort in a day when so many others will find none. There are stories of hope and stories of horror. Derek Schwartz is a financial advisor for First Montauk Karoon Capital Management Company. He was on the 22nd floor of Tower Number 1 of the World Trade Center when the attack occurred. And Harry Crosby was on his way to work at Merrill Lynch at the World Financial Center just across the street. Good morning to both of you Good all. Good morning. Uh, Derek, let me start with you. Uh, you were on the 22nd floor right. of the, the first tower That's right. that was attacked. When that plane plunged into the building, leaving that gaping, enormous gaping hole. What did it feel like to you? I thought it was perhaps an earthquake because the plane, from what I understand, hit the highest part of the building. So I didn't really hear the explosion, just the shake. And it just was such a tremendous shake that being you know, a building of that scope and feel it move like it was a cloud. It was just unbelievable. And you know, one of the colleagues in my office said, it's a bomb, it's a bomb, and we tried to run out from the hall, and the whole hallway had collapsed that led to the stairwell. The ceiling had, had the ceiling fallen had collapsed, the hallway. And floor. the wall was blown out, and there were wires and water running through it. And he actually tried to run through the hall at first, and then he saw the hole in the wall and could look straight down the building and got scared and turned back. And, uh, you know, we went in an office deciding what to do to wait or to go and try and get through the hall. And the smoke started to pour in, and one guy started taping up the doors to keep the, the smoke from coming in. Finally, said we, one gentleman, Peter, I don't remember his last name, I wish I could thank him, because he was really the most courageous one who said, why don't we try and crawl through that rubble and get to the stairwell? Fortunately, we did. Thank goodness you made that decision, but yeah. crawling through the rubble was a, a painstakingly long process, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, it. In my mind, reflecting, it seemed pretty quick, but, you know, you just didn't know what was going to happen when we crawled through that hallway because the ceiling was totally collapsed. You didn't know what was, something was going to You didn't collapse. know if the floor was going to crumble mm -hmm. beneath you. Yeah, and there was wires and water, and it was just, but it was just, was so scared, you just wanted to get out. You finally got to the stairwell. Mm -hmm. What was the scene like there? Actually seemed pretty, pretty, uh, you know, calm. Was there Everybody, a steady stream of people it was, coming it was, just, it was packed. It was like being on uh, traffic on the highway. I mean, you're just step by step going. And people were yelling, move, go, hurry up. And people were yelling back, we can't. Finally, firemen started to come up as they were lugging their equipment up 80 floors. And they were saying, the building's secure. Don't worry, take your time. It's going to take a few hours. And you saw the firefighters or some people who had been hurt. Mm -hmm. when the plane crashed into the building, being carried down the stairwell, is that right? Can yeah. you tell me about what you saw? Well, basically, you know, every five or ten minutes, um, firemen would be leading someone down who had been in the serious part of the building. And it was just horrible. I mean, these people, you could just see their skin was off, and it was just... Terribly. Fun. Yeah, they were walking. They were totally in shock. They were physically able to actually walk themselves down the stairs. Nobody was carried or on a stretcher. But these were people, obviously, who were just, you know, 
really near the explosion. Some people up uh, by the cafeteria, I suppose, or something. What floor is the cafeteria on? Um, I, I can't recall. That's the right. middle, middle of the I building? I think so. I think so. When you got towards the bottom of the stairwell, it was just... Was it dark? Was it... It was filled with water? Well, we had to leave through the mall at the very bottom of the building. And once you got to that point, the water was flowing down the staircases. It was flowing over our heads like rain from, I guess, the, uh, the pipes being exploded. And then they were yelling at everyone just to move, move forward, get off your cell phones. And it wasn't until I finally got off to Church Street and I turned around and I saw that the other building had been hit while I was in the first one. I didn't even know the second tower had been hit because I looked at my watch around 9.30 and I think that's when the second one hit. I was still in the stairwell. I got out. Because you didn't get out until, what, 10 o'clock? I got out about 10 o'clock, roughly, I think. Maybe it was a little earlier. I walked across the street. People were on looking like it was a sightseeing tour. And I just decided I'm walking as far away from this as I can. And fortunately, I did because apparently 10 or 20 minutes later, that second building collapsed. My building, I don't think, collapsed until a little after that. When you saw that the second building had been hit, mm. did you realize this wasn't an earthquake? Did you did you have any conception of what had happened? When I when I well understand, I was on the cell phone a couple times when it first happened, talking to family, my wife and my brother, and they told me my brother a plane hit it. And I thought, okay, maybe it wasn't a terrorist act. But when I got out and saw both towers on fire, I knew something was up. And then I walked down the street towards Pace University to try and call my wife. And that's when the building collapsed. And then I knew, I thought it was the end of the world. I didn't know what people were yelling about because I couldn't see it collapsing. But, you know, at that point, it was just the horror of the screams and the smoke and everything coming at you. All your colleagues got out, out safely, as yeah. far as you know? No, I, I did get out with both the two gentlemen that worked in my office that were in that morning. So I know that they got out safely. I know both of you, and here I am, and I'd let you tell your story in a moment, but you both are in the, the investment banking financial world. And, and you think about the people in those office buildings. We were talking about Morgan Stanley has something like 3,500 employees mm -hmm. who work at the World Trade Center. What other kind of workers are there? I mean, just every kind of office and well, I insurance mean, companies? I mean, insurance, I mean, I w obviously, uh, you know, most of the major firms have some form of presence there. There so. are retail brokerage offices, there are insurance companies, there are uh, trading operations. Um, I think there are uh, uh, currency trading operations, commodity trading operations there for a number of different firms. So a lot of, uh, a lot of executives, a lot of professionals there. Harry, as, as Derek was making his way out of the building, you were outside the building on your way to work. I was. I was actually, um, um, I was walking, uh, walking down the West Side Highway. I was actually driving down, um, I was in a car uh, that was stopped at, at Houston, and I actually continued to proceed down. The first um, explosion, first impact had already hit, and it didn't dawn on me at the time what was occurring. Um, well, I, I was think fully it aware on that anybody really. No, it was. Um, uh, I knew it was something completely um, um, traumatic and, and intense. Uh, but continued my walk down. And my building, um, uh, Merrill Lynch, uh, is on the other side of the street. Uh, so I wanted to continue down to work. Um, when the second impact occurred. I was about 10 blocks away. Um, I felt that uh, clearly there was some kind of a terrorist act or something, but I, I wanted to get I wanted to get to our work and get to our group. Um, and frankly, I was concerned about a lot of the individuals there. As I got close to our building, I saw an incredible amount of people streaming out the other way. And clearly, I knew that it was out of uh, both towers. Out of both towers, uh, but also from from across the street. I uh, saw a lot of familiar faces from work. Were people um, panicked or were they pretty... Um, they were relatively calm. I think some of them were informed. They had seen the news based on, I think, the first impact. Um, and uh, by the time I'd gotten there, a lot of people were informed. Uh, the one thing that I found curious, and, um, and I, was, uh, I was in the same, uh, the same position, no one really questioned the integrity of the strength of the buildings. Um, a lot of the people, the police did a terrific job of moving um, of moving people aside to get EMS and paramedics in, but no one really questioned that the buildings would fall at all. And uh, I think a lot of people were caught, uh, people that were milling around. And, for example, all those firefighters who were inside trying to rescue people uh, might have been caught when the building collapsed, of course, because many of them were unaccounted for in emergency personnel. Harry, I know you saw something that I think uh, you will never forget, and I'm sure it's, these are images you are trying to get out of your mind, and that is when you approach the scene, and I'm going to show folks at home this photograph 
from the New York Times. Uh, when you were outside the building, um, if we can go back to the studio, um, this is, is quite a photograph in the New York Times today. Uh, this is a man falling headfirst, presumably to his death, after jumping from a window of the World Trade Center. And you actually saw scores, I mean, scores of people doing this. No, I think uh, uh, a lot of people, it's difficult to turn away from. Um, it, there, were, uh, there was an enormous uh, um, wall of flame uh, beneath the area of impact on the first tower, the northmost tower. Uh, the flame was creeping up, um, and I, uh, I assume people were caught, uh, unable to proceed down uh, through that area, and uh, kept climbing up and up to, to, get away from, uh, to get away from the heat. And I can only assume the intense heat and smoke inhalation forced these people to do things they would never do. And people were jumping in, in pairs. Um, people were, um, uh, were jumping in, in streams. Um, they were holding hands in, in twos and threes. They were, uh, they were, they were large groups. It was, it was difficult to describe, difficult to describe. Um, but intense and all fell to their death. A lot of, a lot of pain and a lot of anguish. And uh, luckily at the time I proceeded north and just missed uh, the first building that collapsed. And I was probably about five or six blocks out of harm's way. And I know I that a firefighter, I heard, again, you know, you hear all sorts of stories, but there was a report that a firefighter was actually killed when someone fell on top of him after plunging, you know, many, many floors. I think it's incredible what the fire department and the paramedics have done, but they, they were very aggressive in getting to the site. Um, and again, I don't think anybody questioned that the building would ever fall. Uh, news crews were, were down, down there, and there may have been a few news crews caught as well. Uh, no one seemed to want to move. Um, but it was very, very tragic. Very, very tragic. Well, Harry Crosby and Derek Schwartz, again, you know, we're, we're glad that you are safe. I'm sure your family is extremely relieved. And of course, our prayers go out to all those people who have not heard from their loved ones yet and who have no idea where they may be or if in fact they're still alive. So well, we need to remember them. Thank you. Thank all right, you. Thank Derek, thanks again. Thanks. It is six minutes after the hour now. Here's Matt. Katie, of course, emergency workers are still hard at work in lower Manhattan. Tony Suarez and Phil Aguilgarans are EMS workers who were at the scene. Gentlemen, good morning to you. Good morning. How long did you both spend at the scene? And Tony, let me start with you. How long were you there? It was approximately about 20 minutes or so. We got in. Firefighters brought a lady to us that was covered in smut. And uh, we heard an explosion, turned around, commandeered an ambulance, and... Uh, we left the scene very quickly. It became very dangerous and unstable. How many people did you see injured mulling about or milling about that area? Numerous. I'd say in our vicinity there must have been about 10 people. Firefighters, uh, pedestrians, a couple of police officers. Phil, where were you when the second impact occurred or, or where were you when the buildings came down? Uh, initially I was in Brooklyn when I saw the first plane hit uh, with my partner Ellen and uh, that's when we responded. We responded, we were headed over to the west side right in front of the building when the second plane hit, and that's when we had to move and get out of, get out of the scene immediately. Everything just started falling down on top of us. And when we pulled over to, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it was Liberty Street, that's when people started coming towards us. And that's when we saw uh, a female that was just completely burned from head to toe. It was a horrible sight, and uh, I think if it wasn't for her that we had to take over to Cornell immediately, uh, we wouldn't be here. Because you would have been in the immediate area when... Oh, we were in the immediate area, yeah. When that building came down. Were, were you yeah. seeing a lot of people in shock, Phil? Oh, the people were just stunned. It was what, uh, they, were, they had no idea what was going on. They were walking, like, just aimlessly, you know, looking for whatever they were looking something, aid, or just trying to get out of there. Tony, based on what you've seen of the, of the devastation and the wreckage, uh, how hard is it to imagine that we're going to find many survivors in that wreckage? I mean, we hope for the best, but uh, unfortunately, just seeing it after the aftermath, um, in my opinion, hopefully we'll get people out, but it's, there's only rubbles left at this time. Uh, we pray that, you know, we'll be able to pull out more uh, civilians, firefighters, EMS. Go ahead, Phil. I thought you were going to say something. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm just hoping that there's some type of 
what the structural pockets left that maybe we could find, you know, they could find people in. I mean, it's a very delicate situation that you, you can't just go in there. I mean, these guys are in there right now. I mean, they're, they're just, uh, they're trained professionals and they have to take it time, you know, little by little because uh, it's a very, very unstable place. So I'm, we're just hoping that they could find someone. As are we. Tony and Phil, thanks very much for your time. You're welcome. Sure. As many as 800 people may be dead after American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon on Tuesday. NBC's Jim Mikoshevsky is there this morning with the latest. Jim, what's going on? Well, Matt, uh, the news here still remains grim. Uh, rescue workers say that uh, there were no signs of life from beneath the tons of rubble there in the Pentagon where you see where that uh, terrorist uh, aircraft flew into the Pentagon almost 24 hours ago now. Now, uh, rescue workers think that there could actually be some people alive in pockets there underneath the rubble, but there's absolutely no way to get at them yet, primarily because some of the fires continue to burn and the damaged area is structurally unsafe. Those cranes you see there have been used to put engineers up above to survey the damage. Uh, they've, they've also put in microphones, a series of listening devices, cameras on long poles in an effort to, to find any possible victims trapped inside. But again, no signs of life. And now the primary mission appears to be to recover the dead. Rescue workers using cadaver dogs worked through the night on the grisly task of searching for the dead. Local fire officials estimate as many as 800 were killed, many still buried in the debris. The Pentagon, the center of America's military power, devastated by a sneak terrorist attack. American Airlines Flight 77 hijacked shortly after takeoff from Dulles Airport, with terrorists at the controls traveling at 600 miles per hour with 6,000 gallons of fuel. The jet slams into the two lower floors of the Pentagon. It kind of disappeared over this embankment here for a moment and then huge explosion, flames flying into the air and, and uh, just chaos on the road. I hate to say it, but I did fall apart when it first happened. I was very frightened. Um, this doesn't happen in America. I guess it does. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was at work at his desk. I felt the, the shock of the uh, airplane hitting the building. Uh, went through the building and then out into the area and they were bringing uh, bodies out that had been injured. The plane slices deep into the Pentagon, cutting through offices primarily occupied by the Navy and Marines. The upper floors later collapse. The question now, how will the U.S. military respond? Worldwide, American military forces are put at the highest state of alert, ThreatCon Delta. And even as part of the Pentagon burn, military planners continue to review the options. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Hugh Shelton, with a pledge to retaliate against those responsible. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next. But make no mistake about it, your armed forces are ready. The Pentagon has long had a number of contingency plans to attack a variety of Osama bin Laden targets. Those plans are now under serious review. The aircraft carrier Enterprise, headed home from the Persian Gulf, ordered to remain in the area in case President Bush orders military strikes. Now, before rescue workers can actually enter the most devastated part of this area, uh, engineers are actually going to have to knock down the unstable portions of the building to make it safe for those rescue workers. And, and local firefighting officials say it could be as long as a week before we know exactly how many people died here, Matt. But again, Mick, the latest figures you're hearing, it could be up to 800 people. 800 people, civilians and military alike, remain unaccounted for this morning. Jim Mikloshevsky at the Pentagon. Mick, thanks very much. Here's Katie. Matt, that number is staggering. Meanwhile, all four of Tuesday's hijacked flights were headed to California. NBC's George Lewis is, is at LAX, where three of those four planes were headed. George, good morning. Good morning, Katie. LAX remains closed at this hour. The relatives of those aboard the hijacked planes have been taken to two nearby hotels by the two airlines involved, American and United. They're, they're meeting with grief counselors there. Uh, no, no word yet on when the airport may reopen. But as you said, because all the flights were bound to California, the events back east have had an enormous impact here. Shocked and grieving, the relatives of the airline passengers were quickly escorted to a private area at L.A. International and later to two nearby hotels. 
Among the passengers bound for Los Angeles, David Angel, the producer of the TV series Frasier, and lawyer and TV commentator Barbara Olson, wife of U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson. Before her plane crashed into the Pentagon, Olson reportedly called her husband twice on a mobile phone to tell him the jetliner was being hijacked by men with knives that the crew and all the passengers were being forced to the back of the aircraft. On United Airlines 93, the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, Tom Burnett, vice president of a medical devices company in Northern California, called his wife and indicated he and other passengers were trying to overcome the hijackers. Father Frank Colachico, a friend of the family. Yeah, he called on the cell phone and said, told her that one of the passengers was already dead and that they knew that they were all going to die and that um, two other men and he were going to try to do something the conversation and love you honey and that was the end of the conversation on the same plane Mark Bingham called his mother and his aunt he just said I want to let you all know that I love you very very much in case I don't see you again he said that plane has been taken over by hijackers and um and then i said well we love you very much too mark let me go get your mother i hope it was quick i hope he took an active part in thwarting the hijackers last night in los angeles friends of two other hijacking victims attended a special church service turning to their faith to ease the pain of the loss now, here at LAX, there are 178 planes on the ground behind me, all stranded when the airport was shut down, as well as the rest of the air travel system in this country. And, <clears throat> pardon me, even if the air traffic system gets back up to speed today, it's going to be a long time sorting out all of those planes, many of them not in cities where they're supposed to be. So air travel is going to be a nightmare for the next few days anyway, Katie. That's right, George, because a lot of the planes that were en route were diverted to other airports. So many people who were not affected by this but were flying to Los Angeles are in other cities this morning. Right. People are in, in other cities, and the planes that should be in other cities to take care of passengers' needs there are sitting on the ground here. So it's going to be a, a big jumble. It's going to take a while to untangle. All right, George Lewis in Los Angeles. George, thank you very much. Apparently, that is not the case at Chicago O'Hare's airport. Kelly O'Donnell joins us with the latest. Kelly, we had understood that all planes would be grounded until at least noon today. That according to the FAA yesterday. But I understand a plane has taken off from, from O'Hare? Much to our surprise, when we heard a jet taking off here, we're right in the flight pattern outside O'Hare. And because of the grounding across the country, of course, we didn't miss it. We looked at it as United Airlines uh, aircraft. We believe it's a 757. In talking to United officials here, they are headquartered in Chicago. They tell us that two of their aircraft have taken off in order to reposition. As you and George Lewis have been discussing, because planes were grounded yesterday, landing in airports, not their cities of origin or destination, the fleet for all airlines is out of position. So United, giving its first indication that air travel may begin to resume today, is moving some of its aircraft. We've asked officials to tell us how many. They will say at this point, at least two. They wouldn't tell us if crews are on board, but presumably they may be moving flight attendants and other pilots and so forth mm -hmm. to get to other airports so that they can begin to assess how to go about picking up the schedule. So here at O'Hare, there has been some movement. Again, two aircraft have taken off, both of them belonging to United. And Kelly, per Kelly, presumably, they had to get some kind of special permission from the FAA in order to do this. I would assume so, and because the uh, air traffic has been quiet, except for military aircraft since the FAA ordered it yesterday, I would presume that there's some coordination going on. We've been making calls trying to find out about that, and officials are just reluctant to tell us at this point, or perhaps simply too busy, trying to get it organized. But the first signs that travel may resume are at least beginning here at O'Hare. All Katie? right. Kelly O'Donnell in Chicago at Chicago, Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Kelly, thank you very much. It is 18 past the hour. Now here's Matt. Katie, thanks. Clifton Cloud lives in downtown Manhattan. He was at the World Trade Center when it was attacked on Tuesday morning along with his video camera. Clifton, good morning. Nice to have you here. Good morning. Uh, you were preparing, I know, for a happy occasion. Correct. Your son was starting preschool? Yeah, it was, well, it was his first day of like pre-kindergarten. Pre so I had my video camera all 
ready to go to film them in the morning. And um, I actually left the house without it to go park my car on the roof of this garage. And as I backed into the space, I looked up and I saw this hole in the World Trade Center building. And I, I couldn't believe it. I thought, you know, this can't be happening. This is you know, a special effect. It's a movie. And uh, so I ran home to get my video camera, um, just a couple blocks away, came back and started filming. And I was just watching the building, capturing it and thinking about, wow, this is an amazing, you know, situation. And all of a sudden the plane hit the uh, second building. And uh, I didn't even realize that I'd captured the plane hitting it because I was just in shock. I was, you know, this couldn't be happening to, to New York, to, oh my God. you know, to our icon. Oh and, my God. Uh, it was shocking. It was I can hear you saying, oh my God, oh my God. After the second plane struck the second of the two towers, what did you do next? Um, I, I had called my wife immediately to let her know where I was. Um, she had taken my son down to school. And then I called my office because my uh, company, Ace, we handle a lot of clients in, in the building. And right where the plane hit, as a matter of fact, Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter, we do a lot of work. I've been in that building. I've been in the ceilings of that building. We know people there. And I was just, yeah, all of a sudden I realized these people that I know, that, that we work with, um, you know, hope to God they made it out because um, they're wonderful people and they're they're New Yorkers. They're they're hardworking, good people. I, I know you were like so many Americans and New Yorkers as we're watching the second tower collapse right there on your home video. Yeah. Who back in '93, after the attack on the World Trade Center, probably took some pride in the fact that the buildings remained standing. Yeah. That it was some sort of symbol. Oh right. To try and explain what went through your gut and your heart as you watched those two symbols crashing to the ground? I thought of, I really thought of the people that, that I work with that, that some that actually had appointments there that morning. Uh, I, and I thought of, you know, what is it going to be like to look up and see the damage on the building in the weeks to come? And when it collapsed, I, I was saying, oh no, oh no, because it just, this, this couldn't be happening to us. Um, but I have to say, uh, this morning I rode my bike up um, from downtown and the streets are empty and everything is quiet and there were so many memories as I rode by, you know, different intersections and I thought every corner of New York City has a million memories and when my wife called me to tell me she was pregnant I was in the lobby of the World Trade Center building and as I was thinking about all these memories I was, you know, New Yorkers, you don't live in New York and don't get a beating once in a while, you know, it's a tough town but we're tough people and nothing is going to stop New York from rebuilding and Look out. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'm curious, you're going to have this tape, I'm sure, forever. Yeah. Your son is two and a half years old? Yeah. How, at what time do you think it would be, what, when are you going to show him this tape and try to explain to him what his dad saw that morning? Well, um, I don't know when. <laughs> probably or when. Or how? Uh, you know what, probably after they open the new building and say, Jack, you were, you were in school when this happened, but we rebuilt and we... We're back. We're here. And I know it's going to happen because I, I love New York. Everyone loves New York. We're here. Clifton Cloud, this is amazing footage. We thank you for sharing your thank story you. with us. Thank you. Here's Katie. Incidentally, thank you very much, Matt. About 10 minutes from now, actually about 8 minutes from now, President Bush will be meeting with his national security team, obviously, to discuss this and options. And he will make a statement a little bit later at 1045 Eastern Time. Of course, we'll continue to cover that. Meanwhile, few people understand terrorism and the mindset of Osama bin Laden, as well as General Norman Schwarzkopf, who was Commander-in-Chief of the United States Forces Central Command during the Gulf War in 1991. General Schwarzkopf, good morning to you. Hi, Katie. Well, is there any doubt in your mind, General Schwarzkopf, that Osama bin Laden was behind this? Uh, yeah, I think there is, Katie. Uh, there's an awful lot of terrorist groups out there, and it could be any one of them. I uh, bin Laden certainly has the capability to do it and, and would be at the very, very top of the list of suspects, but I, there's a bunch of other organizations beneath his that are also on the list that can't be ignored. At the same time, General Schwarzkopf, isn't it true that this really is Osama bin Laden's modus operandi, if you, it, so to speak? I mean, that he is known for masterminding very coordinated, well-thought-out, sophisticated efforts. General Schwarzkopf, can you hear me? 
I just lost you for a minute. Katie. Uh, let me just let me let me just repeat the question. Aren't many intelligence and, and officials uh, thinking that Osama bin Laden was responsible because this seems to be his MO, his modus operandi in terms of coordinating very sophisticated, well thought out uh, terrorist attacks? Exactly. Uh, his, his modus operandi is number one to provide the funding that's necessary to do this. Number two to use you, to, as he did in, in Africa against our embassies there. He uses local people that uh, he can finance, uh, support, give them the supplies and that sort of thing, and then they ultimately carry out the attack. That's exactly his modus operandi, but it's not his alone. There are others that could do the same thing. All right, so we've heard a lot from U.S. officials who are understandably, if you've been there when you were, uh, you know, in charge at, at, during the Gulf War, they're very cautious and measured, but they have talked about possible U.S. military options. General Schwarzkopf, what do they include? Well, th anything from, from uh, obviously the, you know, standoff attacks that we could make against targets all the way up into actual, uh, you know, use of ground forces if, if the targets presented themselves that way and if that's the decision of the, of the President of the United States. There's a vast array of alternatives. Uh, you know, the, the toughest part, Katie, of dealing with terrorists is, number one, you've got to find out where they are. Right. And that, that, that's the major challenge. Until you know where they are, uh, you don't have a target to hit, and, and certainly we can't just go ahead and, and indiscriminately bomb huge areas without having any idea what it is we're going after. Uh, there's, I'm sure that there's a, an array of alternatives uh, that are available that have been developed long since by the, by the Joint Chiefs, uh, and, and now it's a question of, of selectivity. Where, what, what enemy are we going after, where are they located, and then what's the most effective means? And there may be many effective means that could be utilized against them. Uh, then it's a question of which one you're going to utilize. So in other words, it could be a multi-faceted multi approach with a lot of different resources being brought to bear. You mentioned actually finding these individuals, bin Laden perhaps, or some other terrorist leader and, and his associates. And, and we cannot really uh, emphasize enough how difficult that is. Well, it's, an, it's, it's worse than the needle in the haystack. It, it, but as I said, there are several groups out there, any one of which could be responsible for it. Uh, they've got support bases. That's one of the, one of the most valuable uh, uh, targets to go after because these things don't happen without support. You know, somebody got them to the airport, somebody uh, fed them their breakfast, or the, the dinner the night before, provided shelter over their heads right here in our own country. Uh, so obviously there is a group of people here that were a support base for, for this organization and then it goes all the way back to the home organization wherever it might be and who's supplying uh, whatever they were supplied. So, mm -hmm. so it, it's a very, very, very difficult, tedious process and, and we shouldn't jump to conclusions. You know, I, I hate to say it, but remember when Oklahoma City first happened, everybody said, well, this was Islamic terrorists that did it and it turned out it was a home, home cooked operation. So I, I think that we have to be cautious and, and really let the people who know the business well do what they do well and they'll find out who's responsible. Although, General Schwarzkopf, we should point out that uh, those five Arab individuals who were tracked down at Logan Airport in Boston, um, two with passports from the United Arab Emirates, I mean, there are some indications that these might in fact be individuals who are not within our borders who do not live in the United States. And again, we shouldn't jump to conclusions about that. You know, I talked to Sandy Berger, the former National Security Advisor during the Clinton administration, as he left the studio this morning, because we need to think ahead, too, because if we engage militarily with whomever or against whomever, the United States also has to prepare for some kind of retaliation. And, and what kind of uh, weapons, for example, of mass destruction do some of these individuals, whether it's Osama bin Laden or someone else, have access to? Well, I'd like to hope that they don't. Um, weapons of mass destruction are, are there are many different kinds. If you're talking about nuclear weapons that somebody may have gotten out of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, that's a possibility, but very, very, very slim. It's one thing to have a missile like that. It's another thing to be able to utilize it. Uh, but there's a lot of other alternatives that they could come up with. And, and I think our, 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 our military people and our national security people are well aware of the options and, and I think are capable, capable of doing something about that. General Norman Schwarzkopf, Schwarzkopf General Schwarzkopf, uh, 
Thanks very much. It's, it's great to see you again, but it, again, under the worst circumstances possible. I, I'm sure, like so many Americans, you woke up this morning still incredulous that this had actually happened. Yeah, Katie, I, it's, a, it's a combination of deep sorrow, but also deep rage, and you can't help but feel that inside, uh, you know, a sense of frustration that we've got to do something about this. Let me give you a thought, though, that, that I think is very important. A lot of people have criticized what we did in Iraq in, in, the, in Desert Storm, uh, but, but the truth of the matter is we went to extraordinary limits to try and avoid any civilian casualties, to try and avoid, even, even at the risk of, a greater risk to our own pilots. Uh, and, but you look at these bastards and what they did uh, yesterday, they deliberately went after civilians and innocent people, and that's what makes the difference between us and them. General Norman Schwarzkopf, General Schwarzkopf, thank you very much. It is 29 minutes after the hour. Now, here's Matt. All right, Katie. Just moments ago, Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peres spoke with WNBC's Gabe Pressman. We want to show you now what he had to say. Do you see this as a, right. as a cataclysm of biblical proportions, what happened here in New York? Yes, I think from time to time, history put us at test to see how can, how can we handle uninvited catastrophes, unbelievable agonies, and remain what we should be, a people that believes in the basics of our existence, namely the foundation of values of the gospel. You're optimistic that out of this carnage, out of these thousands of people who have perished, some good may yet come? It's more than optimistic. I believe America can handle this situation as well, this nature of the confrontation. America is a great country, and once America will decide to get itself organized, and there is nobody else in the world that can replace the United States of America, and may I say with my full heart, God bless America, America can really organize the necessary camp on the global dimension to handle terror, no, not when it arrives to the city or to the airport, but at the moment when the terrorists are leaving their first location to intercept them because they will be, before they will become a horror. And I'm sure the United States is determined and strong, intellectually convinced, administratively organized, and that will be the result of this terrible a catastrophe. Israel through the Mossad and other agencies is very sensitive to intelligence involving terrorists. Do you have any information, direct or yes. indirect, as to whether it was bin Laden or who it was that organized this attack? We have a general idea who bin Laden is and we got general warnings. We didn't have a specific one and any piece of information that we shall have will clearly be transformed, trans transferred to your agencies. But uh, you can't tell us whether or not such information was passed at some point in the last couple of weeks. We didn't have any specific warning. And the other warnings that we have had were passed over. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Perez, do you have any last word to the people of New York and this area? Be strong and be great, like New York always has been and always will remain so. God and bless you. You're a poet, I know, sometimes. You have, have tried your hand at poetry. Is there a poetic? Well, there are What's that? Well, there are, times when the, there are times when the heart speaks, not only the mind. Not words. And I try to express, yes, I try to express a little bit of our feelings. We appreciate very much your uh, coming aboard uh, this morning here in New York. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister. Thank you. That was Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peres talking to WNBC-TV's Gabe Pressman. Rescue efforts have been going on for about 24 hours now. Some reports are that 300 firefighters may have perished. One firefighter who was at the scene was Parrish Kelly, 
Mr. Kelly, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Matt. Uh, I, I want you to try to explain to me and describe the scene after the second plane hit World Trade Center Tower Number 2 and, and describe for me how many firefighters would have been on the scene, where they would have been in that plaza and in that building. I, I can't answer that, Matt. I was actually in Massachusetts working at the time when I saw the second plane hit. Um, I decided to get my, my vehicle and head to New York after the second tower collapsed um, because I just knew that there were many, many rescue personnel on the ground um, and I just felt compelled to get my vehicle and come down here and do whatever I could. Um, I, when you get to the scene, uh, the devastation of the emergency personnel, it, it, you, you come across maybe uh, 20 uh, fire pieces of fire apparatus that are completely burned out. It's nothing more than the shell. Um, cruisers, um, uh, police cruisers are just stacked on top of each other. Um, they're just burnt out pieces of shells. Uh, something down there happened that was just very, very devastating. You say you drove down from Massachusetts. We all remember a short while ago in Worcester, Massachusetts, that fire that claimed the lives of so many firefighters. But when you hear that, that up to 300 firefighters may be missing, unaccounted for, and may have perished in this disaster, what goes through your mind? I, I, just, I just heard that for the first time. I knew there were many, but I, I didn't hear any figures. We lost six up in Worcester, and uh, New York sent an entourage up. They were very supportive, so that's why I felt compelled to come down this way. I cannot even imagine uh, how many emergency personnel. You're talking about firefighters. There were police officers, uh, EMS. There might have been uh, nurses and doctors that came to the scene. Um, I can't even imagine how many uh, rescuers that... Uh, that perished in this. I, I can't even can't even fathom. We have to remember that after uh, after both planes struck those towers, there was a lot of fire in the buildings, and people sometimes forget that firefighters don't do their jobs in a building like that from the ground or from trucks or something like that. They've got to get inside those buildings to try and put those fires out. That is correct. From what I understand, uh, the two gentlemen that we pulled out from the rubble, one last night and one this morning. Uh, from what I understand, they were both inside the building uh, attempting rescue operations. And from what I understand, and I, this isn't confirmed, but it came from another Port Authority employee, that they actually rode the building down. Um, so they were in the structure when it, when it collapsed. Some of the firefighters and police officers have been working, as I mentioned, for about 24 hours now, Mr. Kelly. And, and while they are obviously exhausted, we've been hearing reports that they don't want to leave the scene because so many of their brothers and sisters are still in that rubble. That's something you hear a lot when that you is, talk to firefighters. That is correct. I was on the line with about 200 other emergency personnel um, with the concentrated effort of the two rescue attempts, um, the one last evening, and then we, we switched uh, our approach to get into a better angle, and then we, uh, we obviously pulled out the second survivor this morning. Um, we did not want to leave. They, they physically came in and, and took the equipment out of our hand and had us come off the line. We, we've been out there for um, no less than 12 hours, and they, they asked us to come off the line. Um, and they, they're sending in some uh, reinforcements now. All right, Parrish Kelly. Mr. Kelly, thanks very much. Our best luck to you during the day ahead. Yeah, my, my thoughts and prayers go out to the families. Uh, this is just incredible, and, and until you get down to the scene, I. I see the helicopter, there's still a lot of heavy fire and smoke down there um, until these shots get back to the nation. I don't think anybody can fathom what we just saw down there. We thank you for your time, Mr. Kelly. Appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. Here's Katie. Okay, Matt, thanks very much. Larry Johnson is the former deputy director of the State Department Office of Counterterrorism. Mr. Johnson, good morning. Morning, Katie. You know, we spoke about 24 hours ago after right. this happened. We did not, you emphasized not jumping to the conclusion that this was some terrorist act. Obviously, this morning, you believe that's the appropriate conclusion to draw. Yes, absolutely. I've, I, I've spoken with some people in the government, and they've indicated that there was, in fact, some advanced intelligence. It, it was general, but it was pointing to the fact that Osama bin Laden was training and was putting personnel through training in aviation um, and, and so clearly you didn't have to train people in this to take uh, you know how to take off and land a plane just to maintain airspeed and mm -hmm. to be able to steer the plane and un unfortunately uh, it looks like that's that's the case you don't have any other group in the world that's uh, connected with doing something like that 
So you're you know, pretty convinced, Larry, that this that that Osama bin Laden's fingerprints are all over this? Yeah, I, and again, it's not. I'm not a reflexive. Let's hate Osama bin Laden, and he's the villain of the moment. But when you look at the incidents that have occurred over the last 10 years, and you look at the people that are killing Americans and calling for the death of Americans, Osama accounts for about 80 percent of that activity, and. Uh, he has been the only one willing to take these kinds of casualties to kill innocents. Uh, the, the other folks are fairly, you know, they don't, guerrillas in Colombia and in Turkey and even Hezbollah and Hamas have not gone out and aggressively attacked Americans. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's uh, the, the past behavior coupled with the recent threats. Well, it leaves no other conclusion. Let me go back to something you said just a, a moment ago. You talked about advanced intelligence. Right. Can you be more specific about any kind of communiques or, or messages that were somehow intercepted that perhaps in hindsight should have been taken more seriously? Well, yeah, that's the problem with this because unfortunately the way the intelligence uh, usually gets on people's desks it's, it, it would be one thing if it said we're going to attack four aircraft originating in these airports at this time on this date, then of course the United States could take action. Un unfortunately, what I have seen over the last 20 years is you get fragments that only after the fact do you say, oh, that's what it meant. And I, I'm afraid, unfortunately, that's what we're going to find in this case, that there was not... Um, the, the, the tidbits that were available were not sufficient to take action on. Well, is that the way it is? I mean, do we have to just live with that, or can we somehow beef up U.S. intelligence so these can be interpreted more accurately or taken more seriously? Well, Jerry Bremer, Ambassador Bremer, made a point earlier on your show, and he's exactly right. I mean, I've, I've got several friends who are in the intelligence community who have been in places where these terrorist acts have occurred, and what they've told me is basically they can no longer go into the sewer to find the rats. We're, we're staying out of the sewers, we don't want to get ourselves dirty, we want to be very antiseptic and clean on this, and consequently, because we are so risk averse, because we're so afraid of getting uh, sullied with someone who is an unsavory character, we are not in a position to collect this. The world has changed since the Cold War. It was one, you know, 20 years ago you could go to cocktail parties, try to recruit Soviet agents there. But the, these people that are attacking us, recognizing they are a small group, they are religious fanatics, and they're not hanging out at cocktail parties and diplomatic functions. So how do you infiltrate these cells? I mean, how do you use, you know, modern-day spies to figure out what these people are up to? Okay, one, one thing you have to do, and again, we've got to be willing to have the stomach to do this. We've got to be willing to put people in place for long-term positions, to have them penetrate religious organizations, sometimes having to portray themselves as members of the media. Right now, you, if you're an intelligence operative, you can't be a member of the media. You can never go out and represent yourself as such. And you can't go out and represent yourself as a, as a member of the clergy. Now, you know, it, it's nice to talk in theory that, oh boy, we want to penetrate this, but when we get down to uh, where the hard decisions have to be made, we shy away. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at 20,000, possibly 20,000 bodies lying there, you know, at some point, uh, I, I think this is like Pearl Harbor. It will have the same effect on us. Before World War II started, we still had horse cavalry. You couldn't get rid of the old vestiges that no longer were relevant. And unfortunately, we have the equivalent in the intelligence community today of the horse cavalry. And maybe this incident will provoke us to be able to make the changes that need to be made. All right. Larry Johnson. Mr. Johnson, thanks for talking with us this morning. Thank you, Katie. The financial market should have opened moments ago here in New York, but today is not a normal day, of course. CNBC's Ron Insana covers the markets and was at the World Trade Center when one of the towers collapsed. Hey, Ron, how you doing this okay, morning? Katie. When will the markets reopen? It appears that tomorrow is a likely day for the New York Stock Exchange to reopen. The chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Harvey Pitt, has said publicly he believes uh, there's a reasonable chance the markets will open tomorrow. I talked to a staffer at the SEC just a few minutes ago. He, too, shares that belief and said that while no formal announcement has yet been made and no formal decision has been made, it is likely we could see something later in the day to ha that effect. Has Wall Street pretty much been shut down today in terms of everybody who works down there with investment banks, et cetera? Well, everything below Canal Street, which is at the southern tip of, of Manhattan and just north of the World Trade Center area, is inoperative. Uh, so, yes, the New York Stock Exchange is shut. I've even tried to make calls there earlier this morning, and no one is yet picking up the phone. So the building is not occupied. Um, 
foreign markets have shown actually a fair degree of resilience this morning after the Asian markets were beaten up overnight last night in response to this. In Europe today, the markets are far calmer. We see very flat activity. Mm -hmm. All the exchanges of Europe have uh, stopped for a moment or two of silence to uh, express their sympathies for the victims here in the United States. But a far calmer day in Europe today than it was yesterday. I understand the gold market's up. The gold market was up yesterday rather decidedly, so was the oil markets. Uh, those markets, which investors often flee to during times of crisis, are backing off a little bit this morning. We are not seeing the same type of kind of panic or, or rush to get into hard assets as we did yesterday throughout the day. What is the impact of all this on the economy? I mean, you really even hate to bring that up given the enormous human toll and the people who are suffering so much right now. But but the market closing, all these businesses yeah. shut down, what is the impact? Well, I mean, clearly the collateral damage is less significant than the human toll. But as we were discussing yesterday, this attack was aimed at maximizing not just the loss of life or the political impact, but the economic impact as well. Shutting down Wall Street is, is a large event be because one-third of the nation's financial transactions are routed through New York. You have a whole host of firms that are... No, no longer have a presence in the World Trade Center. Everybody from Morgan Stanley, which had 3,500 employees, as you noted, uh, has several trading floors, to Cantor Fitzgerald. Lehman Brothers had two floors that were operational Merrill there. Merrill Lynch had some offices there, didn't they? The retail side, yes, I think? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and those exist no longer. So effectively shutting down a nerve center in the financial community I is a large-scale event. Additionally, economists are debating now whether this level of uncertainty about our own security, uh, about the way New Yorkers will behave in their own city, the way people will behave in terms of air travel, that could have a rather noticeable impact on the economy at a time when consumer confidence was already fragile. So this, this could have enormous psychological ramifications which could translate in, into an economic uh, result. A absolutely, but by the same token, um, economists always look at this from two entirely different perspectives. There are uh, those negatives that we just discussed. The positives include the fact that every central bank in the world right now are suggesting they will f provide ample funds for their economies and their markets to function efficiently. There will be rebuilding efforts, obviously, in New York. Congress may spend more money to, to blunt the impact of this event as well. So it's hard to assess whether or not it will be a catastrophe economically. Plus, we've witnessed, I mean, if you talk about psychology, yeah. an incredible surge of patriotism. Yeah. And this has been an enormously unifying event with so many Americans rallying around the president, rallying around each other, feeling, you know, really a, 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 as a whole in a way that they haven't felt probably in a long time. And wartime economies, if that's what we're going into, and some economists you know, speculate that we will see an increase in defense spending, we will see uh, sorts of activities from the federal government that require a great deal of spending that could have a positive economic impact down the road. Wartime economies tend to be reasonably strong. Robust. And, and you know, for the wrong reasons, unfortunately, but it, it's the truth about those environments. And, and, and so far, we, you know, we don't know exactly how this will cut, how this will play out, uh, but there's a list of negatives and there is a list of unfortunate positives that go along with events like this. Meanwhile, uh, we should mention that you were in the area. Tell us again, for people who might not have watched yesterday, your personal situation. Well, um, an MSNBC cameraman whom I met on the street, uh, I believe on Broadway, uh, relatively close uh, to the, the World Trade Center, and I were trying to get from the east side of the Trade Center area to the west side where we knew our colleagues were stationed to, to join the coverage there. And, and as we moved, I believe we're about a block south of the Trade Center, as we moved towards the building, we saw the top of the South Tower begin to blow out, and we turned and ran. This is right before it collapsed. This is right before it collapsed. And, and as we turned away, he ran straight down one street. I made a, a right. And, and you saw, as you did in the movie Independence Day, this plume of smoke barrel down that corridor and began to engulf the entire area. You know, we should explain to people who, who live uh, outside of New York that, that these buildings are like wind tunnels, yeah. you know, on a windy day where you can just get sort of blown away. And so all the debris and all the smoke just came, as you said, like a plume just charging. Like a tornado. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I ducked behind a car as I made a right around the corner, and the environment around me got increasingly black, and, and the air was quite thick, and fortunately I got into an open car and, and managed to wait there till things cleared up just a bit. All right. Well, Ron and Sana, Ron, thank you. I know you'll never forget yesterday. Absolutely not. Thank Katie. you so much. Right now, Mayor Giuliani is speaking with Flisson. It's going to take some time, and we're bringing generators in. Uh, the governor made available to us a group of generators.
that we've moved to Randall's Island, and uh, we will be using them in, the, in that area of the east side that needs uh, generator power because they may need it for quite some time. We were able to move 120 dump trucks out of the city last night, which will give you a sense of the work that was done overnight. Uh, so some of the debris has already been removed. More of it is being removed, and it will be done by barge all throughout the day today. Uh, the subway system is operating in all of the city, but uh, below 14th Street, and largely because right now we have that closed. Uh, so if you're in any of the other four boroughs, public transportation is normal, the subways are normal, the buses are normal. If you're in Manhattan, the subways are going to be working uh, to 14th Street, and then for those that go underneath, they'll just go straight out to Brooklyn as soon as we can get that area of the city open. However, there will be subway service there, except for the one, two, and th three lines, the west side IRT below 34th Street, because of the collapse that took place. And um, again, we ask all New Yorkers to, uh, to cooperate and to try to help each other. There, there are going to be a lot of people today who need help and need assistance, either because of the uh, fact that they know people that were lost in this terrible tragedy, or because they're just frightened of what may happen. Uh, if you could comfort them and help them and assist them, particularly elderly people, that, that might be a way in which you, you, you can contribute. And uh, we're getting very, very close cooperation from the state, from the federal government. I think people in New York, the best way they can uh, deal with this right now is not only to deal with their own grief, which we all feel and have, but to show that we're not going to be in any way affected by this, that we're not going to be cowered by it, that we're not afraid, that we're going to go about our business and lead normal lives uh, and not let these cowards affect us in any way uh, like they're trying to do, which is to instill fear in us. Governor? That was Mayor Giuliani speaking at a press conference just uh, downtown, short distance from here. He talked about the need to help other people and comfort other people because they might be afraid. That's particularly true. He mentioned older people, but it would also be true with younger people, children. Dominic Capello is the author of the book called Ten Talks Parents Must Have with Their Children About Violence. Dominic, good morning. Good to have you back. Good morning. It, it's so hard. I mean, students were taken out of school yesterday. Schools were closed. You know, they've had things like that happen in the past for snow days, for storms. But if they turned on TV, Dominic, they saw some horrific images. How do parents deal with that? Oh, well, I, I, I should say there, there, were the, there were the parents who were watching it on TV, and there were the parents that I saw who were actually by the Hudson River, downtown in Manhattan, with their children, watching the, the buildings collapse. And I, I have to tell you, to be quite honest, I, I was very struck as I was out there watching teenagers and parents with infants and five-year-olds watching the building collapse, and I could only, I could only imagine um, what they were feeling. I certainly was feeling extraordinarily sad, and I think that uh, as you're, you're wondering how do America's parents talk to their children, I, I don't think there's an educator or a parent or an adult in America who is prepared for this. I, I think we've learned some things about how to deal with death and dying. I've certainly spent time writing books about violence. I, it's hard to imagine how you even begin a conversation. Th there are some things that we, we can recommend. We'll get to those in a second. Violence is one subject, but what about children? who are now looking at every tall building in the city saying, Mommy, I don't want to go in that building. I don't want to go near that building Absolutely. because it could fall on me. Right, and we're, we're also hearing that, that kids don't want their parents getting on airplanes. And, and uh, I did talk to some parents actually in Brooklyn and, and talked, uh, have you talked to your kids? And they were all watching the news together, which I think is a good idea. If children will watch the news, they should be watching it with their parents. And, and a seven-year-old girl turned to her dad and said, Daddy, are you scared? And the dad said, yes, I am scared. And, and, the, and the mother was crying and said, Mommy, why are you crying? And she said, I'm very sad. And I think this touches on parents being able to talk about their feelings and being able to express their feelings so that, so that children know it's okay for, for them to express their feelings. H how do parents explain to their children that there are people out there who simply want to kill <sighs> innocent people? It, 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 it's, it's, it's hard to imagine a response. I talked to a, a, a wonderful mother I know who lives um, in the uh, Upper West Side, and she has a six-year-old son. And, and she said she, she, was a, she felt she needed to talk with him because she felt he would go back to school and the kids would be talking at school, and she wanted him to hear from her. She said that sometimes there are very bad people in the world, and these bad people um, 
have done something very bad. They took over some planes and crashed it into a building, and many, many innocent people were hurt, and this is very bad. And the little boy said, are they going to catch those people? And she said, yes, we, we will find those people. It's important to, to explain to children also, I would imagine, that this is a rare occurrence. Absolutely, absolutely. This is not something that happens. And as I said, most Americans can't fathom this happening. We have to reassure children, and we have to reassure ourselves as adults. We are also looking up in the sky and looking up at the buildings and say this is, this is not something that happens every day. But I, I caution us just because I think some of us are wondering, is this the end? Or are we beginning war? So I, I don't want to... And those are the words, picture. by the way, that yeah. children are hearing. If, if they're listening to Absolutely. TV, they're hearing words like war and more yes. and terror and things like that. Right. I, I think what we want parents to understand is first that we, it's a complicated situation. It's a crisis situation. Parents um, do understand that children are looking to them for guidance, for security. And again, I, I, I would um, encourage parents to not feel like they're alone. They have their communities of faith. They have their schools. I got a call from a PTA mother yesterday who said, should I put on a meeting for the parents? That's a good idea. Real quickly, just 30 seconds left. Also important for parents to talk about not lashing out, their children not lashing out against certain ethnic groups? Absolutely. I got a call from a woman in Washington, D.C. who was concerned that her kids may get the wrong idea. There were some clips showing some people in the Middle East celebrating this, and her teenage sons were furious and very angry. So this is not a time. This is a time for tolerance and to let our government follow the laws and the international laws. All right, Dominic, if you will stick around, we want to talk to you more throughout the day. Thank All right. you. Right now, let's go back to Katie. All right, Matt, thank you very much. The images on television and in our newspapers over the last 24 hours have been hard, even impossible to believe the financial heart of America attacked the ultimate symbol of the US military attacked here on this Wednesday morning a nation is still reeling we have a breaking story though apparently a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center here in New York City it happened just a few moments ago apparently we have very little information available it's quite terrifying I'm in shock right now it's mind-boggling and it was a hijacked American Airlines flight out of Boston slams into the North Tower of New York's World Trade Center at approximately 8.42 a.m. Eastern Time. Oh, another one just hit. Something else just hit. A very large plane just oh. flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. Can you see it? I yes. can see it on this shot. A second airplane, a 727, just ran into the building. It's now approximately 9.03 a.m. There, it, it felt just a few moments ago like there was an explosion of some kind here at the Pentagon. 9.40 a.m., a third hijacked plane, an American flight out of Washington, Dulles, crashes into the Pentagon in a burst of flames. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. The FAA has banned all takeoffs at all airports across America. We just saw a live picture of what seemed to be a portion of the building falling away from the World Trade Center. 9.59 a.m., the until now unthinkable, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. Spent the year in combat. I never saw anything like this. Boy, a lot of people die. Nothing this devastating. The other tower of the World Trade Center has just collapsed. There's been a declaration of war by terrorists in the United States. You didn't have time to look at, you know, you just, you just want to be alive, really. There was smoke everywhere and people were jumping out the windows. The city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists. We will find the people responsible for these cowardly acts and justice will be done. These are Palestinian celebrations in the wake of Tuesday's terror attacks in the United States. Pal apparently, Palestinians took to the street chanting, God is great. The alleged mastermind of America's most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden. Certainly in more than 20 years of 
of covering horrific events. This is something that I've never seen before. I got hold of a ca video camera uh, and began recording, you know, some of what had happened. Um, We're looking at those images right now. Yeah. So they're you're looking through your viewfinder watching the tower collapse. Yeah. And you can see I'm not very far away. I mean, they see that big chunk of the building, and this is this cloud starts moving real fast. We're all crying, hysterical. We were wanting to get out of there and not knowing where to go and which direction to run in and how far we can go. <coughs> and I'm still worried about my life. Yeah, it's horrifying. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. This is wild. Good morning. America may never be the same, and this is why. A beautiful Tuesday morning turned tragic when American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And that was just the beginning. This morning, just over 24 hours later, the heart of commerce and the signature of the New York skyline is no more. The nerve center of the U.S. military deliberately and viciously attacked, leaving a nation and the rest of the world stunned today, Wednesday, September the 12th, 2001. From NBC News, this is Today with Katie Couric and Matt Lauer. And welcome to Today on this Wednesday morning, a morning people are waking up in disbelief with unbelievably heavy hearts, especially those who have lost loved ones or who are uncertain where their loved ones are. I'm Katie Couric. And I'm Matt Lauer. Tuesday morning did start off beautifully. It was a gorgeous day until 8.42 a.m. Eastern Time when that happened. Horrible pictures. This was a scene 25 hours ago. Airplanes intentionally plunging into the World Trade Center. We still don't know how high the human toll will climb. But the early numbers, Matt, are staggering. 266 people on the four hijacked planes are dead. Two hit the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, one hit the Pentagon, and one crashed 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. At the Pentagon, up to 800 people are now feared dead. In New York City, Mayor Rudy Giuliani says the toll could be more than any of us can bear. The New York Fire Commissioner said that he is missing 300 firefighters and EMS personnel. 33 New York police officers are missing. Estimates are that there were up to 50,000 people working in the World Trade Center on Tuesday morning when the attacks took place. And the stories of some of those people escaping the building are harrowing. A glimmer, and I mean a glimmer of hope, word is that some victims have survived in Lower Manhattan. Cell phone calls coming from the rubble and people still alive pulled out from inside that wreckage. At this point, there are two makeshift morgues being set up in Lower Manhattan. And there are also some heartbreaking reports of passengers on those four doomed planes calling loved ones to report that they'd been hijacked and in some cases to say, I love you and goodbye. And Matt, we're beginning to get a picture of the terror on those planes before they crashed. Flight attendants being stabbed, passengers herded to the back of the planes, and now new developments overnight in Boston where two of the flights originated. Five suspects have been identified and a car seized from the Logan Airport parking lot. But there still is much we do not know and may not know for a very long time. The president spoke to the nation last night. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. 
Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. That was President Bush speaking to the nation from the Oval Office last night. We are going to cover this story all morning long. Let's begin with NBC's David Bloom, who's close to the rescue efforts this morning. David? Matt, there are conflicting accounts this morning as to how many people may have been pulled alive from the rubble. We know that three people for sure are safe. Two New York City police officers, also a New York City fire department official, pulled from the rubble early this morning. Essentially, Matt, more than 25 hours after the first explosions, you can still see the smoke billowing behind me, and there are three basic problems that the rescuers say they're confronting. Number one, you can still see them throwing a large amount of water on these buildings because there are still fires burning this morning. Second issue, far more significant, the rescuers tell us, is the unstable nature of the surrounding buildings. There are desperately worried about more buildings collapsing, so they're proceeding very gingerly. The third issue is just the remaining debris, so much so that it's making it impossible to conduct a thorough search and rescue effort. They're merely going into caverns where they're hoping that they might still find people alive, but it is a cruelly slow process. Overnight in New York City, a faint glimmer of hope. At least two victims pulled alive from the rubble. And there may be others still trapped inside the World Trade Center's collapsed remains. Reports of cell phone calls from a few survivors pleading for help. We do know there are people in the building that are alive. We know that for a fact. We're very hopeful, very hopeful that there are pockets where there are people, not, not only the ones that we know about, but ho hopefully others. But elsewhere, the news is grim. The president last night puts the death toll from the attacks in the thousands after an estimated 12 to 20 terrorists wielding makeshift knives hijack four domestic airliners. Brand new video obtained overnight shows the first attack plane crashing into the World Trade Center's North Tower. Minutes later, television helicopters record the second plane crashing into the South Tower. The two 110-story buildings so badly damaged that they collapse one after the other. Among the missing, the rescuers themselves. Last night, New York City firefighters and police confirm that more than 300 of their own are believed dead. And at the Pentagon, site of the third plane attack, firefighters last night say the death toll could rise to as high as 800 people. Last night, Air Force One, escorted by two fighter jets, returns President Bush to Washington where he brands the attacks evil and despicable, vowing that America will win the war against terrorism. With Saudi-born terrorist Osama bin Laden the prime suspect, Mr. Bush makes a thinly veiled threat of reprisal against his backers in Afghanistan. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. The two hijacked planes which toppled the World Trade Center both originated out of Boston where this morning the Boston Herald reports that authorities have identified at least five Arab men as suspects, one of them a trained pilot, and that a car laden with Arabic language flight training manuals was found at Logan Airport's central parking garage. As to bin Laden's suspected role, Senator Orrin Hatch tells the Associated Press that the United States intercepted communications between bin Laden supporters discussing targets that were hit and that at least one of the suspected hijackers had known ties to the terrorists. One of the biggest mysteries, why did the fourth hijacked plane not hit a target, crashing instead in western Pennsylvania? One possible explanation, a passenger on the doomed flight reportedly called his wife, telling her, we're all going to die, I love you, but indicating that he and two other passengers had decided to try to overpower the hijackers. Attorney General John Ashcroft told Congress last night that that plane is believed to have been headed for Washington, D.C. But again, by far the greatest loss of life here in lower Manhattan in New York City, 
Authorities tell us that of those two Port Authority officers rescued last night, one of them had to have a leg amputated in order to be pulled from the rubble alive. Very scant reports this morning, very slim hope that anyone could have survived the actual collapse of those buildings. Most of the hope surrounds those who may have been trapped in the basement or some other pockets where there might still be faint hope of survivors. Matt. All right, David. NBC's David Bloom near the rescue operations in lower Manhattan. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you very much. President Bush is right now meeting with his national security staff. And obviously, uh, he is busy talking with them, and he will be making a statement within the hour. And that is the U.S. Capitol alive picture of the House of Representatives. Congressman Dick Armey speaking, showing solidarity behind the president. The nation is also rallying behind President Bush today as he works around the clock trying to find out who is responsible for Tuesday's devastating attacks. NBC White House correspondent Campbell Brown reports. The lights were on at the White House well after midnight as the president's national security team sifted through the latest intelligence, honing in on who was behind the attacks, preparing the U.S. response. In his address to the nation, the president issued a strong warning to any country that might aid the terrorists. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. White House officials say it was the president's decision to return to Washington. As Bush arrived at the White House, aides described his demeanor as somber but even keeled. His message to the country, American strength will overcome. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. As Tuesday's attacks began, the president was preparing to speak to school children in Sarasota, Florida. He first got word a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center from Chief of Staff Andy Card, then a phone call from National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, then a second crash. Card whispered in the president's ear, Bush's reaction, one of shock. Immediately, the Secret Service activated an emergency plan to protect the president. He took off on Air Force One, but his destination was kept secret. The plane became a flying command center, Bush's first call to Vice President Cheney. Cheney, Rice, and the president's national security team huddled in the White House Situation Room. But the scene outside on the White House grounds chaos as all other staff and press are rushed out in a mass evacuation. Fire trucks blazed down Pennsylvania Avenue. Crowds gathered in the streets as buildings nearby were evacuated. Air Force One brought the president to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, where the president vowed to retaliate. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Minutes later, Air Force One took off again, the destination again a secret. Early afternoon, the plane landed in Nebraska at the U.S. Strategic Command Center near Omaha. Bush went into a bunker to talk to his national security team by live video conference. Fighter jets escorted Air Force One back to Washington. From the plane, he fielded calls from world leaders and spoke twice with First Lady Laura Bush, telling his wife he would soon see her at home. The symbol of America's military might is the massive Pentagon, home to this country's top military brass. Tuesday, terror from above rained down on them. Jim Mikoshevsky, our Pentagon correspondent, was inside the building when American Airlines Flight 77 was deliberately crashed into that building. Jim, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. Uh, and unfortunately, the news here remains grim. Rescue workers uh, over the past uh, 12 hours or so, or so say they have detected no signs of life in the tons of rubble that you see behind us. Uh, using listening devices and, and uh, cameras on, on long uh, poles, uh, they could just detect no movement, no signs of life uh, anywhere. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that uh, uh, fires continue to burn here. That hampers any kind of recovery efforts. And the building itself is still unstable. Uh, local firefighting officials say that before they can even get their men anywhere close uh, to, the, uh, to the center of that site, uh, they're going to have to actually knock down those unstable parts of the building before, the, uh, before they can begin to recover the dead. 
Rescue workers using cadaver dogs worked through the night on the grisly task of searching for the dead. Local fire officials estimate as many as 800 were killed, many still buried in the debris. The Pentagon, the center of America's military power, devastated by a sneak terrorist attack. American Airlines Flight 77 hijacked shortly after takeoff from Dulles Airport, with terrorists at the controls traveling at 600 miles per hour with 6,000 gallons of fuel. The jet slams into the two lower floors of the Pentagon. It kind of disappeared over this embankment here for a moment, and then huge explosion flames flying into the air and, and uh, just chaos on the road. I hate to say it, but I did fall apart when it first happened. I was very frightened. Um, this doesn't happen in America. I guess it does. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was at work at his desk. I felt the, the shock of the uh, airplane hitting the building, uh, went through the building and then out into the area, and they were bringing uh, bodies out that had been injured. The plane slices deep into the Pentagon, cutting through offices primarily occupied by the Navy and Marines. The upper floors later collapse. The question now, how will the U.S. military respond? Worldwide, American military forces are put at the highest state of alert, ThreatCon Delta. And even as part of the Pentagon burn, military planners continue to review the options. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Hugh Shelton, with a pledge to retaliate against those responsible. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next, but make no mistake about it, your armed forces are ready. The Pentagon has long had a number of contingency plans to attack a variety of Osama bin Laden targets. Those plans are now under serious review. The aircraft carrier Enterprise, headed home from the Persian Gulf, ordered to remain in the area in case President Bush orders military strikes. And there's still plenty of military activity underway here stateside. Uh, AWACS radar planes and fighter jets continue to patrol the skies of several major metropolitan areas uh, in the United States, primarily here on the East Coast. And the aircraft carrier George Washington is steaming up toward the New York area to provide any kind of assistance, primarily medical, that it can. Matt? Mick, try to explain the impact for me, if you will. When this flight came in, it struck the outer ring, obviously, of the Pentagon. How far was the penetration? Well, uh, as you can see, well, it's partly obscured by smoke now. The, the, uh, <clears throat> the outer portion of the Pentagon is the E ring. It's made up of five rings from the middle, A, B, C, D, E. And what happened is that when the 757 came in almost parallel to the Pentagon wall there on, the, on, on this uh, west side, it suddenly took a very sharp 90-degree flip on its right side and turned directly in to the Pentagon. It penetrated the Pentagon on the first and second floors, uh, penetrating first through the E-ring, uh, then there's an open space, D-ring, open space, C-ring, and, and the impact finally stopped right at the B-ring. Uh, several, uh, uh, several military officers who I know who were at that B-ring said they were blown out of their chairs and they looked up to see flames against their window, but fortunately the force of the impact stopped right there, but penetrated quite deep into the Pentagon. Then it was some time after that, after it took out the first and second floors, that the third, fourth, and fifth floors above it then collapsed unto itself, and, and that's what we see behind us. You know, eerily reminiscent of the kind of pictures we saw after the bombing of the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City, this gaping hole and the collapsed walls or, or, or floors on an angle that sort of, and actually pancaked on each other. You Matt. talked yesterday briefly, Mick, about some renovations that had been done to the building, and in some ways they were trying to shore up the structure of that building. Can you explain that? Well, it was after the, uh, uh, the, the Pentagon was due for a renovation anyway, uh, slowly but surely. It's going to take about 10 to 12 years to complete. Uh, but they decided, look, as long as we're doing this, let's do it right. So the portion to the right of the blast area is actually that area uh, that had been renovated already. And when they rebuilt that area, they put in uh, reinforced blast walls on the outer E-ring. Right. Uh, they are meant to deflect a bomb, but nothing strong enough to deflect an airplane, Matt. All right, Mick, thank you very much. We want to go inside the Pentagon now. A briefing is taking place. Tori Clark, who's a Pentagon Washington spokesperson, Commander. is Washington addressing Jackson. the press. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the Arlington County Fire Chief, Ed Plogger. And I'd like to have each of them come up, make some brief comments, and hold your questions to the end. So, David? 
Tory, thank you very much. Uh, as you all know, the Department of Defense family has taken a, a terrible and tragic loss within the last uh, 24 hours, and uh, our, our deep sympathy goes out to the families of those most directly affected by these uh, tr uh, tragic events. Uh, on the positive side, uh, I am truly impressed by the spirit of the people in this uh, department and the way they have rallied around both yesterday and this morning coming back into this, uh, into this building. Uh, I do have, for those who have offices in the area bounded by corridors two through six, which as you know are not uh, usable at this uh, juncture, uh, we simply ask they call their supervisors for instructions on where they're supposed to go if they've not already uh, received those uh, instructions. Uh, I also want to give the Department's thanks both to our own people and to the nation at large uh, for the extraordinary, truly extraordinary uh, response in donating blood. It's just terrific, uh, and it shows how Americans uh, will pull together in a, in a crisis. Uh, we are uh, establishing, it is now open, uh, at the Sheraton Crystal City, uh, 1800 Jefferson Davis Highway, uh, which is, as you know, is on the Crystal City Metro stop. Uh, a Pentagon Family Assistance Center. This will fold into one place uh, all the family assistance efforts uh, of the department for all personnel, military, of all branches, and uh, civil. Uh, I'll have Meg Falk, who uh, is our director of uh, our Office of Family Policy, uh, in just a moment say a word or two about the kind of capabilities uh, that they uh, have down there. Uh, we will have a telephone number there shortly. Verizon is working very hard on installing that. It's not yet in, uh, so unfortunately I can't give you uh, that number uh, at this time. It will be a number, I should emphasize, just for the families. Uh, this is a center designed to help those families uh, who are missing a family member, whose family member is deceased, uh, or whose family member is injured. Uh, we are committed to providing all the resources of the department uh, to providing the, uh, to, to uh, giving them the assistance that they should have. I will emphasize we don't have answers to all your questions this morning. Uh, we are still working on some of these issues. Uh, I would also emphasize to the fact You are watching a live feed of the Pentagon briefing that's taking place right now. Pentagon officials talking to the press regarding some uh, important information from family members as well as Pentagon employees. U.S. officials, meanwhile, are saying the evidence is mounting as to who is behind these terrorist attacks. They are refusing to publicly name names this morning, but all fingers are pointing at one man. NBC's Andrea Mitchell is in Washington, D.C. this morning with more on that. Andrea, good morning. Good morning, Katie. Well, in your interview earlier today with Colin Powell, he said that this is a declaration of war against America and a declaration of war against all of civilization. And you can tell that they are building a case. He said that evidence is mounting. Uh, privately, officials are saying that they do not believe that this came from a state hostile to the United States, such as Iraq. This was not state-sponsored terrorism. They believe that only one person has the ability to mount something this sophisticated and this well-coordinated, and that is Osama bin Laden. In the rubble of the disaster, clues possibly linking the attack to bin Laden, America's most wanted terrorist. Reports to the Senate that a member of bin Laden's group may be identified as a passenger on one of the four doomed planes, and reports of intercepted communications between his followers after the attack, talking about the targets being hit. A lot of things point to it. it was either, I, I would think it would either be uh, uh, Osama bin Laden's cell or some other cell similar to it or kin to it or spin off from it. Why bin Laden? Method, motive, money. A well-financed global network responsible for the simultaneous bombings of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania three years ago. Linked to the mastermind of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Also accused of plotting millennium bombings targeting Los Angeles International Airport, American tourist sites in Jordan, and a U.S. destroyer. Those plots foiled by counterintelligence teams. But six months later, disaster. The bombing of the USS Cole in Yemen last October. In this chilling bin Laden training video released in June, a chorus sings, quote, We thank God for granting us victory the day we destroyed the coal. Bin Laden himself is seen saying they charged and destroyed a destroyer. If it is bin Laden, can the U.S. finally track him down? He's a master of deception, harbored by Afghanistan's Taliban rulers for years, moving constantly, eluding the FBI. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, but my expectation is that eventually there'll be a crack uh, somewhere in their armor, and, and we will 
determine who is responsible. Then, of course, you have the very difficult task of deciding how to respond and where to respond. And questions will be asked about the intelligence failure that permitted the terrorists to strike with no warning. It's true that we cannot have 100% success against suicide bombers who are prepared to take their own lives into their hands. But at the same time, particularly in a sophisticated operation like this, that there are lots of people involved, it needs a lot of coordination. And that creates opportunities for an effective intelligence operation. And now what they are doing, Katie, is reviewing all of the traffic, the electronic intercepts, not only yesterday but before the target attacks, to see whether or not there was something that they missed. Was there a cue that they missed? We know there was no warning, but perhaps there was something more subtle that they should have picked up because you know that they are going to be accused of this massive intelligence failure. Well, I was going to ask you, Andrew, is there a lot of hand-wringing going on at the State Department over this? Why they didn't pick up any indication that this was about to happen? Or do they believe this is simply the nature of terrorist activity? They are concerned, but they're very sympathetic with their colleagues at the other intelligence agencies because there is so much coming in at one time that nobody is monitoring all of it in any 24-hour period. It's always going back over tapes that they pick up things that should have been cues. And these are very difficult organizations to penetrate. You're talking about individuals who are speaking strange dialects. We don't have people who can easily infiltrate. They are very loyal, and as you know, they are willing to become martyrs. Very, very difficult to prevent something like this from happening. And tracking down Osama bin Laden is, as General Schwarzkopf said, the proverbial needle in, in the haystack. I mean, I know that he has been housed and protected by the Taliban in Afghanistan, and you say he's the master of disguise. He moves around constantly. Are there other countries where he is welcome and, in fact, protected? No, he has been in Afghanistan for many years uh, since a brief stay in Sudan, which did lead uh, partially to that retaliation against Sudan also in 1998. But that one was very controversial because really only the Taliban have been willing to protect him. He uh, provides a tremendous amount of money for their regime, and it is a mutually satisfying relationship. They will deny it. They say today that he is virtually under house arrest, but they've not been willing to turn him over despite promises in the past. And we are finding, uh, the FBI is finding, that although there's an arrest warrant out for his arrest in the embassy bombings, and he's been linked to these other cases as well, they have not been able to locate him. Uh, we don't exactly have uh, teams that can easily go in and pin somebody down. Mm -hmm. We know where he is one day, but not necessarily the next. Real quickly, with the threat of U.S. military action, though, Andrew, do you think the Taliban might change its tune at all? It's conceivable, but it would make it very difficult in their neighborhood to turn him over. He is a hero in that part of the world. All right. NBC's Andrea Mitchell in Washington. Andrea, as always, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. 26 uh, minutes after the hour. Now here's Matt. Katie, as we've been saying, the situation here in New York is grim. Rescuers are working in rubble that's unstable in many cases, still burning in other cases. Ann Curry is in lower Manhattan with more on the rescue efforts. Ann? Matt, I tell you, I just returned from ground zero right on the corner of Vesey and uh, West Streets where the, the rescue operators are, are struggling with, with cranes and equipment. Uh, we have some pictures that we just brought back and we're, we actually have not edited this footage. Here we are being escort, escorted towards Vesey and, and West. And what we basically are at is the northwest corner of this disaster. Uh, you, you can see the impact on the building that you're looking at. The building on the left, that actually is the customs building that actually is not one of the three that fell. That is actually the building that was uh, crashed onto by uh, building number seven. Uh, you can also see the collateral damage to other buildings nearby. These are presumably office buildings. A number of buildings were affected by this. And, and what we also uh, are, can report to you is that the fire, uh, we, well, there is at least, if if not flames, there certainly is smoldering still occurring in many of these places uh, where, where there were fires. The wind has come, come up and started the fires again, and then the firefighters have been able to put the fires back out, so that's been a, an on and off again situation. In the middle, to the right of that uh, customs building, you see that's building number six. It's in the middle of that uh, that you just saw, that actually 
was where building number one was. And we were estimating that there may be one or two floors left of that building. In addition, we have fed to you, uh, and we hope that you can get it on television very soon, um, some aerial pictures, not from a plane, but actually from a building adjacent here nearby. And in that footage, you're going to be able to see the scope of this damage, how much of, the, of, of this downtown tip of Manhattan was affected by these falling buildings. Uh, we, we can also report to you that we've seen several teams of canine units arrive and also we have also we can report that they have brought in something called an eye robot and more than one of these these are basically machines that have sensors and they are sent where they will not send a human being a human rescuer because they're concerned about the structural damage that these machines I'm being told by a New York City police officer um, can detect movement and can go into tunnels and also that they can send back images and so they are using these in addition to the dogs to uh, to do whatever they can to find whoever might still be alive under all of this rubble, Matt. We should mention for people who have only seen the World Trade Center from pictures, from video, and they are used to seeing the two towers, the footprint of this entire complex is enormous, not just the two tower buildings, but some other smaller buildings that have also either collapsed or been severely damaged. That's absolutely right. And in the pictures that we're going to show you, in fact, I think you're seeing them right now. You're seeing the foot, some of that footprint. Uh, we have, um, um, I, I can't really actually tell exactly uh, which buildings we're seeing in front of us, but what, what, oh, there you can see actually more of the damage and the rescuers on top of the buildings. But the two towers went down. The seven building went down and it crashed into number six, the customs building. And buildings all around, the restaurants, apartment buildings, uh, uh, offices nearby, they were impacted. There's a gaping hole in, in one of them that's three stories high. So this footprint is amazing. And, and just a question for you. I know that whole area has been kind of off limits to civilians, but on the outskirts, are you seeing people who are just standing in awe as to what has happened? Uh, there are those, but they're really being kept back by the police. Uh, the police has been very vigilant about keeping people out of here. In fact, we are now being ordered right now to leave this location. So we are now going to move a block away and come back to you with more information as soon as we can get it, Matt. All right, Ann. Thanks very much. We appreciate okay. it. Ann Curry okay. in Lower Manhattan. Katie? All right, Matt, thank you. The question everyone's asking today, how four hijackings of U.S. planes could be pulled off all at once. NBC's Robert Hager is in Washington this morning to help us understand how something like this could happen. Bob, good morning. Good morning, Katie. Well, we're here at Washington's Reagan National Airport. There you can see the idle planes, scenes like this at airports all over the country this morning. The plan now is theoretically to resume flights, at least airlines will be cleared to resume flights, about noon Eastern time, that would be 9 a.m. Pacific time. But that's really a theory only because it's going to take a long while to get em employees back in here. For instance, this airport is closed right now. Employees are only going to be able to trickle back within a few hours hours and then it's going to take a while for the airlines to get their planes all sorted out get them back at airports where they're supposed to be because everything sort of froze in place yesterday morning when an, a, a ground halt was called all over the country so again expect when we fly again that it'll be very slowly returning to normal and that security is going to be much much tighter now as for those hijackings officials now say that each of the planes was commandeered by three to five terrorists they believe Probably those terrorists killed the pilots in each case and took over the controls of the planes using knives as weapons. Here now, more of what's known. Four planes, 266 on board, lost at the hands of suicidal hijackers who turned them into weapons of vast destruction. Boston's Logan Airport, an American flight with 92 aboard, supposed to fly cross-country to Los Angeles, diverted to New York. A flight attendant calls from the flight on her cell phone. Chilling news. Her fellow flight attendants have been stabbed, she reports. Passenger cabin taken over, and they're going down in New York. Back in Boston, a United jetliner with 65 aboard is already in the air, also bound for Los Angeles, 18 minutes behind the first flight, when it, too, is diverted. A businessman on the flight calls his father twice. First call, a flight attendant has been stabbed, he says. Calls again to tell his dad the plane is going down. This is the actual video of that second plane crashing into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. 
in Northern Virginia, an American jet takes off from Dulles Airport. 64 aboard this flight headed to Los Angeles. On board, Barbara Olson, wife of the U.S. Solicitor General, calls her husband on a cell phone, tells him hijackers have taken over that flight with knife-like instruments, passengers being forced to the back of the plane, she reports. Moments later, the plane hits the Pentagon. And finally, Newark Airport, another United flight, 45 aboard, bound Newark to San Francisco. Hijackers turn it back to Washington, D.C., but it comes down en route in western Pennsylvania. Officials say it wasn't shot down, so hijackers may have crashed it too soon, or there could have been a struggle ongoing in the cockpit. Four deadly flights, says terrorism expert Neil Livingstone. I clearly call this a war. I think this is a wake-up call for America. I don't think we'll ever be the same after these attacks today. How much did the government know as it was happening? Pilots are able to send coded signals to controllers if they're hijacked, but it's uncertain whether any of these crews had time. Even if they did, controllers would have been frustrated, powerless to do much more than notify official Washington and track the plane's moves. Since most previous hijackings have ended without loss of life, it's a hands-off approach that's worked best until now. Finally, security. Former commercial pilot Jim Tillman. Airline travel across the world will never be the same. It particularly will be different in the United States. And what we have known to be open and free airports will change radically. Passenger screening, a special issue. Previously, unannounced testing has shown screeners miss even mocked up guns or explosives one out of every five times. And knives are sometimes even permitted through intentionally if they don't appear menacing. Today, the National Transportation Safety Board has investigators at the scenes of these various crashes, helping the FBI search for the plane's cockpit voice recorders. Those are the devices that record all the voices in the cockpit, and they could provide valuable information on just who committed these horrible acts and how. Katie? And I know, Bob, that you believe that flight that crashed outside Pittsburgh might be the first flight in which the, the cockpit pit recorder is retrieved, correct? I'm guessing that it's going to be easier to find there because the way those planes hit the towers of the uh, World Trade Center, uh, wreckage would have sprayed out. It's going to be very hard to find them or if it went straight down, find them in the tons of debris from those buildings themselves. I'm guessing in Pittsburgh, since it's in an open field, that it would be much more easy to find and probably had a much better chance of surviving. So that may be the first cockpit voice recorder they get too. Bob, let me review a couple of the things that you touched upon. Did air traffic controllers, or were, there, were they aware, as far as you know, that these planes had been hijacked by tracking them on the radar screen? I think, I think they were aware fairly early on. There's one story that a, uh, a pilot keyed a microphone that is left it open in the cockpit and the controllers in New Hampshire controlling the flights leaving Logan Airport were able to uh, hear, at least in the case of that first plane, uh, that that plane was in some kind of trouble. Now there's a button in the cockpit that pilots can push to that sends out a secret code. We don't know if crews were disabled so fast that they were unable to push that code. After you send out the code, if they were able to, uh, there's a series of questions that don't really sound menacing that controllers can ask the pilots if they're still in control of the plane simple little things that mean things to the controllers and the pilots mm -hmm. sort of code words and and they might tell the the uh, controllers more about where the plane was going but even if and when they realize that there were hijackings in progress in the past because most hijackings have been have ended benignly that is the plane is brought somewhere uh, the people who hijacked it get off then the plane is released and it flies safely back to where it was supposed to go uh, so the the rule is kind of been hands off once the plane's in the air now toward the very end they did realize after a couple of these crashes what was uh, underway and they were tracking the last blip as it was turning from Cleveland heading back to Washington. This is the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. They were tracking that blip and they were very afraid it was coming back here to Washington, among other things. That's why they evacuated National Airport. Yeah, this hands-off approach may be reevaluated, not to mention airport security, Bob. What do you see changing along those lines? Yeah, I think they're going to have to re-examine that, particularly, I mean, if these were knives, maybe some of them were innocuous looking knives because there was one report that it, it just looked like a knife-like device. But knives aren't necessarily on the absolutely prohibited list as you go through x-ray screening. Now, even when they send through mock-ups of the guns and, and explosives, oftentimes these are in tests. Uh, the screeners fail to get them. But a knife, because it's not necessarily on the prohibited list, if it doesn't look menacing, it's not on the prohibited list, uh, sometimes they let that go through anyway. So I think they're going to have to look at that again. 
All right, NBC's Robert Hager. Bob, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Former FAA Inspector General Mary Scavo has spoken out for a long, long time about the lack of security at our nation's airports. Mary, good morning. Good morning, Katie. I'm sure you have much to say this morning along those lines. Well, uh, much to say, but also great sadness, not only for the families and the tragedies, but for the warnings that have gone out to the government for the past 10 years, and not just by me, but also by other folks about the grave risk to domestic aviation, and now to have it culminate in such a disaster, it, it's really unthinkable, uh, but it's just made more tragic by the warnings the government had. Mary, well, let's, well, let's talk about those warnings, because as the FAA Inspector General, when you were serving, did you ever contemplate or speculate about the possibility of, of domestic flights, innocent civilians being used as basically a, a human missile? Uh, well, we didn't, you, we didn't talk about it in those terms as human missiles, but we certainly did talk about on many occasions the risk to domestic aviation, and we compared it to uh, certainly the inadequate but the greater safeguards on international flights. We penetrated airports on two occasions. We did two investigations, 93 and, and um, 95, 96, and we were able to do these kinds of things at airports all over the country to pour, point out the great weaknesses in the airports, that you can get anything through security, and in this case, then, since there appears there were so many individuals involved on each of these hijacked planes, um, it is also possible that they were able to get persons employed within the airport because the background screening process is really very woeful. So you gave warnings, or there were warnings. Were they virtually ignored? Uh, practically virtually ignored. We issued uh, written reports um, and my successor, the current IG, actually repeated the studies again in 99. So there were three very clear nationwide studies of airport uh, security laxity. Um, we issued warnings to the Federal Aviation Administration, um, warnings to the Secretary of Transportation, warnings on the first report to the President of the United States, on the second report to the National Security uh, Advisor. Um, so the warning bells were sounded. We issued the reports to Congress and the Senate, but the, the response was the same. Look, they said, we've never had a domestic aviation uh, terrorist attack against domestic uh, flights and facilities, so the risk for domestic is, in their opinion, at that time, very low, and so they didn't take it very seriously. And was tragically, others apparently were heeding the, the, the weaknesses. Was money an explanation that it would cost too much yes. to beef up security domestically? Yes, uh, unfortunately, this is again another one of those situations where money was an excuse. Uh, one very high ranking official, I mean, this is just so tragic to say this. Uh, I have written about it in, in a book, but um, they talked about the cost of Pan Am 103, the tragic bombing over at Lockerbie, uh, being around three billion or in the, in the low billions. And the cost of making U.S. airports and doing all these security measures for domestic flights and domestic traffic to be around $10 billion. And even if they did have another Pan Am 103 in the next 10 years, you know, the cost was just too great to make airports safe. And uh, someone even quipped, and it's just tragic at this point, that if they made aviation completely safe, they'd just bomb something else. So clearly, um, you know, those weaknesses um, were known to the government, but it was an accepted risk, and it's just unbelievably tragic. Incidentally, the FAA revealed two months ago that it was seeking to fine American Airlines for alleged inadequate security on six flights inspected in June of 2000. And American Airlines is not alone. Uh, U.S. carriers, um, most of them have been fined and found lax at security at one point or another. So American is not alone in those uh, downfallings. Uh, but it is very tragic. And usually they were small fines. If they were caught not living up to security, they got a small fine. And uh, even officials in the FAA, their feet, uh, you know, has really, have really never been held to the fire for lax security. After Pan Am 103, our own government was widely criticized for taking a lax attitude towards aviation security. And tragically, all those recommendations were not implemented. Meanwhile, Mary, to play devil's advocate, I mean, these terrorists are extremely, extremely cagey and extremely smart. I mean, can we ever really protect our airlines from people like these. I mean, we've heard about them bringing in box cutters. Um, and, and Matt right. talked to me about some of them having knives in plastic or something in their toilet kits. I mean, can we ever be uh, completely safe from these people? 
Yes, and we have to be. That's the important point here. We have used these excuses. I mean, you know, and I was in the government too. I've heard them that, well, if some crazy wants to be, bring down a plane, there's nothing we can do. What the nation now understands, and I hope the government understands, is we do not have a choice. United, the United States has been brought to a standstill, and people won't realize this right away, but we live on aviation traffic. Our parcels move. Even our airplanes are built on aviation traffic deliveries. Um, we will start to feel that effect very soon, and if we cannot get control of our aviation, um, we simply can't do business in the modern world and the way we are going to do that is by implementing in many cases recommendations that the government has had mm -hmm. um, sitting in the file since Pan Am 103 and, and they will have to implement. And Mary in fact when flights resume at the nation's airports passengers won't be able to check their bags at the curb in front of the terminal they'll be subjected to random checks and they will see more uniform security officers throughout the airport clearly travelers across the country will be inconvenienced by, by uh, more intense security measures. What would you say to those travelers and passengers? Well, at this point, actually, and if the government does not make this plea, um, you know, reasonable people should realize this, and that is that the government is going to be scrambling mightily, too. Um, they have never really had to fully implement all these security measures that have been recommended for years. If people don't have to travel, I would recommend that they do not. I was supposed to travel today myself, canceled all my travel plans for a couple reasons. One, uh, the government doesn't really know how to deal with this either. Their initial response was to close the airports. That's wise. They don't know where to look. They don't know if they have to start screening all of the employees to make sure they've had the proper background checks. They don't need to. They, they don't know if there are other weapons in the airports. They don't know if baggage or parcels. Uh, remember, these uh, terrorist cells in the past have have resorted to um, letters, parcels, uh, bombs in things on planes. So they're going to have to scrub the entire facilities. And uh, finally, if, if there are you know, scares in the coming days, maybe copycats, there will be disruptions in travel, so people should avoid it. But if they do travel, um, don't, uh, don't cause trouble for yourself. Don't bring anything. Don't be suspicious. Answer the questions. Don't pack knives, razors, anything at all, scissors. I mean, we've all done it accidentally. Um, and mm -hmm. that's going to be the, the really only way to get through the system. And be patient and understand that things are being done that's for right. their safety. Mary Schiavo, former FAA Inspector General, mm -hmm. thanks so much for talking with us, Mary. Thank you. Now here's Matt. Katie, the president met with his national security team this morning. He's expected to make a statement somewhat shortly. NBC's Campbell Brown is at the White House. Campbell, give me an idea of the president's schedule so far today. Well, Matt, as you mentioned, he is right now in this formal meeting of his national security team, and we will be hearing from him shortly. Uh, it is an incredible understatement to say that this is the worst crisis of his presidency, and he is focused today on meeting with his national security team to try to figure out the U.S. response. He got his very first briefing this morning in the Oval Office just after 7 a.m. from his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, and from his chief of staff, Andy Card. Just after that, he and Vice President Cheney got an update on the intelligence information that had come in overnight um, from senior intelligence officials. Publicly, what we're, we're seeing from the White House today is a real attempt to demonstrate calm, confidence, to show that they are very much in control of the situation. Privately, though, Matt, numerous senior U.S. officials are saying that the president is now facing a range of extraordinary challenges. Number one, and White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer said this morning, this really is the top priority, is getting help to those people who were hurt during the attacks. The president, Fleischer said uh, this morning, does want to visit the sites that were hit, but is going to hold off, uh, wanting to wait until uh, the rescue operations are a little further along. So he's not very disruptive. Uh, number two, the White House very much focused on implement, implementing precautionary measures to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Uh, Fleischer did say this morning that based on the intelligence information they've gathered so far, the White House does believe that the risk of further attacks has been significantly reduced, in Fleischer's words. Uh, number three, Matt, is obviously the response, uh, what it should be who these terrorists are and deciding really how strong the U.S. response should be. And finally, right. Matt, the long-term challenge to Bush of figuring out uh, how to deal with terrorism and the, and the fact that the country was so ill-equipped for this. He will be a little bit later meeting with congressional leaders, a bipartisan meeting here, a show of solidarity, and then he and the First Lady participating in a blood drive here. Again, a show of solidarity for the victims. Okay, Matt. Well, let me go back to number three on your list, and that is the response. Uh, earlier we heard from Senator Orrin Hatch that uh, he says that some communications have been picked up between supporters of Osama bin Laden 
and congratulating each other, or at least talking about the targets that were hit. Did, did that displease the White House that Senator Hatch made those comments? They have been very careful here, Matt, without making any comment uh, with regard to Senator Hatch specifically. They have been very careful publicly, White House officials, and even privately, really, the information we're getting out of here, to not comment on the intelligence reports. Most of that is coming from outside the White House, um, uh, from intelligence officials and from uh, members of Congress, uh, other senior U.S. officials. They have been extremely cautious here uh, to not give any indica indication or, or to not directly say that Osama bin Laden is the chief suspect. Yeah, for but a again, lot of reasons. I mean, they don't want to jump to any conclusions. Also, if they do have information and they plan a, a response, they don't want to show their hand. Absolutely. But at the same time, uh, senior U.S. officials who are not being as cautious say that, that all indications are he is indeed the chief suspect, that in the words of one official, they are 90 percent certain that Osama bin Laden was responsible. All right, Campbell, hang on for a second. NBC's Washington bureau chief and moderator of Meet the Press is Tim Russert, and he joins us now. Tim, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Got a question for you. If this is an act of war, in quotes, does the president need to go to Congress before he, he takes on a military response? No, it would not be an official declaration of war against a stated nation. As commander-in-chief, he could authorize a military strike. He would, co of course, consult with Congress, and he will obviously, I believe, receive unanimous support. The change in tone in Washington, Matt, in the last 24 hours is breathtaking. Uh, just yesterday morning, we were talking on the air about things like the Social Security lockbox and so forth. Remember a week ago, the president's position was that he would never tap into the Social Security Trust Fund except for a war or recession. We now have both. And I do not believe there will be any dissent in Congress if this president said, we need X billions of dollars in disaster relief for New York, and I'm tapping into the Social Security Trust Fund. We need X right. billions of dollars to launch a military strike, and we're tapping into the Social Security Trust Fund. Those days are over. In the very, for, for, at least for the most immediate time. Yeah, what about billions of dollars for missile defense, though? I mean, here we find, and we've said it already this morning, all you need is an airline ticket and an airliner to commit an act of terror. Does that make the, the subject of missile defense seem a little bit off the subject? Well, the administration was saying no, that there are two different threats, one from those kinds of missiles launched uh, by mistake or on purpose by a rogue nation, but it really does underscore that a missile defense alone is not going to protect America anymore. And you're going to see a renewed vigor uh, in Congress to provide more money for actual hands-on right. intelligence gathering. All right, Tim, let's go live to the White House right now. The president is speaking. Intelligence updates. The attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. This will require our country to unite in steadfast determination and resolve. Freedom and democracy are under attack. The American people need to know we're facing a different enemy than we have ever faced. This enemy hides in shadows and has no regard for human life. This is an enemy who preys on innocent and unsuspecting people, then runs for cover. But it won't be able to run for cover forever. This is an enemy that tries to hide, but it won't be able to hide forever. This is an enemy that thinks its harbors are safe, but they won't be safe forever. This enemy attacked not just our people, but all freedom-loving people everywhere in the world. The United States of America will use all our resources to conquer this enemy. We will rally the world. We will be patient, we will be focused, and we will be steadfast in our determination. This battle will take time and resolve, but make no mistake about it, we will win. The federal government and all our agencies are conducting business, but it is not business as usual. We are operating on heightened security alert. America is going forward, and as we do so, we must remain keenly aware of the threats to our country. Those in authority should take appropriate precautions to protect our citizens. 
But we will not allow this enemy to win the war by changing our way of life or restricting our freedoms. This morning, I am sending to Congress a request for emergency funding authority so that we are prepared to spend whatever it takes to rescue victims, to help the citizens of New York City and Washington, D.C. respond to this tragedy, and to protect our national security. I want to thank the members of Congress for their unity and support. America is united. The freedom-loving nations of the world stand by our side. This will be a monumental struggle of good versus evil, but good will prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Tim Russer, can you hear me? I can, Matt. Tim, a couple of things I jotted down. I'm sure you and Campbell also jotted down some things. Talked about an enemy that tries to hide but won't be able to hide forever, and then said, who thinks his harbors are safe, but they won't be safe forever. It seems to be a direct reference to the Taliban in Afghanistan, if indeed we find we're talking about Osama bin Laden. And this is the second time the president has said this, repeating what he said last night. Matt, the fact is, Osama bin Laden has already been indicted by the United States government. Uh, the government in Afghanistan may have some, some obligation to turn him over. Uh, this could get very, very interesting very, very quickly if the president wants to assert himself in this regard. But make no mistake about it, as we talked about before the president spoke, this president is going to get the money to help the people, help the victims in New York, but also get the money to carry on whatever military operation he wants. Well, let's talk a little bit more, Tim, about that military response. As you well know, the president's national security team is full of uh, very opinionated individuals, and they don't always agree with everything. Pentagon Secretary Rumsfeld and Condi Rice, who's the national security advisor, General Colin Powell, knowing the personalities that involved and the options that may be available, do you have any thought as to what kinds of military options they might be thinking about? The Powell Doctrine is uh, use more force than you need to carry out any operation. But he also advocates a clear exit strategy as well. Precisely. And that's what's difficult about dealing with terrorists. And this is where it gets very, very tricky. If, in fact, Osama bin Laden is in Afghanistan, in the mountains, and we demand that the Afghan government turn him over, and they say no, what do we do? Do we bomb Kabul in, in Afghanistan? Or do we try to send in troops to seek out Osama bin Laden? No one really thinks the latter is something that can be carried out. But you can make the government of Afghanistan pay a price. The second part of this, however, and this is what policymakers get paid to think about, and this is very, very dicey. Osama bin Laden is relatively popular in certain neighborhoods in the Middle East this morning. There has been a series of unrest in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and right now it's a very delicate time and a very delicate matter. If, in fact, we assert ourselves militarily, will that cause upheavals in those states which have been relatively pro-West, if you will? Or those situations that were quite rocky, and this could make even rockier. We showed videotape, as you know, of the Palestinians having a party, basically, following these attacks. Katie, over the last several weeks, there has been suggestions of near uprisings in Jordan. The head of the intelligence unit in Saudi Arabia quit without any explanation. Egypt has always teetered and has been our most loyal supporter and ally in the Arab world. Uh, and we have to be very, very conscious of this. Every pool shot the president makes, if you will, is going to be a two or three bank shot with all sorts of unintended consequences that have to be tr tried to be thought out before you do something quickly and arbitrarily. The situation, Tim, is so complex oh. every way you look. And I, I'm, I'm, over, I'm stating the obvious, but the challenges that George W. Bush is facing right now are staggering. Absolutely. If you look at just what he has said last night and repeated again this morning, he has laid out and drawn a line for our government vis-a-vis -vis terrorism. He now has to execute. And that is extremely difficult and, as you say, extremely complicated. Because unlike Pearl Harbor, we knew who the Japanese were. We knew who Saddam Hussein was when he went into Kuwait. We knew who Adolf Hitler was. 
This is something is a little bit more, as he said, a dark enemy and difficult to get our hands around. And if we're going to go after countries that, quote, harbor terrorism, it is going to be an enormous undertaking and one that it has going to have extremely significant and dangerous strategic implications. And Tim, you need support for actions like that. And at the moment, Congress is united behind him. The American people, after seeing the images that we've shown over the last day, are certainly united. But as we all know in Washington, support can be fleeting. And if he makes a decision and his advisors come up with a plan that gets U.S. troops involved and American soldiers start dying, or as Katie talked about before, retaliation occurs, how long does he have that support of the American people and of Congress? And how long does he have the support of our allies? Matt, remember after the Persian Gulf War, uh, after we had Saddam removed from Kuwait, everyone said, never again, we will stand up, we will drive him out, he'll eventually have to leave. What's happened now? We're practically alone in trying to enforce sanctions against Saddam Hussein. Yes, but Tim, at the same time, I mean, we have seen almost worldwide condemnation of this attack, and people from all corners of the world seem to be rallying behind the United States versus the coalition that had to be carefully crafted by, by George W. Bush's father, President Bush, before the, during the months leading up to the Gulf War. But, Katie, if we're going to view this, and this is what policymakers are debating this morning, as a true assault, on our democracy, on our values, on our institutions, then the response is going to have to be massive and even disproportionate. It can't just be a pinprick bombing, Sarah, there, take that, as we try to do after previous embassy bombings. And if we do have massive and disproportionate, will the rest of the world stay with us? And what happens to Pakistan, a neighbor of Afghanistan? What happens to India, both Pakistan and India, nuclear capabilities? This is enormously delicate intricate and difficult. This is why George W. Bush has now stepped into a chasm that is going to be extraordinary, which will define and make or break his presidency. And you mentioned countries like Pakistan. You know, you worry about these rogue nations that might have nuclear capabilities that you say this opens up a proverbial and very dangerous can of worms. Uh, there's no, no, no better way to say it than just that. It has totally changed the debate in Washington, the tone in Washington. Nothing has become uh, more important than this. Uh, in an interesting way, it has united Congress and the parties and the country, uh, but now comes the hard part. Yeah, Tim, let's go back to Campbell Brown at the White House. Campbell, one of the messages the president seemed to be trying to communicate in his, his comments just now is to the American people who are looking for quick revenge or quick retaliation that it's not going to come quickly. He said we've got to be patient, we have to be focused, and he talked, as Tim just mentioned, that we have to rally the world. And when he's talking about building a coalition, that takes time. Absolutely, and he's asking the American people to be patient with him. This is not a president who has so far been able to rally the world, as we've seen on his trips overseas. Uh, there has been criticism of him uh, by Europeans, by Mideast leaders, for how he has handled uh, the situation in the Mideast. Uh, obviously, right now, given what's happened, you're seeing people rally uh, around the president. But at the same time, uh, this is a long-term problem. This is not something that's going to be resolved anytime soon. And he not only has to convince the world, but keep the American people on board. And one thing the White House is very concerned about now is the image he is projecting. Uh, there have long been concerns about his ability to project sort of authority and a, a presidential air as they have worked with him on, on his speeches, on, on using a teleprompter. Now it is absolutely critical that he convey a sense of confidence that the situation is under control given what's going on. And in addition to, to planning for uh, whatever retaliation the U.S. opts to take, he has to continue to reassure the American public that this is a White House that is firmly in control of the situation, Matt. Yeah, it's gut check time. Campbell Brown at the White House. Campbell, thanks very much. Katie? All right, Matt. Many of the victims from the World Trade Center bombing or actually crashes have been sent to St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan. Mark Ackerman is the senior vice president at the hospital. He has been there all night long. Mr. Ackerman, thanks for joining us. Good morning, Katie. Good morning. Tell me what the situation is at St. Vincent's right now. Well, we've received 365 of the victims since 9 o'clock yesterday morning. Uh, in the last half hour, we've received five firefighters. These are individuals who are helping with the rescue. Um, they uh, are suffering from exhaustion. They've been on the scene more than 24 hours. They are currently uh, in our emergency room being looked at, and we are uh, working hard to make sure that they're comfortable. They have uh, um, 
respiratory problems from breathing uh, all of the concrete in the air. And uh, another phenomena we're seeing amongst the rescuers are abrasions of the eye. Uh, with all of the concrete in the air, mm. it's uh, a real problem. Mr. Ackerman, I know we heard reports earlier today that uh, some of the, I guess a couple of firefighters, I believe, were pulled from the rubble. Um, have you received any people who were actually in the rubble overnight for treatment? Uh, not this morning, Katie. Um, we did receive a number of people yesterday, severe burns and, and people that were in the rubble, uh, as well as uh, firefighters and police officers who were first on the scene and then buried in the rubble. Uh, there is no confirmation uh, that there were people pulled live out late this morning. Uh, none of the hospitals have received any of those individuals. All right. Tell me about some of the 365 victims uh, of this that you've seen. Um, ha have many of those individuals actually passed away in the hospital? Um, fortunately, only three of those individuals, uh, I'm sorry, four of those individuals have passed away since they got here. Ninety of the individuals were admitted to the hospital. And uh, of the 365 that we received, 64 of them were firefighters and police officers. Uh, we have now transferred two of our 90 uh, patients who were in the house up to the uh, burn center uptown. And uh, EMS has informed us that we should anticipate patients, uh, particularly rescue workers, throughout the day today. Thus, we uh, are still on standby with our full trauma team throughout the medical center. So you have about 90 people right now in the hospital who are being treated? That's correct. And were yeah. the most severely or critically injured the ones who were transferred? Uh, no, those were those, uh, those who were, had the worst burns. Uh, we only have one burn center here in Manhattan. Uh, they have been sent there, but we have the most critically injured people being the closest trauma center to the World Trade Center. Unfortunately, this is our second time with the World Trade Center. The most severely uh, pa uh, patients uh, have blunt trauma, uh, have had objects fall on them, severe abrasions, and uh, multiple fractures. But you say in awe when you saw 365 victims, the majority of those people were treated and released, I'm assuming. That, that's correct. And, and I think the thing that's been most challenging for our staff um, is that we have uh, been waiting for more than a thousand patients. We were told by EMS originally to expect a thousand patients. And the sad part of it is there's just that many survivors. How about staffing at the hospital, Mr. Ackerman? How are you doing along those lines? We're doing very well. We had an enormous number of people volunteer in the last few days. There was a physician's conference in the city here. We had doctors from Europe offered to help. We have uh, our own staff. We're staffed entirely now. We had an enormous number of volunteers come and help. People wanted to give blood. Neighbors are literally bringing sandwiches and coffee over for our staff. So it's been a wonderful outpouring by New Yorker, it's just like it always is in the city. Bringing out the best in people in the worst of times. Uh, Mr. Ackerman, Mark Ackerman of St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan, thanks so much and all the best to you and your entire team at the hospital. Thank you, Katie. Five minutes after the hour now, here's Matt. Katie, thanks. Two of the planes that were hijacked and then intentionally crashed took off from Logan International Airport in Boston. NBC's Chris Hansen is in Boston this morning. Chris, it appears that if there are any breaks in the investigation in the early stages, they've come there in Boston. That's exactly right, Matt. Good morning. In many terrorism cases, it appears the first and most significant leads come from vehicles that were either involved in the crime or abandoned after the crime, and such appears to be the case here. Yesterday, law enforcement authorities here in Boston got a call from a man who had flown out on a different flight, got to his location, saw what happened at the World Trade Center, and something clicked in his mind. He said that uh, he had an altercation in one of the parking garages here with, with a couple of, as he described, Arabic men. And he described the car that they had. When law enforcement authorities checked out that car, they looked inside and they saw flight manuals in Arabic. They were then able to connect that car, a four-door Mitsubishi that was rented apparently right here at the airport, to two individuals, brothers who had United Arab Emirates passports. One of those brothers is an experienced pilot. Now, I can also tell you from here today that they are looking at the possibility of three more of the hijackers uh, coming in from Canada and then flying from Portland, Maine, here to Logan Airport uh, yesterday morning. Uh, law enforcement authorities and uh, FBI sources now confirm that they believe the five of these people were actually some of the hijackers 
who took over those planes that left uh, Boston yesterday, Matt. Hey, Chris, let me ask you something. And if this is outside your area here, I apologize. But I've also heard reports that based on the names they think uh, were on those, those planes, that police are, are searching some areas in Florida, in, in Broward County. They are. Tell me about that. Well, uh, you know, it's been a little hard to get the Florida information here in Boston, but I can confirm and, and tell you that uh, based upon one of those names and because it was familiar to federal investigators, um, they did execute some search warrants in Florida. To the best of my knowledge, they have not found uh, anything too significant and are taking a look at perhaps uh, a second residence. Uh, it's not believed that the, the person, the target, may have moved. Right. But uh, they do believe that he uh, died in, uh, in the crash. Chris, uh, obviously this is a breach of security at Logan Airport where two of the planes were hijacked. Uh, is, there, is that an airport where they take pictures of everyone who passes through security? You know, you would think that that would be a good possibility, but at a briefing here yesterday, the airport authority said uh, thus far uh, they do not believe anything of significance was captured on any security cameras in the airport. They have had some problems with security here in the past. There have been some fines. Logan Airport authorities have defended their airport as being as safe as any other. But there have been problems here in the past. And you have to ask yourself, you know, was this just a matter of the terrorists being very clever, being able to sneak uh, one of these non-metallic knives on board, as we've heard? Or was there a huge breach here? Were people not paying attention at the, uh, at the security post? Yeah, it's the last line of defense at any airport. But specifically, my question is, is there a video camera pointed at the security pass-through or checkpoints that would record everybody who gets onto a plane there that day? You know, that's a good question, Matt. We were led to believe yesterday that, in fact, there was not. Uh, but we're going to have a briefing here in the next uh, couple of hours with airport authorities as well as uh, perhaps uh, federal law enforcement people, and uh, uh, we'll certainly dig into that. All right, Chris Hansen in Boston this morning. Chris, thank you very much. It was devastating enough to watch the attacks on our country unfold on Tuesday, but for many Americans, the devastation hit very close to home. Moments before jetliners were deliberately crashed, there were a series of chilling phone calls made by some victims aboard the doomed planes. Earlier this morning, I spoke with Alan Hoagland, who got one such call from her son. Yes, we got a call at about 6.45 in the morning yesterday. Uh, uh, for, the house is full of people because we just have new babies in the, in the house. A friend answered it. Carol Phipps went and, and got Mark's aunt, Kathy. Kathy spoke to him first. He told her, I love you, and she said, Mark, we love you very much, and then Kathy ran and got me, and Mark said, Mom, this is Mark Bingham, <laughs> I love you. First of all, I want to tell you guys I love you, and I, I repeated, Mark, we love you very much, and, and he said, I'm on a flight from, he identified it to Kathy as Flight 93, United Flight 93, uh, uh, from Newark, to San Francisco and the plane has been taken over by three guys, he said, who, who, uh, who say they have a bomb. And I asked him, Mark, who are these people? And he didn't hear me, didn't get the, get the question, didn't answer it, was distracted. And I, I asked the question again. I heard some commotion in the background. Uh, Mark seemed to be talking to someone else or someone was talking to him. Uh, and then the, the, the phone went dead. He told me, at some point during the conversation he was not calling me with a cell phone he was using the air phone probably at his seat uh, we know from other sources that that he was sitting in seat 4d which is a first class on uh, on this united flight I, i'm a flight attendant for united airlines as is my sister candace hoagland and mark was flying on her companion pass uh, uh, that's how they knew to contact us uh, it's Ms. Uh, Hoagland, terrible. you say you, you heard some commotion in the background. Can you describe that for me? Well, uh, the FBI uh, has asked us similar questions, asked us if, if we heard Mark mention anything beside the bomb. Uh, he made no mention of knives or box cutters or guns or, or any other weapons. He mentioned the three guys. He wasn't able to get out word about their description, who he thought they might be. I couldn't make out anything distinct from the background. I was trying hard to hear his voice, which was coming over clearly when he was speaking. He spoke uh, fairly slowly, calmly, uh, although I could tell he was under a great deal of duress. 
After the phone went dead, Ms. Hoagland, how, how long was it after that, that that you heard that indeed that plane had crashed? The call came in about 6.45. We understand that the plane crashed about 7 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And so I guess uh, probably by the time we hung up, he hung up with us or the phone went dead, it was about, about three minutes. That he had about 12 more minutes to live, I guess. Uh, we hope that Mark was able to take a proactive part in thwarting these hijackers. So we, I have hopes that he was able to. He was in a good position. He was, uh, he was forward in the aircraft, could probably be in full view of everything that was going on, probably w saw what happened in the cockpit. He was a very active, uh, take charge, assertive young man. Uh, uh, we have it from other people, uh, another man on the aircraft who called his wife, who said that they were, uh, he was, he and some other passengers were hoping to, to get at these guys somehow. So uh, this was the only flight of the four uh, that did not reach its target, which they believed to be Camp David, and that gives us reason to think that perhaps Mark was able to help save the lives of people on the ground. Yeah, there was another cell phone call made from someone who would locked himself in a rear bathroom who said that yes, we're going to have yes. to do something because it appears we're going to die either way and we have to try something. Uh, I mean, it, it appears that something heroic did take place on that I, flight. I, I certainly, I firmly believe that. Mark has been in a clinch in, other, in times past and has come through with flying colors. He's a Cal grad, uh, uh, rugby player, very assertive guy, aggressive. Uh, uh, and smart, and, and we love him very much. We're going to miss him. I can only, um, uh, you know, I think this might be a weird way to describe this, Miss Hoagland, but the phone call in some ways has to be thought of as a gift. Oh, we, we were very comforted to be able to get the news from Mark himself. Somehow it, it, it made it much easier to, to take. It's awful. It's a national time of mourning for all of us, so I'm just one of many, many people. We're, we're so touched by the words of our president, by the words of the Congress people hearing, hearing, hearing America being sung on the steps of the Capitol building. It's just profoundly moving for me. I'm, I'm delighted to see this rebirth of patriotism among the American people. We need to be strong and, and work together to overcome this hatred that's taken us over. Well, you are uh, amazingly strong given the circumstances, Ms. Hoagland, and uh, uh, our, our condolences, our sen severe and sincere condolences you. to you and your family. Our whole family appreciates it very much. We're just, I'm delighted to be able to express to the world how much we loved Mark Bingham, my son. He sounds like an amazing young man. Ms. Hoagland, thank you. Very, very brave and eloquent woman, Alice Hoagland. As the nation tries to absorb the enormity of the attacks in Washington and New York, questions turn now to the official U.S. reaction. Earlier this morning, I spoke with Secretary of State Colin Powell. Uh, total shock. I was in a meeting in Lima, Peru, with uh, President Toledo and his uh, associates when a note was handed to me, and uh, I just shouted out across the the breakfast table oh my god and then the situation got worse over the next 20 minutes as more reports came in and I immediately made plans to return to Washington before returning though I did attend briefly a meeting of the Organization of American States where 34 other total states the United States was 33 were assembled to bring into effect a new charter on democracy and we did that by by just a simple vote of acclamation and then all of the delegates stood and applauded this statement in support of democracy and to show solidarity with the American people in this time of crisis. Since my return, I've been in touch with uh, leaders around the world, with Lord Robertson in NATO, with Javier Solana in the European Union, and Kofi Annan, to make sure everybody understands that we need a worldwide, worldwide response to this assault on America because it's an assault on civilization. It's an assault on democracy. It's an assault on the world, and the world must respond as the United States plans to respond. Secretary Powell, last night the president said those who harbor these criminals will be held responsible if we believe the man behind this is in fact Osama bin Laden and that the Taliban, the ruling government in Afghanistan is harboring him. What can the United States do to actually back up the president's words? 
Well, there are many options available to us, military options, diplomatic options, further isolation of any country that might be uh, harboring uh, who is responsible. We are not yet prepared to state this morning who is responsible, but the evidence is, uh, is mounting, and uh, I think uh, it'll point us in the right direction in the not too distant future. And then we will have to not only take action on our own part, but also mobilize the world against whatever regimes may be supporting the terrorists who conducted this act. So you're saying, General Powell, that as of this morning, you cannot say that U.S. officials believe Osama bin Laden was responsible for this? Let me just say that there is uh, evidence uh, being developed now, and uh, good evidence. We will be able to make a definitive statement in due course, but I think it is best not to speculate until we do have the evidence uh, all assembled and we make an informed judgment and announcement at that time. Secretary Powell, a diplomatic response may be seem meager to many Americans who in a poll this morning said 94 percent say they would support military action in retaliation if the U.S. can identify the groups or nation responsible. Ninety-two percent said they would support it even if it meant entering a war. What is your response to that? I fully understand uh, the, uh, the views of the American people this morning. We're mad. We were assaulted. Uh, but our spirit wasn't assaulted and our fighting spirit was not assaulted, so we want to respond. You don't attack America like, America like this and get away with it. And so uh, I can assure the American people uh, that the president, if he is able to get the information uh, pinpointing who it is and where they are and get targetable information, I am quite confident that he will look at every option he has available to him to respond militarily. Along those lines, uh, is the U.S. government prepared to enter a war against these terrorists, and wouldn't that entail committing ground troops to find them, weed them out? After all, the U.S. has launched airstrikes against terrorist targets in the past, and the terrorists continue to survive, even flourish. Let's not think that one single counterattack will rid the world of uh, terrorism of the kind we saw yesterday. This is going to take a multifaceted attack uh, along many dimensions, diplomatic, military, intelligence, law enforcement, all sorts of things will have to be done to bring this scourge under control. And it is not just one organization, it's a network of organizations. We have to make the whole world understand that this is something we all have to be involved in and not just see it as a discrete response to a single incident. We'll do that. But we have to realize that terrorism has been around for a very long time and it's going to take a very long time to root it out. But what the president specifically was focusing on last night is that there are nations, there are states, there are organizations who provide havens. And these uh, states and organizations cannot be given a free ride any longer. And a uh, major part of our diplomatic effort will be to mobilize the international community against the actions of such states and organizations once we have a clear understanding of who is responsible for this and who might have been giving them haven. Do you think this was an individual cell of terrorists, or do you believe this could be state-sponsored? In other words, could Iraq or a country like that have been involved in this? I, I just don't know at this point, and I'd rather not speculate. I'm sure as the evidence mounts, we will have a better idea of, one, who is directly responsible, and two, what kind of support they may have been receiving from outside that cell, outside that network, from either state, spot, state organizations or other types of uh, terrorist organizations, but I'd uh, think it best we not speculate too wildly at this point. The U.S. spends billions of dollars on intelligence. Was this, in your view, a massive intelligence failure, as it has been called? I wouldn't characterize it uh, that way. We spend many, many billions of dollars on intelligence, and that intelligence uh, allows us to thwart many attacks. There are many terrorist attacks that never took place because of the fine work of our intelligence and law enforcement. Uh, experts, but in this case, we did not get the uh, the cueing we needed. We did not get the intelligence information needed to predict that this was about to happen or be aware of uh, uh, of this kind of event coming our way. Um, so I think it's premature to call it an intelligence failure. Uh, let's see what we might have picked up as we go back and do the post mortem on how this all came about. Would you agree with your former colleague, General Schwarzkopf, that we need to emphasize human intelligence uh, as much as technical intelligence? And we've got all the technological toys that, that can be used for our, those purposes, but what we need are real thinking, seeing people on the ground to infiltrate <coughs> these groups. Absolutely, but it's easier said than done. Um, and we do have to emphasize human intelligence because uh, you can defeat 
electronic intelligence just by not emitting. So human intelligence is very, very important. And I know that our intelligence uh, community is uh, very aware of that. But these are also difficult activities to penetrate and to be able to stay within such a network for a long period of time. But certainly this will be looked at as we review everything we're doing in the field of intelligence. If we do engage uh, in, an, in another country or take military action, what are the ramifications? In other words, if an Islamic fundamentalist group was responsible, what kind of uh, retaliation might we, we expect and what kind of access do they have, these groups, to weapons of mass destruction? Well, let me not uh, speculate as to what we might do. I think a uh, full range of options will be available, and I know that the Secretary of Defense and his colleagues are looking at that. Um, it all depends on where we run this to ground as to what counterattack we might receive from uh, those who are responsible. But at this time, it's premature to start speculating or to identify them as Islamic fundamentalists. Let's just identify them as a terrorist group uh, that can have no religious underpinning, no, no legitimate underpinning for this kind of action. This is murder, which is against the tenets of every, every religion, every responsible religion that uh, is in the world, and it is receiving condemnation from around the world from people of all faiths and, and religious backgrounds. So let's just view them as what they are, terrorist organizations. Uh, and I cannot speculate whether they might have access to the kinds of weapons you've discussed, because we don't know exactly who it is yet, but we'll be on guard for that. Secretary of State Colin Powell, the question on everyone's mind, how could these attacks happen? Michael Hirschman is president of Decision Strategies, a crisis management consulting firm which provides security to corporations around the world. Michael Hirschman, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. You know, everybody has noted how unbelievably well coordinated these attacks were. Did that surprise you, that aspect? No, it didn't. Uh, they are quite capable of putting together teams uh, and training them over long periods of time to accomplish their mission. I would estimate that uh, in order to pull off what they did yesterday, they were probably in training for well over a year. Do you think that they were able to convince people on the ground or at least plant some of their colleagues in positions uh, with the airlines to assist them I in this endeavor? certainly wouldn't discount that. Um, we know that they have uh, a lot of support, not a lot of support, but uh, uh, much support here in the United States. Uh, they have cells here, and uh, some of the planning had to have been done on the ground here by associates of theirs. People are also asking this morning and all day yesterday, how could this happen here in the United States? And I think it's, it's pretty clear security in this country. We have an open society, as many people have remarked, and security in general is pretty lax, would you say? Well, I'll take off my security consultant hat and put on my uh, passenger hat because I fly all the time. I'm sure you do as well. We both walk through those metal detectors and we see our baggage going through the x-rays and we wonder why the people really aren't paying attention, the security personnel. Why aren't they watching? Why are they standing around and kind of joking or, or looking at the, the ceiling? They're paid probably minimum wage. Well, I mean, they're very low paid employees. That's part of the problem, uh, the training and, and pay and the turnover of those employees. So you are president of a crisis management that provides security to corporations all over the world. If you were in charge, if you were king, so to speak, what kind of changes would you implement, say, at, at airports across this country? Well, changes have to come even before then. We have got to have a far more proactive approach to dealing with uh, these sorts of uh, terrorists and these uh, terrorist act activities. In the past, we have been governed essentially by a policy of rule of law. That's what our country is about. It doesn't work with these people. So we have to start first by penetrating these organizations, either through uh, human resources or through uh, electronic surveillance, better than we have done in the past. Better, but as you say, that's easier said than done because you were agreeing with what General Powell had to say, and they have their own counterintelligence units within these cells. Well, they do, and they know our capabilities. They know what our sol satellites are capable of doing and what our other electronic surveillance can do, and so they have the resources to put in place uh, counterintelligence and counter surveillance measures. Uh, here domestically, though, we have got to get ser uh, serious about security. It seems to me that every time a, uh, an incident like this occurs, and of course we've never had one th quite this serious, but where we have security breaches in the past, uh, everyone pays attention for a couple of months. And then we become complacent again, and that's what's happened. We've be become far too complacent in our security procedures at the airports. So? 
So it's time to pay uh, more attention, to pay better uh, wages to these people, better, better training, equipment? better equipment, and a higher degree of professionalism. Now, that's going to have an impact on us because uh, it's not going to be as easy as it has been in the past uh, to get through uh, security. There may be some delays involved, but I think we have to, uh, safety and security has to come first. When you envision your company or envision terrorist scenarios taking place on the domestic front, did you ever consider this kind of action? I mean, most of us feel that this is something in a Tom Clancy novel or in a summer blockbuster. Did you, was this ever within the realm of possibilities? No, it was not. In fact, in recent years, we've been concentrating on the possibility of a biological or chemical or even nuclear attack by these rogue terrorists. We had not really considered the hijacking of an aircraft and a suicidal mission like this. So is there any way, I mean, obviously some of the things you recommend, it's a long process. And Americans are nervous today. Without sounding alarmist, I mean, is there anything that, that can be done to protect U.S. citizens from further attacks involving innocent civilians? Well, first and foremost, we have to deal with the source of these attacks. We have got to go after these terrorists where they live and with most extreme measures send a very strong message to these folks that uh, we'll, we'll not be complacent here, we'll not lie back and wait to be victims. Uh, secondly, um, everyone in this country is going to have to be more observant. They're really going to have to use their eyes and ears to help us in the security profession, those in the law enforcement profession, uh, determine what's going on. Are you worried about, and I can see this coming, obviously, a backlash? Uh, because uh, I know many Arab Americans and many uh, people who are Islamic, seven million, Richard Holbrook mentioned here in the United States alone, may be in danger of facing reprisals unfairly. Uh, would you caution people against uh, drawing or, or coming to snap conclusions as a result of someone's ethnicity? Katie, it would be very unfortunate. What we're dealing with here in, these, in terms of these terrorists are criminals. Uh, these people, that, uh, the, uh, tend to be uh, uh, interested in, in the Koran, but the fact of the matter is there's nothing in their religious background, in their religious philosophy or history that dictates the slaughter of, uh, of civilians. So we're dealing with a small group of fanatics who basically are deranged criminals, and we shouldn't take it out on the rest of the Islamic uh, or Muslim population. And in closing, are you shocked that, it, that apparently on four airlines, these individuals were able to board the airline and do this and, and apparently save for the parking lot where, where that car was found at Logan Airport in Boston, but it, they didn't seem to raise many eyebrows, any eyebrows. And I don't understand quite how they smuggled these pseudo knives on board. They may have been made of a composite material that allowed them to get them through the x-ray machines. But I would bet uh, uh, that uh, they had associates here that tried it before and found that it could be done uh, in order to uh, set up what happened yesterday. Well, Michael Hirschman, thanks very much for being here. I know you've waited a long time here in our studio, right. so we really, appreci we really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks Thank a you. lot. 30 minutes after the hour now, here's Matt. Katie, we have some figures coming in from Washington and the Pentagon. And if there is such a thing as good news in this story, this perhaps can be seen as some good news. For the last several hours, we've been telling you that Pentagon officials were estimating that up to 800 people died when American Airlines Flight 77 deliberately was crashed into that building. The new estimates coming from the Pentagon officials are that about 100 military and civilian personnel were killed in the attack against the Pentagon. According to officials, about 50 Navy 50 Army and seven defense intelligence officials are believed to be dead. Notification of family members has already begun. However, they do warn that an exact number won't be known until the investigation is completed. That could take upwards of a week. Switching back to New York City and the World Trade Center disaster, Jason Holmes is a broker for the Aon Corporation, which employs more than 1,000 workers on the upper floors of Tower No. 2. He was on the 103rd floor of Two World Trade Center when the first terror attack took place. Jason, good to have you here. Thanks, Ron. Let's just be sure we understand this. Tower number two, which was the second tower to be hit, but the first tower to collapse. Well, that's correct. You're on the 103rd floor sitting at your desk. What's the first you realized that something was terribly wrong? 
Well, I guess I heard a noise on the lights flickered and the computer flickered and um, I heard people screaming so I went out in the hallway and looked out the window and saw the One World Trade Center on fire and paper flying everywhere. So a woman I work with told everybody to start going down the stairs and we did. We got down to about the 80th floor and I, th I think that's when I heard um, the loudspeaker come on and they said it was an isolated incident in One World Trade Center and we could all return to our offices. So now if you had, if you had heeded that announcement and turned around and gone back up to your desk some 20 floors above. I guess I wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. You continued down. Did, every, did most down. people continue down I the stairwell? I think most people were pretty frightened, so we kept going down. You said there was screaming, panic? Yeah, um, at the very beginning it was a lot of panic and a lot of people started asking people to calm down and then it got pretty orderly. And it's a lot of stairs to climb down, so everybody was just going down as fast as we could. It's hard to estimate exactly where the plane hit tower number two, but it must be uh, about the 70th or 80th floor. What was it like in the stairwells when you reached the point of the building where the impact had occurred? Well, I think it was pretty close to where it occurred because we heard a l loud noise and um, the walls started caving in and cracking and people were, it was quite frightening. Um, we just kept on moving down, but for quite a few floors underneath you just saw the cracks going down the walls and uh, I guess it took almost a half an hour to get out of the building. When you got down people were telling you get away from the building weren't yeah, they? Yeah, the um, police and emergency people were asking us to get away from the building and leave the city actually. And not to look up? And not to look up and... Which of course most people would. I certainly did and that was on. Um, I think that's when I first felt the terror that you know I was right there in that building and saw all that that was happening. We um, tried to move away and we were going, to, they were pushing us towards the water and then um, we were, I was with a friend, a colleague who, his fiance worked with us and we were trying to find her. She was the on the 105th floor? 105th floor. With a, in a meeting with um, about 10 other colleagues and she's the only one that we know of that got out of that meeting. How far were you away from the building when it collapsed? We were um, cl close to the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, we had gone actually back towards the building looking for, for Jen and um, then we saw the building start to collapse and started, saw the clouds coming and we started to run over the bridge. You had to look at the building and, and kind of pinpoint where you had been sitting only moments earlier and yeah. just what was your reaction when you saw that part of the building disappear and head for the ground? I was praising God that I was out. I prayed the whole way down and um, thank, you know, praying for all the people that I work with that I don't know where they were. It was just, I think I was thinking more of them and praying that they were going to be okay than anything else. Yeah, about a thousand employees of the Aon Corporation. I know you want to just give a quick phone number for people yeah, who are um, looking for loved ones. There's a number to call for the Aon employees and their families. It's 866-256-4154. And um, you can call that number and they're very helpful there to help locate people if anybody's called in friends and family. I know uh, your apartment is fairly close to yeah, I haven't trade. been able to get home yet, so I've borrowed some clothes to come out here today. Well, Jason, we're happy you're all, you're all right. Thank you. There is no official count of the injured from Tuesday's terrorist attacks here in New York City in Washington and outside of Pittsburgh, but the American Red Cross is mobilizing its efforts to assist victims in all cities. Frank Donahue is part of the American Red Cross disaster res response team. Frank, good morning. Good to see you again. Good morning, Matt. What, what exactly happens when something like this occurs, when you get the first word? How do you mobilize? Uh, immediately, it's certainly here in New York, the Greater New York Red Cross worked closely with emergency management, was on the scene right away as we were a number of years ago during the, the other bombing at the World Trade Center. When I arrived yesterday around noon, um, I got very close to the World Trade Center and Red Cross operations were already in place. We were in, in the midst of feeding and helping firefighters, being a place where people could go when they evacuated buildings and neighbors and directing people to safety primarily. Um, last night, putting up shelters, about 13 shelters in lower Manhattan, as well as feeding about 10,000 firefighters um, and emergency workers throughout the night. I know it's important for you when you get a team on site to understand the lay of the land and understand what you're dealing with in some strange way did the disaster in 1993, the bombing of the World Trade Center, prepare you for the logistics you'd face in this one? The American Red Cross has uh, clearly been getting ready, if you will, and being prepared for whatever kind of disaster of terrorism, for example, that America might face. And that's much a part of our disaster preparation, has been for a number of years, and certainly 
Oklahoma City got us ready. What, what about getting facilities to the location? The, the bridges were basically closed. A lot of the roadways were closed. The roadways that weren't closed were jammed with emergency vehicles. How'd you get the, the forces to the scene? I got in from Philadelphia uh, very quickly and, and other Red Cross workers from around the country. We had about a thousand volunteers right here from Greater New York, Red Cross, that were on the scene and a lot of supplies at the Red Cross in here in Greater New York as well. So um, those folks were already on, on place. Another big piece of it is what Jason's kind of going through today and so many of us are facing is the whole mental health piece. The, how do we help people deal with uh, what they're going through? And we have volunteers not only here in New York, but at LAX and at Boston and at Reagan Just Airport. Just circulating? I mean, are they, are they looking to talk to people? Are they we waiting mental for health people to approach certified them? Certified trained mental health workers, all licensed mental health workers that are working through the Red Cross and all those chapters and, and all those areas helping people kind of deal with what we're all dealing with today when we hear stories like Jason's and so many others. We've been talking to officials at St. Vincent's Hospital and some other hospitals in the area. They are saying that blood is a concern, especially we have to keep in mind that because planes are not flying, some of the blood that's in other cities that could help here in New York and Washington not getting in. What's the situation right now? The American Red Cross has about 50,000 units of blood on standby that can come into New York at a moment's notice when they need the blood right now. As you've indicated, not many folks have made it to the hospitals for needing those kinds of transfusions. Um, we're asking people to give blood, to call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. Um, this should be a reminder to all of us that the blood supply in New York and in the East Coast, the most populated part of our country, is always low. And this is a reminder to all Americans that this is a duty that all of us have to give the gift of life, and it's a great opportunity to do that. Let me give that number one more time. Again, the number for donating blood to the American Red Cross is 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. Uh, there's also another number here that for the New York City region. You can call 1-800-692-5663. Frank Donahue, the American Red Cross. Jason Holmes, thank you both very much. Thanks, man. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you very much. On the investigative front, there's some interesting information coming from NBC's Carrie Sanders. Uh, Carrie tells us that FBI agents this morning carted away eight to ten boxes of records from the Venice Flying School in Venice, Florida. According to a bookkeeper at the Flying School, agents interviewed people there for about three hours. And this bookkeeper tells NBC News that from July of last year through January, of this year, two Arab men took classes to get their commercial flight rating. Both students said they were cousins. They gave their home address as a street in Hamburg, Germany, and the photos of both students uh, have been confiscated by the FBI. For a short period of time, they lived with uh, Charlie and Drew Voss. Drew says she kicked them out after about a week because they were rude. She said that both men claim they were German. One whose name was Atta said his name was Otto. They purchased a car while in Venice, Florida, and used the boss address, even though they didn't live there anymore. And school officials say they stayed to themselves and did not mingle with the other students. So again, FBI agents have carted away eight to ten boxes of records from a flying school in Venice, Florida. Meanwhile, no one knows yet how many people were killed in the attack on the World Trade Center here in New York. The southern part of Manhattan has been closed to everything but emergency personnel. NBC Soledad O'Brien is at a makeshift trauma center set up at Chelsea Piers on the Hudson River. Soledad, good morning. And good morning to you, Katie. And actually, at this hour, the Chelsea Piers has now been shut down as a triage center. What they've decided to do instead is to basically facilitate the sending out of the doctors and the nurses and the medical personnel, the volunteers who come here. So they come here, they check in, they're registered. But inside, the doctors tell us it is this ominous silence. Of course, hundreds of beds set up to treat patients that they expected would be coming in overnight. Those beds set up on basketball courts, the beds set up in the studios that are here at the Chelsea Piers. No patients have come in. That is not a good sign. They've decided to shut it down as a triage center, basically use it as an organizational center. In addition, here they are accepting clothes and food and and water and also we are told that this will be the location of a secondary morgue the primary morgue of course over at the coroner's office on the far east side we're on the west side uh, the doctors as we mentioned had been told some of them this morning not to come because there are just not enough patients there are no patients to treat in fact the doctors say the only people they're seeing are other doctors and other medical personnel it is a uh, in their estimation 
Just a really ominous sign of what is to come, meaning that there are not many injured being brought in as they expected. They thought that they would be treating hundreds of wounded. They are not seeing that at all, and they are really at this point expecting the worst case scenario. So that's what's happening here at Chelsea Piers, which has now been shut down as a triage center, really just an operational heart for the city's medical personnel at this time. So Katie? Soledad, the doctors and nurses and medical personnel who report that report there rather will be dispatched to other locations where they may be needed. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, they're using a lot of the city buses that they're not using around the city, and the city streets are uh, West Side Highway, of course, not that quiet because the ambulances are lined up and down. But the other city streets, as we walked here, nobody's on the streets. So many of the city buses are actually, we see them come in, they drop off medical students, nurses, doctors, a lot of, a lot of them carrying those orange boxes, which are essentially these mobile surgery kits. There are some 200 tables inside, each one ready to go for a surgeon who could provide surgical uh, experience for a patient. Again, no patients at this hour mm. to treat. So they reported to duty anxious to help, and sadly, tragically, there was no one to help, but perhaps there will be at other locations throughout the city. Soledad, thanks so much. 42 minutes after the hour, now here's Matt. All right, Katie, thank you very much. CNBC's Ron Insana covers the markets and was at the World Trade Center when one of the towers collapsed. Ron, good morning again. Good, good morning, to have Matt. you here. Let, let's just try and make people understand what types of companies are there, how big a presence many companies had in both of those towers. Give me a rundown if you can. Well, there are uh, financial firms, brokerage houses uh, like Cantor Fitzgerald, like Morgan Stanley, which was the largest single tenant in the World Trade Center. There are insurance companies. There are actually Chinese trading outfits. There were doctor's offices, law firms, uh, a whole host of firms that handle what they call back office activity for Wall Street, the processing of trades, clearing and settlement, the type of paperwork that goes along with the vast securities trading apparatus that's in lower Manhattan. Uh, before I get to what is, I think, one of the most disturbing pieces of information that, that I know you have, um, and this may seem superficial at the moment, the, the records kept in those companies' computers and files, um, these are personal financial records. They have been obviously lost. Yep. Uh, now, many firms back up their systems uh, in the financial community and have off-site uh, a whole host of uh, computer support uh, operations that can generally be used during times of stress. We don't know necessarily that that's the case for a lot of these firms, but they try to back up everything they have in one way or another. One company you mentioned a second ago, Cantor Fitzgerald. What kind yep. of firm was that? Uh, it's a broker-dealer, uh, very active in NASDAQ stocks, uh, had 850 people in the tower. Um, as of this moment, they have been able to locate three survivors among the 850. Um, Cantor had a, a rather large presence. They were on the 85th floor or thereabouts. Uh, so they were close to uh, the most critical area in the building. The area of impact. Yes. And that's, that's an astonishing number. And, and hopefully that is because communications have been a problem. Absolutely. And people are in places where they aren't supposed to be and haven't contacted uh, work or loved ones yet, but you're saying three of 850. I talked to a senior executive at Cantor just a few moments ago, and that is the current number with which they are working. Now, they have also been having some difficulty with their phone system and asked to share another number uh, that relatives of Cantor Fitzgerald employees can call. I think I asked them to make a graphic of this yep. number. Okay, let's put that up if we can. I'll begin to tell it, and if it comes, to, it comes to this area code 203. This is in the Darien, Connecticut offices of Cantor Fitzgerald, 203-662-3600. Uh, so that is 203-662-3600 for relatives of, of employees of Cantor Fitzgerald and the uh, World Trade Center. They can call that number. It's a rollover line. They will get picked up. They will not get the busy signals that have been plaguing communication so far this morning. When, when we talk about markets in this country being closed, Ron, are they closed because technically they can't open, or are they closed because of the, the solemn nature of this incident? I, I suspect there's a little of both. Uh, we were getting hints from the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, that there might be an announcement later today that trading will resume tomorrow. I have not yet been able to confirm that. I spoke with the head of the New York Stock Exchange earlier this morning, and the expression that they're using right now is as soon as possible. The exchanges and the regulators are meeting to determine whether or not, you know, the systems, as far as we know, are functional. Um, but they're trying to determine the appropriate time at which to open the markets, possibly tomorrow or thereafter. All right. CNBC's Ron and Sana. Ron, thanks very much thanks, as Matt. always. Now here's Katie. All right, Matt. Thank you very much. NBC's Kerry Sanders is in Florida with some interesting developments that I just told you about. Kerry, can you elaborate on, on these boxes from this flying school that the FBI has apparently seized? Well, they've taken all of the records from the flying school, the records that 
basically fit the dates when these two men were attending there, which would have been July of last year to January of this year. Uh, it's the records not only of the uh, two men, and you mentioned their names, but I'll repeat them, Mohammed Atta, and I'll probably mess up this last name, but the other student who was attending at the same time who lived with Mohammed Atta and said that he was his cousin, Marwan al Shahi. Anyway, the FBI took the uh, records of all the folks at the school there, including their pictures of all the students there, and uh, are now going through it. They spent about three hours talking to the representatives of the school there, trying to find out as much as they could, discovering that these men came to the school and did not know how to fly. They first got their private pilot's license, and then they continued working straight through to becoming uh, commercial pilots. Now, the training that they got at the Venice Flying School is not the type of training that would train them to fly a 757 or a 767. They would be trained on multi-engine, but not jets, but rather on turboprops. Mm -hmm. They graduated with that turboprop rating. Um, according to uh, one of the bookkeepers there, they never had a problem paying their bills. They paid with checks, and it cost about 25000 per student, and uh, money was never an issue. Meantime, on the east coast of Florida, because that's on the west coast, on the east coast of Florida, in Coral Springs, the FBI went to an apartment that at one time the FBI believes Muhammad Atta lived in. Uh, they were in there. They were there for much of the evening last night, leaving at around 11 o'clock last night. They have not returned. Um, but uh, they did apparently enter the apartment and took two, at least two boxes out of there. And I'm understanding right now from one of our camera crews that's at a different location that they have seen in the Hollywood, Florida area, FBI agents at an apartment complex taking some boxes of evidence out of a different location. And at that location, it's believed that uh, Muhammad Atta and others may have frequented. But we're still trying to get a little bit more information on that information down in Hollywood, Florida. But clearly, the FBI is focusing a fair amount of attention on Muhammad Atta, who sources tell us they believe was on the plane and died in the uh, suicide plane Hijacking. Yeah, well, what, what led FBI agents to Venice, to Coral Springs, and, and to, where was it, Hollywood in the first place? Well, it, it's a pretty simple thing. Apparently, the FBI agents got the passenger manifest, and when they got the manifest to who was on these planes, and I'm sorry I can't tell you which plane they believe he was on of the four planes, but when they got the passenger manifest, they saw this name, and they, it just it put a flashbulb off because the name is a name that previously had been linked to possible terrorist activity. Huh. So when they saw his name, they said, we need to find out more about this person. And that's why they geared up the FBI agents in the field immediately. And they located him in, uh, in South Florida and, again, over on the west coast of Florida in Venice. Were they, were, were they surprised, Carrie, that he wasn't traveling under an assumed name? Uh, I think they are. But uh, clearly, from what the indications are at this point, um, you know, the, these terrorists uh, are not hiding, uh, you know, after the fact or anything like that. I mean, it, I think that uh, one of the agents told me that what he believes is that they wanted to leave this trail. And, and meanwhile, they did spend seven months at this flying school in Venice, according to these records. And although they were not trained to fly jets, do people believe that what they learned there was easily transferable to, say, a 757 or a 767? Actually, no. They don't say that it's easily transferable because it's such a different type of uh, jet. But mm. nonetheless, they got that initial training in, in Venice, Florida. Whether, they're, whether their training continued elsewhere, uh, you know, you have to assume it took place somewhere else. Where they learned it, though, at this point, I don't know, and the FBI hasn't told us. All right. Kerry Sanders, interesting development down in, in several places in Florida. Kerry, thanks so much for talking with us. Sure. It is uh, 10 minutes uh, before the hour. Now here's Matt. All right, Katie, thank you. Clifton Cloud shot some home video of the attack on the World Trade Center. Harry Crosby was on his way to work at Merrill Lynch at the World Financial Center just across the street. Guys, good morning to both of you. Good morning. Clifton, I want to roll the video that you shot. You were using your home video camera, getting ready for a joyous occasion, your, your son going to pre-preschool, and you captured that shot right there. How far away from the building were you? I was probably about a mile away, and um, I, didn't, I didn't even realize that the second explosion oh was going on. It was oh just, just a, a quick, sharp blast of white light. 
orange, and then the sound, the shockwave hit a few minutes later. What did you think when you were shooting the initial explosion, when you were shooting just the tower that had been hit first? Did you think it had been an accident? Did you think there was terrorism? What, what was going through your mind? I, I, at first, I did think that it was, it was either an accident or, honestly, you know, in, in the city, I thought it might have been a film, you know, some effect, something draped over the building or something. It was so surreal that I just I couldn't imagine that it was an accident. And it was while you were shooting that that the second plane came into view. And as you say, you really didn't even realize what you had captured. What was your response when you went back and looked carefully at the tape? I, I thought about um, where, that, where the plane hit was right about in the 60s floor where, where one of my company's largest clients is. And I thought about the people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis that we know. And um, I realized, my God, that's, that's their, their floors, their area. You continued to roll and stood there for a while, I know, and also captured the pictures of Tower Number 2 collapsing. Uh, you've been in New York for a long time, and you remember the, the Trade Center bombing back in 1993. And I know most New Yorkers and Americans in general were proud to know that those buildings stood. When you saw that building collapsing, what went through your mind? I really thought that this was a uh, this was something I could never possibly imagined. I remember thinking that it'll be interesting to look at these buildings damaged in the future and, and the thought of that building actually coming down and knowing that area so well and knowing how many people are around uh, I was really uh, my feelings my heart went out for the people who live and work down there and a lot of people who we know uh, you know on a daily basis through work so it was uh, absolute uh, there was a real human face on on that building uh, going down. Harry, you were walking toward work. The first impact had already taken place, and as the second one took place, an interesting phenomenon. I mean, you found yourself, like so many other people, instead of repelled, walking away from the building, almost drawn to get closer. Yes. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it, it sounds not intelligent uh, now, but at the time I was very much drawn close. I think people were milling around the building. Um, my first thought was to actually get to my place of work to check on everybody. Um, I saw a lot of familiar faces from both Lehman Brothers uh, that's right next door to, uh, to uh, my place of work at Merrill and a lot of people from Merrill walking uh, the other way um, uh, voluntarily evacuating uh, uh, their buildings. Um, uh, but a lot of people stood around and no one really challenged the integrity or the strength of both those buildings. I think everybody thought that they would stay up. Uh, clearly uh, it looked like an act of terrorism this wasn't random. I did see this. I didn't see the first uh, impact, but I certainly saw the second one. I was on the other side, so I didn't really see the, the complete hit, but the damage that was done. Um, uh, there were a lot of news crews. There were par paramedics, firemen, um, police um, running aggressively towards both those buildings. Again, not questioning the fact that uh, they might be putting themselves in, in, uh, in peril or in danger. And as we now know, it's, it's so many of those firefighters and police officers and EMS technicians who were immediately in the area who may not have survived when Tower Number 2 came down. There, there's a, a horrible image of, of what you saw above the area of impact when the fire began to force people to the uppermost floors of the tower. That's right. Um, I think I think what had happened in the area of impact, uh, these planes were fully loaded with fuel and there was an incredible amount of heat that was being generated uh, at that area. You could see the flames and the intensity of the flames there um, and, and very, very thick smoke above that. And I think people were driven further north, could not, or further, uh, further higher in, in the building. Is this in tower below. number, the northernmost tower? Yes. My, my view was uh, we were, most of us, on the, on the west side highway, and, and the first view was really the northernmost tower, which went down last. And um, uh, people were, were forced up and, um, and were jumping. They were forced, really, to either face heat uh, or smoke inhalation uh, or jump. And and, and you, you get the impression these people were not falling. They were, they, this wasn't some injury that was causing them to fall off the building, that there was some conscious decision here because you've described and other people have described that in some cases these people were jumping in pairs, in threes. Yes, yes, they, were, they, uh, they had made a decision um, to, to, take, uh, to take that approach, and uh, I think they, they knew that they, they, uh, they were gone that there really was no other choice. There and are some terrible photographs in, in some of the, and I, and I want to warn people before we put these up, 
that you know you may want to turn away for a second but there are some photographs in the New York newspapers this morning first is from the New York Times well this one is actually um, yeah from the New York Times and you can see what Harry was talking about the smoke probably is just above where the area of impact is and you can see just dozens of people getting to the windows and, and probably realizing at this point that the chance for rescue on those floors was very slim. I think it was impossible for those people to get to get out uh, of their of their offices, and um, and it was uh, you know, while people were repelled by it, they they were they they, they couldn't pull themselves away, and people, uh, many many people witnessed this. Can can you even estimate how many people you saw jumping off that building? Uh, I. I would say there were, there were at least that I could see uh, count 50 people at least, um, and, and perhaps as many as 100 people jumped. Again, a, a picture from uh, one of the New York newspapers this morning. You have to wonder if the people in that tower, which again was the second tower to collapse, had seen or heard the first tower go down, and that perhaps forced them to make the decision they made, that they didn't want to go down with the building. Yes, I, I don't. Uh, I, I can't imagine what were in their minds. Um, but everybody on the ground, again, did not expect. Did not. Uh, there was a, a. There was really much more calm than one would expect uh, before the first building collapsed. I think at the time the first building collapsed, uh, then people were were clearly evacuated. Police were pushing people north. But at that time, I think up until then they were making uh, space for. EMS and uh, and police and, and firemen to actually get access very close to the area. A strange part of the story, Harry, you called me yesterday afternoon and told me what happened and you said that earlier in your life you had actually seen the result of someone jumping off a building. I was, uh, yeah. stayed with you for a long time. Yeah, yeah. it was, it took uh, three weeks to to kind of clear clear my head and, and this is uh, this is something that for many of us uh, that work down there is a life-changing experience. Um, I mean, many of my colleagues uh, saw exactly what I saw. And Clifton, as, as a, a longtime New Yorker, how, how do you deal with the image as you wake up this morning and you continue to wake up on days to come and you look at the tip of Manhattan and those two towers are no longer there? Well, uh, you know, I realized in looking at the paper today that what I thought was debris falling from the building was, was probably people jumping because uh, from my vantage point I could see what looked like debris. And I realize now that it, that it was people, and I think that uh, you know that that's a whole other element to uh, to this disaster. Uh, but I I really do I do believe that um, you know it shows the strength of, of New Yorkers not to not to give up. We're not going to go down. Well, I, I, as I said, you were beginning the day hoping to capture some pictures of your son going to pre preschool, a joyous occasion. Instead, you captured something probably far more dramatic. I hope you went home and, and hugged your son, Clifton. I did. I absolutely did. And, uh, and my wife. <laughs> Clifton, thanks for sharing your story with us. Harry, thank you very much. Thanks, and of course, man. we're happy that both of you are all right. And uh, our hearts and prayers go out to so many families and so many people who it looks like are not all right. We're back right after this. Something else just hit. A very large plane just flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. A second airplane, a 727, just rammed into the building. Right now, there's a huge case and hole in one of the towers, and the other building is on fire. We are back at noon Eastern time, 9 Pacific, in the aftermath of the worst terror terrorist attack in history, not just on U.S. soil, but anywhere in the world. The last terrorist attack that had that dubious distinction was an explosion aboard India Air, November 13, 1996. 349 people on board that plane were killed. But here are some of the numbers already. 266 passengers and crew members above the, aboard those four airlines that were hijacked. So far, about 107 people are presumed dead at the Pentagon, but that is not a complete number. There may be many, many more because initial reports with were that there were as many as 800. And needless to say, hundreds of people are still missing. Thousands of people have been treated in area hospitals here in New York who were in or around the World Trade Center when the planes crashed into the building or when the two towers came crumbling down. 
I'm Katie Couric along with Matt Lauer and we are still completely stunned, stunned by this turn of events. You've been talking about some of the, the physical damage that took place because of this several pronged attack and the deaths in Washington and the deaths here at the World Trade Center and the deaths outside of Pittsburgh which we shouldn't forget we haven't talked as much about this morning but then there is the other element of terrorism and that is the emotional damage and as people wake up and and look at the forever now changed skyline of New York City and and imagine how our lives are going to be forever changed and some of the freedoms we take for granted we may no longer be able to take for granted because we'll have to take more precautions. Well, it's a day that lived in Those planes have been taken to two hotels near the airport where they're meeting with grief counselors at this hour and airline personnel uh, trying to learn any news of, of their relatives. Matt? All right, George, thanks very much. George Lewis at LAX. And just to reiterate, the FAA has extended the flight ban indefinitely. Earlier they said they'd lift it by about noon today. Now it is an indefinite flight ban or ground hold. Katie? All right, Matt, thanks very much. Meanwhile, NBC's David Bloom is in lower Manhattan monitoring the painstaking rescue efforts. David, are they making any progress down there? Well, Katie, they are slowly, ever so slowly. I know you can't see me right now, but we wanted to show you this picture of what's going on here. We are four stories up about six blocks north of the World Trade Center, and you're looking at one of the cars, what remains of one of the cars just moments ago pulled out of what's left of the World Trade Center. Now, as I say, we're about six blocks north of where the World Trade Center used to stand, and we wanted to come up here because these are such chilling and yet dramatic pictures. If we push off into the distance, and keep in mind right now we're on a rickety four-story fire escape, you can see what is left of the number two tower of the World Trade Center, the first to collapse. You can see the cranes that they're now working on to try to remove the debris. And the greatest concern that the firefighters, the police, and the other rescue workers have told us about this morning is their concern that other buildings surrounding this area will collapse. That is why the rescue effort is proceeding so gingerly. Here in lower Manhattan right now, you have, in addition to the firefighters and the police and the other emergency personnel, you've got a number of National Guard troops from here in New York deployed. If we pan down again, you'll probably be able to see the troops mixed in with the relief workers. If you'll notice, most of the relief workers are wearing the masks because the debris has been spewing out even now more than 24 hours, of course, after the first explosion. Still a very precarious situation here in lower Manhattan. As to the death toll, we still frankly don't know. Mayor Giuliani came out this morning, held a news conference, said that they still expect the death toll to go into the thousands, but as yet, the casualties number only in the 40s in terms of those actually known dead. We do know that at least three people, perhaps more, but we know of at least three people pulled out of the rubble, still alive, two police officers, as well as a fire department official who was rescued early this morning. But that is it as far as the rescues that we're aware of. And again, this vantage point, Katie, should allow you to see the magnitude of the operation that's going on here. Again, six blocks looking south. Obviously, all the streets shut off. Obviously, all the markets closed. Obviously, all business activity in this area completely ceased. All the bridges into Manhattan still closed. This truly, and it has been said so many times, but experiencing it firsthand obviously looks like a war zone. Katie, back to you. You know, David, you mentioned uh, those three people who were pulled from the rubble. Was that the police officer who was able to notify people on his cell phone and give the exact location of his whereabouts? We believe so, although we believe that that may not be the extent of the cellular phone calls. What happened was late last night when the mayor and the police chief were holding a news conference, they said, we know that at least some people are still alive inside because of the cell phone calls that we're getting. We believe that those are the two Port Authority police officers who were rescued. Sadly to say, one of them, we're told, had to have his leg, one of his legs amputated so that he could be pulled out of the rubble. Having said that, we know, and again, there's so much sketchy information, so many conflicting reports, but we know of only those three individuals, the two police officers and the one firefighter, to our knowledge, rescued thus far. Have you been able to talk to any fire department officials, David, because the toll on the fire department here in New York is just unfathomable. I mean, they've been saying numbers of uh, more than 200 firefighters 
are missing. I know that we've mentioned as many as 300. Um, there are a number of police officers. I'm not sure what the last number of uh, missing police officers is that, that we've been The last reporting. number that I had on that, Katie, the last number that I had on that was around 32 to 37, but again, it could be much higher. Have you been able to talk to police or fire officials? Because I've, obviously this is extraordinarily difficult for them. We have, Katie, and I have to tell you, it is so incredibly sad because, of course, what happened was the first units that rushed in to the building, and again, you can see behind me why it's simply so unlikely, perhaps even implausible, that anyone who had raced inside that building to rescue those trapped workers could have come out alive. And we have been talking to them this morning since we first got here around 5 o'clock this morning. And obviously what they're telling us is that they're still numb, they're still in shock. Many of them have lost buddies, have lost friends, have lost colleagues that they worked with for, for literally years and years and years. And yet they're coming in, many of them without working, excuse me, many of them without having even a moment off. They're guzzling down a glass of water, a bottle of water, and heading right back inside. But again, for them, the workers that we've talked to, the firefighters especially, it's such a frustrating process because, as we say, they're so concerned, and they have structural engineers in here, but they are so concerned about the other buildings around here collapsing that they're literally creating wide swaths of area that are cut off from where the firefighters and the other rescue workers are allowed to go. So they go into what they hope are collapsed pockets. Essentially, their hope is that there are basement spaces, people who might have been underground, trapped, for example, inside the subways, that those are the best hope for survivors, but it is an agonizing, brutalizing process for these men and women. But I can tell you what, they are out here doing a valiant job. You see every single one of them just working as hard as they possibly can. You can see all the activity going on here. They literally come streaming out, grab a quick bite, grab a quick drink, and head right back inside, Katie. All right, David Bloom. David, thanks so much for that report. Now, here's Matt. All right, Katie, thanks. In Washington, D.C., they're not only dealing with the tragedy at the Pentagon, they're trying to lend federal assistance to rescue efforts, and, of course, they're trying to figure out who did this and how to respond. President Bush held a press conference a little earlier saying he'll be asking Congress for money to recover from the tragedies and to protect the nation's security. NBC's Campbell Brown's at the White House with more on that. Campbell, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Well, for about the last 45 minutes, the president has been meeting with congressional leaders. This is a bipartisan meeting, both Democrats and Republicans. The White House describing it as a unity meeting. They were invited here to show uh, a sense of solidarity that all the leaders here in Washington are working together to try to resolve this situation. We did, uh, we were allowed in at the very beginning of that meeting. It was a very solemn scene with neither the president nor any of the lawmakers making any comments. We do expect to be hearing from the members of Congress, though, uh, a short time from now as that meeting wraps up. We'll also be seeing the president and first lady this afternoon taking part in a blood drive here uh, in the White House secure complex at the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. Again, a symbolic show uh, to the American people and to the victims of this tragedy. The president calling on all White House employees to donate blood. Uh, Matt, he has, though, spent most of the morning meeting with his national security team, including a formal meeting in the cabinet room with his team this morning, uh, where he did make some remarks, uh, again, making it very clear that the United States is preparing a strong response. The president this morning calling the attack, quote, acts of war. And here is some of what the president had to say earlier. The attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. This will require our country to unite in steadfast determination and resolve. Freedom and democracy are under attack. The American people need to know we're facing a different enemy than we have ever faced. This enemy hides in shadows and has no regard for human life. This is an enemy who preys on innocent and unsuspecting people, then runs for cover. But it won't be able to run for cover forever. This is an enemy that tries to hide, but it won't be able to hide forever. This is an enemy that thinks its harbors are safe, but they won't be safe forever. This enemy attacked not just our people, 
but all freedom-loving people everywhere in the world. The United States of America will use all our resources to conquer this enemy. We will rally the world. We will be patient, we'll be focused, and we'll be steadfast in our determination. This battle will take time and resolve, but make no mistake about it, we will win. The federal government and all our agencies are conducting business, but it is not business as usual. We are operating on heightened security alert. America is going forward, and as we do so, we must remain keenly aware of the threats to our country. Those in authority should take appropriate precautions to protect our citizens. But we will not allow this enemy to win the war by changing our way of life or restricting our freedoms. This morning, I am sending to Congress a request for emergency funding authority so that we are prepared to spend whatever it takes to rescue victims, to help the citizens of New York City and Washington, D.C. respond to this tragedy, and to protect our national security. I want to thank the members of Congress for their unity and support. America is united. The freedom-loving nations of the world stand by our side. This will be a monumental struggle of good versus evil, but good will prevail. Thank you very much. And you heard the president there saying that he would be asking Congress for emergency funding authority. Well, you'll remember the budget battles that were consuming Washington just a few days ago with Democrats charging the president would be tapping into the Social Security surplus, Bush pledging he would not do that except in the event of, the, of an emergency. White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer said this morning, quote, this is the definition of a severe emergency. And as you heard the president say, we're prepared to spend whatever it takes to get beyond this and to help the victims. Katie? All right, those arguments seem to be a distant memory at this point in time. Campbell Brown, Campbell, thanks very much. We'd just like to update you. Pentagon officials now say that the fear of fire spreading no longer exists. The fire is, in fact, contained. Firefighters continue to put out hot spots on the roof, but the building is no longer being evacuated and people are coming back inside. Meanwhile, NBC's chief foreign affairs correspondent uh, has been following events over the last 24 years. That, of course, is NBC's Andrea Mitchell. Andrea, what's the latest? 24 years and 24 hours as well. It seems like longer. It is an extraordinary process here. Katie, what intelligence officials are doing right now is reviewing all of the possible signals or cues or warnings that might have come in over the last days and weeks. And what you're talking about is, and the way they describe it is, it's like trying to sip a glass of water from a fire hose because all of this stuff is coming in. It's coming in from diplomatic reports, from press reports, from uh, electronic intercepts, something that someone may have said to another person, or an email, or a chat room. I mean, enormous amounts of material also coming in from satellite. Uh, satellite electronic intercepts as well as other kinds of intercepted communication and all of this has to be sorted it is not all analyzed in real time by topic or keyword they do key on to certain things but not everything is analyzed as it's coming in so now what they have to do is uh, sort of figuratively re-rack those tapes and look back of course all of it is captured on computer on these computer chips and now have to go back and see is there something something for instance like the terror threat that had been suggested a couple of weeks ago uh, against u.s. facilities possibly in japan which put our military there on a high state of alert that turned out to be either a foiled attempt or a failed attempt or a false interpretation they have to look back at their analysis katie and see did they get that wrong and was it really something that was directed against the United States itself. So, Andrea, they're looking back on what they might have missed. Meanwhile, our State Department officials looking forward as yes. to what they need to analyze and evaluate in the future to prevent this from happening again. Is there rethinking about the way intelligence is being gathered? They're rethinking the big picture, but they're also looking forward in terms of how do you build a case against whoever did this, and their chief suspect is Osama bin Laden, and how do you also send signals 
to other terror groups, collateral groups, not to perceive us as being vulnerable at this time. So now they're looking to see if they can intercept communication from other suspected groups to make sure that another threat isn't developing from somebody who might have a, um, a sense of bravado or mm -hmm. a sense that, that the United States is slightly weaker in this instance. And they're approaching things diplomatically to make sure that, especially at this time, when the United States is so... Uh, so associated with Israel in the, in the view of many people on the street in the Arab world that they communicate to moderate Arab leaders at least that if they do retaliate this is a targeted retaliation against terror groups it is not anti-Arab. So, so Andrew is the trail still leading to Osama bin Laden at this point I know that yesterday even yesterday afternoon some high-ranking US officials who were unnamed said they were 90 percent certain that this was in fact the individual behind this. I and mean, what is the thinking? Is it, do people feel even stronger about that today? They do, and Katie, a lot of it is by simple deductive reasoning that there are no other single players who they think are capable of this, and they have other means, diplomatic and uh, electronic means and human intelligence to know to their satisfaction so far that this was not some other terror sponsoring state. They've seen in the patterns of terror that they analyze constantly that this is not something that Iraq would do, not something that Iran would do, clearly not Iran with the movement and direction of Iran. Uh, Libya came out and condemned this act of terror, so that's why they're focusing on bin Laden. All right, NBC's Andrea Mitchell. Andrea, I met 24 hours, 24 years. I made you much older than you really are. Thank Not you very really. much. <laughs> Thanks for that report, Andrea. Anyway, now with more, here's Matt. All right, Katie, thank you. In 1993, former New York City Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly earned high marks for his handling of the World Trade Center bombing. He's with us now with more insight into how the police will handle yesterday's attack. Ray, good to see you. See you, Matt. 1993 was a huge bomb that went off in the basement, the garage area of the World Trade Center. And you said to me a second ago, you didn't think anything could bring that building down, much less a plane. Absolutely. No, it was 93 pales in comparison to what happened uh, yesterday. <clears throat> no, we, the terrorists in 93 tried to topple both buildings, one into the other. Obviously, they didn't succeed. And uh, when they didn't do it at the base, you would think, not being an engineer, that they certainly couldn't do it from that higher level. But obviously, that's not the case. Immediately following the explosion in 93, police officials, FBI officials set out to find out. They knew it was a bomb, find out where it was placed, who put it together. We know a little bit more about this particular attack. We know that it was done using airplanes. But we still have some questions to be answered. What are police doing right now? What's the game plan? for a disaster like this with the New York City Police Department? Well, obviously, rescue is the primary mission. Police and fire, that's, the, that's goal one, is to rescue anybody that's, that's still alive there. And you do that until there's absolutely no chance of anybody being alive. On a parallel course, you have an investigation that's ongoing that will probably be done primarily by the Joint Terrorist Task Force, headquartered here in New York, FBI, New York City uh, Police Detectives. That gives it national, indeed, international reach. So I'm sure that's what they're doing. They're looking at the specifics of the hijacking. I'm sure there are people in, in Maine. We've gotten information in Florida, obviously, warrants are being executed. So those two efforts are, are going on uh, simultaneously. The initial reports, Ray, uh, up to 33 members of the New York City Police Department unaccounted for. You, you, you hate to, but you may have to assume the worst there, that they were awfully close to that building when it collapsed. What kind of impact does that have emotionally and logistically on a police force? Well, it, it's devastating, no question about it, emotionally. But uh, the people who are missing are primarily members of the emergency service unit, which they're, they're highly skilled, they're, they're very well trained. And of course, in the fire department, it's the same thing. You have the rescue units that are very, very highly trained. Uh, uh, the rescue units just cannot be cannot be located. Nobody, members of rescue units, can, can be found. So it's, it's tremendous devastation. But these are the two finest rescue organizations in the world, in my opinion, New York City Police Department and Fire Department. They have a tremendous amount of experience. Uh, the Police Department has 40,000 members. The Fire Department has, with the EMS merger, about uh, 15,000 members. So they have, they have the physically have the resources to do the job. Yeah, but emotionally, you know, their job is to protect the people of New York City. And what we've seen is that there isn't a police force in the world that can protect and, and do anything about the vulnerability we've seen in this last 24 hours. Absolutely. No, this is, 
As far as protection is concerned, this is a federal government uh, r responsibility. Municipalities uh, can't do that. And I think uh, we have to take a real hard look at our intelligence gathering um, uh, capability. Something else, by the way, you have to keep in mind is that while we're, you're th throwing resources, and you have to, down to the World Trade Center area, this is a big city. And, and life continues in other parts of the city, and you can't pull the police off those streets to put them down at the World Trade Center. Absolutely. It's one of the major challenges. And if you go down towards the, towards the site, you'll see uh, fire units from New Jersey, from uh, Long Island, uh, using all available resources. But policing goes on throughout the city. Fire services are provided. This is 319 square miles, 8 million people. They deserve to get the service, and, and they, are, they are getting it. I think the mayor has made certain of that. Talk about readiness all the time. How, how much can a drill, a basic drill without a catastrophe, prepare a force like the New York City Police Force for what they're dealing with right now? Well, it can give you a practice in, in the coordination, in communication, that sort of thing, but nothing this size or magnitude was ever envisioned. There have been some drills about the use of chemical and biological agents. They, they envision a large number of casualties, so they have helped in that regard. But nothing, nothing was thought of in this regard. On a personal note, I know you live down in that area, not far from the building. You haven't been able to get home. and It's going to be awfully strange to look out the window and walk down some of our avenues and not see those towers looming over this city. Absolutely. No, I, every day when I walk out the door, I saw the World Trade Center. So it's going to be just a shock. And, and it's shocking now to look down the avenue and, and, and not see it. Former New York City Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly. Ray, thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. Here's Katie. Matt, thank you very much. Needless to say, thousands of lives have been shattered by these attacks on this country. Annalise Peterson is searching for both her brother and her boyfriend who worked in different towers at the World Trade Center. She's at St. Vincent's Hospital. Annalise, Hi. good morning. Good morning. Uh, my heart goes out to you. I know you're thank absolutely you. sick with worry and completely yeah. frantic. Uh, tell me, first of all, your brother. My uh, you tell me where he worked and, and on what floor. He worked on the 106th floor of Cantor Fitzgerald and um, was a trader on the 106th floor. And um, I haven't heard for anything from, I know that a friend, my boyfriend's roommate had talked to someone at Cantor, or someone that had talked to someone on Cantor at, on the floor right when the first uh, airplane had hit. And um, he said that they were trying to get out, but they couldn't get down because they had hit underneath them. But they were waiting and they were patient. And um, then my boyfriend's roommate went ahead and called my, my boyfriend who works at Sandler O'Neill. And he lurks on the 104th floor of the World Trade Tower 2. And he said, you know, Frederick, are you at your desk? And, um, you know, is Freddie at the desk? And they couldn't see him. And this was after the first plane had hit and they said they're, they're we're evacuating right now but we don't know where Freddie is and knowing him he was probably looking oh look there's a plane and so um, they all tried to evacuate and then three minutes later after he hung up the second plane had hit the second tower you so. you obviously Annalise have spent the last 24 hours trying to locate both yeah. your brother whose name is is Davin or Davin da Peterson Davin yeah. Peterson. Davin Peterson he's 25 years old and six foot five, so six six. So he's a pretty big guy. So if you've seen him at any hospital or around, if he's unconscious or anything, please contact us. And, and Annalise, I was mm -hmm. going to ask you, what have you done in an effort to find both uh, your brother and your boyfriend, Frederick's, Frederick Cox? Have you visited yeah. area hospitals? Uh, tell, where yeah. have you been? What have you been doing? Well, we've been. I've been contacting all his family and my family and then we there's a center over here at Saint right by St. Vincent's um, that takes consolidates all the lists from all the hospitals and we keep on going in and check but right now the line outside of it is so long it's like for family to get in and check the list every hour is getting pretty difficult so it's, it's hard because there's no consolidated list or a place that you can go there's no website so it's hard to find out information so you're just you want to go down there and dig out through the rubble, but you don't, you know, you don't know what to do. You don't know where you feel so helpless because there's, there's nothing in your power that you can physically do. You, you have know? your, you have Annalise, your sister there, who is yeah. with you, helping you. So thank yeah. goodness you have her, as you all look. And uh, I know that we have a number, and I'm not sure if it will be helpful at all. It says the Office of Victims of Crime has established a hotline. Uh, okay. Let me give it to you. It's one eight hundred. 
0075. Okay. Our office can get in touch with you and your sister yeah. if you can't remember the number. Yeah. It says you can leave contact information to get more details okay, about we'll victims and survivors. Right. Both both of these uh, guys are young men. Uh, um, how old is 20, your brother? My brother's 25 and my boyfriend's 27. And if you have any information, I'm under the understanding that some of the people at Sandler O'Neill did get down. I talked to they set up, Sandler O'Neill did set up a hotline as well as Kenner Fitzgerald. We contacted both. And I guess 20 people did get down from his floor. Um, I guess if you had left right after the first plane had hit, you could have gotten down. You had 20 minutes to get down. So if any of those people could contact us and just let me know what was going on, if you knew what was, Freddie was doing, or if you were working with Kenner Fitzgerald, if you knew what Dowden was doing, if there's any way, any information that you have, just to their whereabouts, their last whereabouts, we'd, we'd really appreciate it. Well, you know, Annalise, what's the best way? I know this is pretty unconventional, but these are very unconventional times. Yeah. What is the best way to reach you? Um, you can call us at our home phone, um, which, or you can email you know what, us. Why, why don't you give it to our producers? Yeah. And if people yeah. have any information yeah, call and call, then and, I can... forward on the message, yeah. Then we can pass your phone number yeah. along. Yeah. Yeah. Annalise, again, we wish you the very best, and our prayers are, are with you and, and with we, your... Yeah, we were just talking. I was just saying, they said, do you know Katie Couric? And I said, yeah, everybody knows Katie Couric. And we had a conversation about you the other day, Frederick and I, and we were walking up the street. And I said, we walked by ABC, and we said, hey, look. And I said, it's Katie Couric. I once saw her at the Glamour Awards one year. And he's like, who's Katie Couric? And I said, everybody knows who Katie Couric is. Oh, uh, well, I'm so sorry that we're... And then, and then we, and so we walked up to someone on the street and we said, now, do you know who Katie Kirk is? And he's like, everybody knows who Katie Kirk is. So you made your boyfriend feel very stupid. <laughs> yeah. Annalise, well, listen, I, I, I'm so sorry that we're meeting under these circumstances. Yeah. And again, uh, we're all praying for you that you'll be able to find your brother, who I'm sure you love very much, as well yeah. as your boyfriend. And uh, please let us know if there's anything yeah. else we can do. Yeah, and my heart goes out to everybody else. As well. I'm sure, I'm sure. All right, Annalise, thanks again. Thank you. Matt. Uh, Katie, bear with me here because I I'm hearing that we're about to talk to a woman named Joyce Carnes who, from what I've been told, uh, her brother was in the World Trade Center when the collisions or the accidents took place, no accidents, when these terrorist attacks took place. And she is now talking to her brother or has talked to her brother on the phone from inside the rubble. Joyce, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, fill me in on this. And again, I wish I, I apologize for not having more information. Tell me what's going on. Actually, my brother was in Wilton, Connecticut, working at um, Saluti and Tatouche as a CPA. And I called him and let him know what happened to the World Trade Center. And he was, um, in 1993, working there. And after the bombing, they had moved it to the World Finance Center. But recently, he's been transferred to their national um, department in Wilton, Connecticut, and okay. at 1140, he told his boss while I was on the phone that he was going military to see what he can do to help. Uh, I'm, I'm a little he was, confused. He was in the Marine Corps for 18 years, and he was going to re-enlist. Okay, but can you tell me, where is your brother right now? Right now, he went back in the rebel to see who else he can find. So he is at the, the World Trade Center. Yes. He is, he's actually searching through the rubble? Yes. And the rescue workers are allowing him to do that, even though he's not a trained... Well, he, he called me on his cell phone last night at 7.49. He couldn't find any rescue workers. Okay, so he went in on his own. Right, and he found two sergeants with the Port Authority. All right. Well, Joyce, uh, good luck, and, and if you contact your brother, uh, we'd love to hear more about that. We're going to move on to something else, but we thank you for talking to us. One man who knows firsthand the task that lies ahead for emergency rescue workers at the World Trade Center and also the Pentagon is John Hansen. He was the deputy chief of the Oklahoma City Fire Department in 1995 when Timothy McVeigh bombed the Murrah Federal Building. He's at the Oklahoma City Memorial this morning. Mr. Hansen, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. I can only imagine what went through your mind as you saw the horrifying images of both towers of the World Trade Center collapsing yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Matt, you know, it's, uh, it, it's deja vu all over again. Uh, on this site six years ago, as you mentioned, we had a tremendous uh, incident. And now, you know, 
We had a nine-story building that was involved, Matt, and, and our friends in New York City are dealing with two towers, 110 floors each, and it's just uh, incredible what they're facing. Yeah, you, it took more than a week in some cases for you to get through the rubble and find people who were or were not alive, and, and I, you can only estimate with 110-story buildings how long it's going to take rescuers to pick through this debris. Absolutely. It took 17 days working 24 hours a day right here on this site six years ago. And now these men and women are facing a, a month long, at least maybe more than that, uh, a situation. And then you compound it as you were talking to the, to the police commissioner, you compound that with over 200 New York City firefighters and public safety officials that have become victim to this, losing their chief, some of the top officials. The same team that, that, uh, that the former commissioner spoke of was here in Oklahoma City helping us. You know, we know these men and women that have been involved in this and are missing right now. And uh, our heart certainly goes out to them, and, and uh, we hope that uh, America will support them as they supported us. I know Oklahoma is certainly standing ready to support our friends in New York. And, and one thing we've got to realize is it's going to, it is going to take a long time. So we have to be patient with the rescue workers and, and give them all the support we can. It's a very delicate process, John. I want to talk about the fact that there's a similarity in this situation in Oklahoma City and that the floors of the building pancaked. One fell on top of the other. And I remember that during the rescue operations in Oklahoma City, there were many occasions where rescuers had to stop and pull back because they found some instability in that structure. You know, I think that uh, we, we heard last night reports coming out of the building that they've already faced those problems, and that's why that a lot of the rescuers couldn't approach different positions in the World Trade Centers. Uh, countless times we had to stop, pull back, reevaluate. You know, if I could characterize it, you know, take a, a, a pile of pickup sticks, if you will, and dump them off the ground. Every time you, you take one out, there's a chance of moving another. It's going to be something that takes a long time. They're going to have to be so careful moving a piece of concrete or a piece of steel being very cognizant on what's happening on the other side. You know, will our rescue effort cause a, a secondary structural collapse? So it is going to take time, and, and, and we as Americans right now just have to be extremely patient with our rescue workers. And, and John, talk about the emotional side of this. Obviously, the family members of those who, who've lost loved ones in this tragedy are going to need all of our, our prayers and emotional support. But, but there's another dynamic here, and these rescuers are going to be seeing some horrific sights. And take me back, if you will, to what happened in Oklahoma City and the toll that some of those images took on the people who were doing the rescuing. Well, you know, Matt, as you mentioned, that uh, the, the trauma to the building, uh, we've all seen that uh, on, on the incredible coverage. Imagine the, the trauma to uh, some of the people that's going to be in the building. Those aren't going to be unpleasant sites. As the rescue effort lingers, uh, those sites will increasingly be unpleasant. And uh, psychologically, uh, I know the New York City uh, authorities, Mayor Giuliani, all have incredible uh, uh, systems set up for the, for the emotional well-being of the rescuers. But it is going to be very, very difficult, Matt. Uh, uh, and, and, and then post, after the incident, there's going to be a long-term uh, recovery process for all those, all those brave men and women. And, and one thing you mentioned, the, the emotional part of the rescuers, the firefighters and police that are working there as we speak, Keep in mind that they're going to be running across recovering some of the uh, men and women that used to be standing by their side, some, right. of the, some of New York's bravest. So they're going to need some mental counseling, there's no question. If you had any piece of advice, John, for the men and women who are now working so frantically at the World Trade Center, what would it be? Well, we're just ex extremely proud of them, Matt, uh, knowing what we faced here, knowing that they were at our side during this event we had right here. and. Uh, you know, the, the advice we'd give is, is that, uh, you know, take it slow. Uh, they're the best trained res search and rescue team in the country up there. I know Mr. Rawball has sent, uh, I believe it was 12 urban search and rescue teams that were here and uh, work together, uh, take our time, and, and, and let's keep uh, any more of our rescuers from, from becoming victims. All right. John Hansen in Oklahoma City this morning. John, thanks very much. Good seeing you. Thank you, Matt. All right. Now here's Katie. Matt, thank you. Coping with disaster is difficult for anyone, and so is explaining it to your children. Dominic Capello is the author of 10 Talks Parents Must Have with Their Children About Violence. Good morning. Good morning. You know, one of the things, as Matt was talking to, to John Hansen, that probably these rescue workers need to do is to talk to somebody or, to, you know, don't internalize all Absolutely. this incredible 
uh, trauma that they, they're experiencing as we speak. Absolutely. I, I think that, well, first, no one is prepared for this. Uh, emergency workers are not prepared for this. Uh, I don't think any parent in America was prepared to go to war the way we did. And, and so I think every parent is struggling on what's the right thing to do. The first thing to do is to communicate how you're feeling. And a lot of people are feeling very scared. A lot of people are being very are very frightened, and that's something you have to talk about. Okay, well, let's talk about right. talking about that with your kids. Sure. And I have a ten-year-old, so I have to tell you how close to home because we had a very difficult night last night, which we'll get to in a moment. But but are you saying that parents should be open with their children about how scared they might be? Because I have to say that this was extremely unsettling for me, as it was for so many people across the country, and I'm feeling very vulnerable. Um, but you want to reassure your children, don't you? You, want, you don't want to tell them how scared and nervous this all makes you, do you? Well, the, the, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. I, I've, our center was getting calls all last night, and, and a mom called and said, you know, is it okay to tell our kid that we're scared? And they weren't sure. Another mom called and said, is it okay if our kids see us crying? And because parents were around the TV set, and this family in Brooklyn, the dad was scared and the mom was crying, and, and they felt like it's okay to communicate this as long as the kids know that we're here to protect you. I think kids are looking for some security right now. They don't want their mom and dad to go to, to work because mom and dad may not come home. They don't want their uncle or grandpa to get in an airplane because they don't know what's going to happen. So kids are looking for security. Parents certainly want to be able to say that, you know, something really bad happened. This doesn't normally happen. But I, I think it's appropriate for any adult to communicate some fear and some sadness. How honest should we be? In other words, I struggled with that last night too, how much to tell. My five-year-old is happily oblivious to most everything, but right. my 10-year-old is very aware of what goes on around sure, her. Sure, sure. It depends on the age. It depends on the age of the child. Should uh, you be honest? Should you say four planes were hijacked, terrorists used them as missiles, they crashed into the World Trade Center, one crashed into the Pentagon, sure. one just crashed? I mean, sure. that's pretty tough stuff. It's really tough stuff. A mom, I called the Upper West Side and, and said, what, what did you do? She goes, well, I, I decided I would tell my six-year-old something because I know when he goes to school on the playground, there's going to be talk, there's going to be jokes, and I want him to hear from me. So she decided not to be totally honest, but said something bad happened. There were some bad people. We're going to catch those bad people. A lot of people were hurt. And she understands that this is the beginning of a conversation, Katie. That this is not something that you have the talk tonight and it's over. You know, we Americans now have weeks, months, a year to, to, to try to find a way to talk about it. It's not easy. It really isn't. And, of course, many children today are feeling extremely vulnerable. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's that natural human sense of relief if it wasn't you or your family or your parents or people you knew you're sort of whew. but many children are worried could this happen again could this happen to us mm -hmm. and last night my daughter asked me mom are they gonna bomb us is something gonna happen to us and I said no no don't worry it really you're okay we're okay she said how do you know I mean and the question is how do you know? Well, and and, uh, and I, how can you be honest about that? And I think this is tough, and I, this is this is something every family will struggle with. And I'll be quite candid with you. I, I work in the field of violence prevention. Something like this, we're not prepared for this. This this is a whole new ball game for those of us who are educators or therapists or community people. I think you're doing what you want to do. You, you talk to your child. You give them as much love as you can every single day. And you we're listen gonna, to their concerns and, you and try to address them, and you try not to dismiss them. Isn't that good advice? Because Absolutely. you have to at least be open to what frightens them so you can deal with it properly. You can't say, oh, you're being silly. That's ridiculous. No, no. and some kids will act out. Some kids will, will say it's no big deal or they'll even make jokes on the playground. But, you know, all of us, adults and children, have our own way of coping with our emotions and our feelings. And so we're going to have to be very patient, very, but, very patient. But I want to emphasize again, Dominic, that we probably need to tell our children this is a very rare occurrence. Absolutely. Uh, this is highly unusual. This has never happened before. And the likelihood of it happening again is quite slim. Can very we safely slim. You can say absolutely that? say that. It's very, very slim. And, and this is also a time for us to think about our own beliefs and our faith and, and, you know, bring our families and communities together. It might be a time that if you don't always go to church, to go to church absolutely. or My go to Absolutely. My sister called and said, we're all going to church. Uh, actually, they were going to go last night and they're going back on Sunday. So whatever your faith may be, this might be a very good time to bring the family together. It might be a good time to bring the school community absolutely. together. Absolutely. I got a call from a PTA mother in Maryland who said, should we have our PTA meeting tomorrow night and bring parents 
parents together, that's an excellent idea. Now some families are of course are not just feeling vulnerable, they're c feeling completely shattered because yeah. they've either gotten terrible news about someone they love very much or they have no idea as we just spoke to that you know, young beautiful woman who can't find her brother or her boyfriend, Annalise. I mean those people need real professional help. Oh absolutely, absolutely. Professional therapists are going to be, be needed, as well as the clergy. People of faith will be needed for weeks and months to come. So and we need to emphasize that if anybody is in that situation, to please, please go get some mental health call, help. Call for help. This is, not, this is not a time to be alone. This is a time to be with family and, and community, and professional help is available. All right. Well, Dominique Campello, thank you very much. We probably need to have you on in the upcoming days and weeks because this is not going to go away. Thanks very much. Now here's Matt. All right, Katie, thanks. Ever since yesterday morning, the nation's air traffic system has basically been shut down. We had expected some airports to open at about noon Eastern time today. From what we've heard, that has not happened. We're going to get an update now on what we may expect over the next several hours and, and even days from Bob Hager, who's in Washington. Bob, what have you been hearing? Matt, bit by bit, this is dribbling in now. Delta has just put out a statement that they won't try to operate any flight at least until after 6 p.m. tonight. So that includes all Delta regular flights, their commuter lines, and the Delta shuttle as well. Continental has put out a statement saying it will operate only minimum number of flights today. And I think one by one we're going to see all the airlines fall in line here. Midway, meanwhile, which was already struggling and operating ahead file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, they said they're just going to suspend business completely. Uh, in part because they believe that uh, it won't pick up now for quite some time uh, because of passenger resistance, so worrying about terrorism. We're, we're talking about domestic flights for the most part here. Bob, what about international flights? I th that'll, that'll be part of the same, same rule, that uh, nobody's going off until at least after 6 p.m. tonight. Now, I say nobody. Uh, these, these airlines are one by one saying this, Delta and Continental, but I expect other airlines will, will, will follow suit and that uh, we're going to see uh, very few operations until uh, after 6 p.m. and then even then maybe not much at all so it would be another day before things start to resemble normal and, at all. And briefly if you will Bob once flights do resume we're going to be seeing some different and much more strict procedures at airports. Oh absolutely more identification of passengers and uh, no curbside baggage and things as uh, as small as well small it could be big uh, no sale of knives or even plastic knives at uh, at the airport shops as I understand it. All right Bob Hager in Washington. Bob thanks very much we appreciate it. Absolutely. It's really quite staggering Matt when you think about all the safety precautions that have already been put in place you know, in the heels of this, and no wonder the airlines are not open for business yet because they're going to have to make several adjustments and, and, and probably even more in the future. And you'd hope, as you mentioned before, that people don't complain about these extra inconveniences because they are simply being put into effect to protect all of us. Well, it's been a pretty horrific 24 hours. I think that's safe to say. I don't think there's ever been a news event of this magnitude that not you or I have ever covered, certainly. Tom Brokaw will be following all the developments on this attack on America in just a few minutes. As we say goodbye to you on this tragic day, we leave you with the indelible images as they unfolded over the past 24 hours. Families shattered, hearts heavy, people still in belief, disbelief, and many questions still unanswered. We have a breaking story though. Apparently a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center here in New York City. It happened just a few moments ago apparently. We have very little information available. It's quite terrifying. I'm in shock right now. It's mind-boggling and it's horrifying. A hijacked American Airlines flight out of Boston slams into the North Tower of New York's World Trade Center at approximately 8.42 a.m. Eastern Time. Oh, another one just hit. Something else just hit. A very large plane just oh. flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. Can you see it? I yes. can see it on this shot. A second airplane, a 727, just ran into the building. It's now approximately 9.03 a.m. There, it, it felt just a few moments ago like there was an explosion of some kind here at the Pentagon. 9.40 a.m., a third hijacked plane. An American flight out of Washington, Dulles, crashes into the Pentagon in a burst of flames. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center 
in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. The FAA has banned all takeoffs at all airports across America. We just saw a live picture of what seemed to be a portion of the building falling away from the World Trade Center. 9.59 a.m., the Antilles National now unthinkable, the south tower of the World Trade Center collapses. Spent the year in combat. I never saw anything like this. Saw a lot of people die, but nothing this devastating. The other tower of the World Trade Center has just collapsed. There's been a declaration of war by terrorists in the United States. You didn't have time to, to look at, you know, you just, you just want to be alive, really. There was smoke everywhere and people were jumping out the windows. The city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists. We will find the people responsible for these cowardly acts and justice will be done. These are Palestinian celebrations in the wake of Tuesday's terror attacks in the United States. How apparently Palestinians took to the street chanting, God is great. The alleged mastermind, America's most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden. Certainly in more than 20 years of, of covering horrific events, this is something that I've never seen before. I got hold of a ca video camera uh, and began recording you know, some of what had happened. Um, We're looking at those images right now. Yeah. So this you're looking through your viewfinder watching the tower collapse. Yeah. And you can see I'm not very far away. I mean, they see that big chunk of the building. And this is, this cloud starts moving real fast. We're all crying, hysterical. We were wanting to get out of there and not knowing where to go. and which direction to run in and how far we can go. <coughs> and I'm still worried about my life. Yeah, it's horrifying. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. This is wild. Yeah.